International DOS Conference 2021. It's virtual. And this session is called Middle East Ophthalmology Meeting. And this is Hall B. And I'd like to invite, first of all, let me introduce the chairman and the moderator, Dr. Mohammed Al Amri. Over to you, sir. Thank you. Is the mic with me now? Yes, sir, it's over to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sanjay, for this uh, introduction. Uh, I am Dr. Mohammed Al Amri, ophthalmologist consultant, uh, anterior segment and medical return specialist, uh, the founder and president of uh, Middle East Ophthalmology Meetings. Uh, today, uh, first of all, I would like also to thank uh, those, and especially thanks for Dr. Subhas Dadia, the president of those, and Dr. Uh, Narmata for their kind invitation for us to be part of this uh, uh, prestigious conference. Uh, our uh, meetings today and uh, who are going to represent the MIOM, we are going to have uh, a very eminent speaker. I am proud to be with us here today. And we are having three sessions uh, in this session uh, divided into three parts. The first one, it will be the retina session. And then the second one, it will be the uh, oculoplasty. And lastly, it will be the uh, cataract and refractive surgery. Uh, we are having today our uh, speakers. Um, I will start introducing them one by one. Then we can go and start our sessions. Uh, our speaker, Dr. Karina Julian, Egyptologist and medical retina specialist, Cleveland Clinic, Abu Dhabi. Hello, Dr. Karina. Hello. Hi. Hello. Uh, we are going to have also Dr. Ahmed Al Barqi, MD, FRCS. VR surgeon at SKMC, Sheikh Khalifa Medical City, Abu Dhabi, Assistant Professor of Ophthalmology, Ben Ha University in Egypt. Uh, good evening, Dr. Ahmed Al Barqi. Hello, Ahmed. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you, Dr. Muhammad. Thank you. Uh, we are having also Dr. Habibullah Atimadi, Consultant Ocular Plastic and Orbital Surgeon. Uh, he's working in Sheikh Shahboot uh, uh, Hospital in Abu Dhabi. Uh, good evening, Dr. Uh, Habib. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. And uh, we are having also Dr. Usama Jlady, consultant ophthalmologist, cornea and refractive specialist, Moorfield Eye Hospital, Dubai. Good evening, Dr. Usama. Good evening to everyone. Thank you. Uh, my dear friends, also Dr. Ahmed Al Khashab, veterinary surgeon. Uh, Medical Director of Eye Consultant uh, uh, Center in Dubai, Dr. Ahmed. Good evening. Hi, Dr. Mohammed. Good evening. It is my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, also, my dear friends, Dr. Nazim Al Hussein is a med uh, veterinary surgeon uh, in Mediclinic Parkview Hospital in Dubai. Good evening, Dr. Nazim. Yeah. Good evening, and good evening to all the friends in Delhi. Thank you, Dr. Nazim. Uh, and my dear friends. Uh, Dr. Safwan Al Bayati, consultant ophthalmologist, cataract and refractive retina surgeon. He is a medical director of New Vision Eye Center. Uh, thank, you. thank you for all of you. And uh, we are. Uh, Dr. Safwan, good evening. Good evening, Khalid. Good evening. Monte, and, uh, you, you are just skipping my side. No, no, you are good the good best. Evening. You are the best. Yeah, you are yeah. the best. Good, good, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, okay, so uh, if you allow me now, just uh, if, if I miss anyone or anything, if someone wants to add anything, he can go. You can, Dr. Safan, you want to say anything before I start? No, no, thank you very much. Okay, so our session, it will start now, and we will have uh, now the first talk. It will be by Dr. Lilian Karina, and she is going to talk about premium and non uh, nocri. I don't know what's the meaning. She will explain for us now the meaning during her presentations. I asked her actually, but she wanted to talk and during present her presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have the responsibility to open our symposium. And I named this presentation Primum Non Nocere. This is the right pronunciation. And this, can, this is from the Latin. This comes from Hippocrates. And this can be translated as, first of all, do not harm. And this is a kind of very strong statement for our practice and came to my mind when I had in front of me this patient I am going to share with you now. So let me. 
So this is this is a um, 65 years old, otherwise healthy male who came to me for second opinion because he had uh, a, a severe decrease and a, a, or in visual acuity in the right eye after uncomplicated cataract surgery. As you can see in the pictures, the fondos of the right eye looks like very ischemic. And if you see the, the OCT maculae display here, there is a complete atrophy of the macular structures, which justify his visual acuity of counting fingers. So what happened to this patient? He underwent other, an uncomplicated cataract surgery elsewhere, as per the, the story he told me, and was diagnosed with exogenous endophthalmitis in the setting of severe decrease in visual acuity, painless decrease in visual acuity and hypopion <coughs> that occur less than 24 hours after cataract surgery. He described the symptoms around 8 to 12 hours after the surgery. Less than 24 hours, he went to see his uh, physician, his ophthalmologist, and got diagnosed with exogenous endophthalmitis. So in order to um, treat him promptly, they started with a combination of intravitreal and subconjunctival antibiotics, avastin, and dexamethasone. This treatment was repeated four times every, every 48 hours, and there was no improvement. So by day 14, they decided to go further for a pars plana vitrectomy. They performed the surgery, and by the end of the surgery, again, they injected antibiotics into the vitreous cavity, and again, avastin, bevacizumab. So there was no improvement in visual acuity after the surgery, but it was interesting that it was written in the, in the notes from the surgery that severe retinal ischemia and retinal hemorrhages were seen during pars plana vitrectomy. Of course, there's no much I can offer to this patient in order to improve his clinical situation. However, still, I think we can learn a lot from his sad and bad experience. First of all, which, which was the primary insult to this eye? I am not doubting the diagnosis. He was diagnosed with he was diagnosed with exogenous endophthalmitis following cataract surgery. However, he never referred pain, and the visual deterioration appeared less than 24 hours after his surgery, which is unusual for a case of exogenous endophthalmitis. So the first differential diagnosis is a toxic anterior segment syndrome. And for this, this is a, it's, it's rare, it's not frequent, but it's a potentially devastating ocular complication after cataract surgery. And we need to keep this in mind because the prompt diagnosis and the appropriate treatment can lead us to very good uh, outcomes, visual outcomes. This is um, a very severe inflammatory reaction, but it is not infectious. This is sterile reaction. And it's very important to differentiate from uh, endophthalmitis, mainly in terms of when it appears, the TAS syndrome appears in the first day after surgery, and there is no vitreous involvement in the TAS syndrome, which is the definition of endophthalmitis. In an endophthalmitis, you always have vitreous involvement. Of course, the management is absolutely the opposite. In infectious endophthalmitis, you will use antibiotics and even surgery. And for the TAS, you need high dose of topical steroids. But then, I am telling you, this is not a, the task is not a syndrome that involves the posterior segment. So, which is the most probable cause of the final visual outcome of this patient? I show you, he ended with macular atrophy. So, again, postoperative infectious endophthalmitis can give you macular atrophy as, a, as, as the final result, but keep in mind, he received high doses of antibiotics. He received injections every 48 hours. And even when they did the, the pars plana vitrectomy, they 
injected antibiotics again. So the differential diagnosis for his final visual outcome is actually the hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis, which is a unfrequent um, clinical picture related to toxicity from vancomycin. This uh, syndrome starts between day one and day 21st after the use of vancomycin can be intracameral, can be intravitreal, or can be even uh, through the irrigating bottle infusion in cataract surgery. The mean presentation is by day number eight, patients experience sudden and painless decrease in vision with almost no anterior segment inflammation. Hypopion is not described for this syndrome. And there is a clear view of the posterior segment. This is again, something to keep in mind. If you can see the posterior segment, if the vitreous is not involved, this is not a case of endophthalmitis. Uh, these pictures are, of course, not from my patient. This, uh, this hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis is actually a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction affecting retina, affecting mainly the venules in the retina. And you can see hemorrhages all around the retina. It is occlusive in nature. And there is always peripheral involvement. You can have central involvement in very advanced case, if, uh, mainly when they are not diagnosed properly and you keep injecting vancomycin, but the peripheral retina is always compromised. The most important differential diagnosis, again, is with infectious endophthalmitis. Keep in mind that for hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis, there's no pain, and the anterior and the posterior segment are quiet. You have a clear view of the posterior structures, clear view of the retina, and the hallmark of this syndrome is the presence of widespread retinal hemorrhages. These patients uh, develop uh, in around 50 to 60 percent neovascular glaucoma because it's a severe occlusive retinal vasculitis. Also, this is not very common for uh, exogenous endophthalmitis. Other important differential diagnosis for the HORV are vascular events. I can't say my patient did not have this vascular event like CRVO or combined CRVO, CRAO. But when this is related to cataract surgery, it usually appears very early after the surgery. And one thing we have to ask the patient is which kind of anesthesia they use because it's more common with peribulbar anesthesia than with topical. Viral retinitis can be a differential diagnosis and uh, also retinal drug toxicity. Drug toxicity is a completely different syndrome from HRVO because the drug toxicity appears very early um, after the surgery and is more similar to the TAS. In the hemorrhagic occlusive retinal vasculitis, we have a type three hypersensitivity phenomena. So we need some time for the complex of antigens and antibodies to be formed and to be deposited in the vessels. So the management for IHORV is first of all, the early recognition to avoid further exposure to intra intraocular vancomycin. And it's mainly high doses of systemic corticosteroids. For the task, we use mainly topical corticosteroids. For this, we use systemic. We can use intraocular corticosteroids, for example, the implant of dexamethasone. And once the ischemia drives retinal neovascularization and neovascular glaucoma, we use anti-VGF and PRP are need, as needed. So the conclusions for my talk is that complications following an eventful cataract surgery are infrequent, but very stressful situations for the surgeon. Infectious endophthalmitis is the most feared complication, but it is not the only one and it is not the only serious one. It's very important a team approach to these patients because many times if the same person managing the case is the surgeon, the stress plays an important role in, in getting the right diagnosis. A wrong diagnosis might lead to inappropriate treatment and further complications. And finally, and coming back to the statement, primum non nocere, uh, we could say, given an existing problem, it may be better not to do 
something or even to do nothing than to risk causing more harm than good. And this is just the last slide. Thank you so much for your attention. And I am open to questions if you have. Um, excellent presentation, uh, Dr. Lillian. I really loved it, actually. The, um, the aim is to do no harm is definitely, it is our first aim. And I agree with you totally. Uh, the diagnosis of endothelmitis is usually uh, with pain. Pain is a pathognomonic uh, uh, factor that should be present with endothelmitis. Uh, and uh, usually it does not happen within 24 hours, as you mentioned. So uh, uh, in such case, I would uh, go rather with TAS than uh, endothelmitis or uh, HORV, uh, which can happen secondary as well uh, to the wrong diagnosis that uh, continued uh, this problem to uh, exacerbate. So I agree with you. I, I think in this case, it was a TAS and then complicated with uh, secondary vancomycin uh, toxicity, which is uh, the uh, occlusive vasculitis. Now, if you, if you Dr. Thank Hamad, you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed. Can, can I ask Dr. Nadim if there is any comment, please? Or any question to Dr. Uh, Karina? No, no comment or question, because I, I don't do cataract surgery, but the definitely use of vancomycin, uh, you know, when not indicated, uh, I think it should not be used because... One thing okay, I would then, like to yeah. say is not only the use of vancomycin, but the repeated doses of vancomycin. Yeah, because sometimes really this can happen that we need to use vancomycin because of endophthalmitis. But if yeah, it endophthalmitis and yeah, endophthalmitis is different. So the bioavailability and the therapeutic uh, use of the antibiotics will be utilized. Then in a naive environment where there is no utilization of the vancomycin rather than prophylaxis. So there will always be subset of patients which might be hypersensitive to the medication, which you do not know, just like we have with BOV. So yeah, so it is a very difficult situation. You cannot predict, but yeah. So the question comes that, is it possible to uh, avoid being more cautious, you know? as your statement says at the end. Thank you, Thank Dr. You Nadine. Dr. Yes, Dr. Safan, yes. Uh, the, the issues is that Karina mentioned that the repeated uh, 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 vancomycin injection. That's right. Uh, maybe the doctor, he can miss the diagnosis between TAS and uh, endophthalmitis, but why we repeat the vancomycin? Now, the protocol say that the first injection of vancomycin and ciptazidine, it should be followed by the culture and sensitivity, taking the vitreous for culture and sensitivity. You didn't, Karina, mention anything related to that. They the, didn't do, they the, didn't do. So they didn't do it. So even so, now, if we will go to the protocol and we, and we didn't do it, is that not repeating the same medication? Now, there is no rule to, to repeat the vancomycin. For me personally, vancomycin, ciptazidine, according to the, to the protocol, we are injecting it and tap the the uh, vitreous for the uh, uh, for the examination and that happens with me once and when the exam the, the the culture return back uh, or the the direct examination uh, uh, return back negative or it's not sensitive to the vancomycin directly i changed to the moxifloxacin the okay. first generation and it was very sensitive so okay. repeating vancomycin is very <laughs> dangerous no one thank you Thank you, Dr. Safan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Can we just, I, we want to proceed and we will move to uh, my dear friend, Dr. Ahmed al barqi and his presentation <laughs> or our mystery. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, please share the screen. Okay, so, thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, I'm looking here for this is the screen. Okay. Can you see my screen now? Yeah, I just select your topics, okay. Okay. So it's the sound is very loud, it's okay. No, it's good. Okay, just, uh, this is a case that I want to share with you today, but uh, let me play that is the introduction for the video. And while playing the video, I will get some attention to ask the panelists or anyone to comment to help me, because it was a bit, um, it was a weird case for me. 
since the beginning of the case. So uh, the case actually it's skip this part. Let me take a time. This patient now in a minute, yes. Okay. She's a, a female patient, old age. Um, came to my clinic complaining of decreased vision. She's not diabetic, not hypertension for eight months or more. She has a dense vitreous hemorrhage in the uh, in the eye, and the uh, there was dense cataract also. I want to highlight here something about the history because it was not clear for me exactly when this patient start to lose the vision. When discussion with the family, they don't exactly give me a date when is the first time to start not seeing well in, the, in, the, in, in her eye. So this was a challenging point. So anyway, in this kind of cases, usually we start with the doing B scan. As you can see here, the B scan is one cut and here another, the optic disc, and this is another one. So. Uh, I just want to highlight here that the A scan, which is not showing here, should give us a high echogenicity at this part. And this is for sure the vitreous hemorrhage here. But this area, I don't know exactly if it's written or not. So here I can stop and ask the, uh, my panelists, what do you think about, uh, if you have a case like that, how do you interpret this Proceed. case? How, okay, yeah, yeah, what do you think? I move this question to Dr. Nazim first. Do you think so it's a different it, detachment or? No, uh, to me it looks, uh, it's, I think the retina is attached. Uh, it, yeah, there so there is, a vitreous, there is a vitreous hemorrhage, uh, but you can see there is more dense ecogenic, more ecogenic than the vitreous echoes, yeah. uh, just in front of the retina. So exactly. it may be uh, your sub highlight, very thick, you might have a posterior cortical vitreous and okay. subhyoid hemorrhage. It can be a subhyoid hemorrhage. Yes. Okay, Dr. Ahmed. Yes, I agree with Nasim. Um, uh, to me, it looks um, retina is uh, uh, attached and it is very dense um, um, vitreous hemorrhage and subhyoid hemorrhage, but we cannot really uh, yeah. uh, say for thing. sure that it is. Uh, without any localized area of detachment. Yes. So, um, so always when we tackle these cases, we need to inform the patient that the retina can be detached um, and we should always uh, move on during the procedure as if the retina is detached. Yes. Well, so I have a comment step? over here. Yes, I have a comment. comment over here. You need to see multiple B scans because you need to also see in the macular area because yeah. sometimes you may have a breakthrough hemorrhage, uh, uh, which uh, the patient can be a polypartal choroidal vasculopathy, or it can be, if it's an aged patient, you might have a neovascularization, uh, which can actually may cause uh, a hemorrhage pattern like this, where the posterior highlight may be very thick if it remains there for a very long time. So multiple uh, scans to the different angles needs to be seen and also a cut through the optic nerve properly to see if it's actually a sub highlight and you might have an attachment or not uh, to the optic disc, then it will tell you whether retina is detached or not. So okay, this I is think just, he is showing yeah. now another, another scan. Yeah, yeah, this is the scan of the optic disc. Uh, but I agree, totally agree with uh, Nazim and Ahmed Khashab. Yes, I agree. This is uh, the ecogenicity. You know, this is a vitreous hemorrhage, as you can see here, clearly. But I, I hope that I can show the A-scan because I don't know why when I get a, save the picture or a video from the machine, it does not give me the A-scan. But the A-scan was a bit high. So it's somehow between vitreous and retina. So that's Ahmed Khashab. I, said, I agree with him that while doing this case, I was thinking about it. It could be a detachment. It could be. It's not sure. So that's why when doing the case, I will show you with you how we can, do that. Uh, a scan can show a very high reflectivity yes. if your posterior highlight is thick and chronic. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So I mean, at the end, uh, as you agreed both, it could be a retinal detachment there. So that's my uh, this. Uh, you can, another scan also. You can see there's a membrane here. Is it a the condensed blood or it's a detached retina or something? Because, you know, as I told you, the history is not clear and uh, its patient is not diabetic, not hypertensive. So what could be the reason, you know, for okay, this? Okay, can we no ask trauma. what is the next step? 
before you move the videos. Uh, Dr. Yeah. Ahmed, what you will do after that? What is your next step? Uh, uh, this is a case for vitrectomy. It doesn't... Uh, um, no, she has a dense cataract and dense yeah. disease. For combined dense case. Uh, yeah. But I agree with Ahmed al uh, We need to put a differential diagnosis in such case. Uh, yeah, that's so, uh, 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 even if the patient was diabetic, let's not jump into concluding that uh, because this patient is diabetic, it is diabetic vitreous hemorrhage. Uh, it can be due to tear. So we, we need to examine the other eye properly exactly. and make sure what is the stage the of the diabetic eye, retinopathy. Yeah. I'm talking in general. Yeah, uh, yeah, and sure, we sure. have multiple differential diagnosis as well. Yeah, but for this case, the the other eye looks perfectly normal. Okay. So okay. What's the age uh, of the patient? Sorry, 75. 70. 75. So okay, can uh, you BCV, coronavascular membrane, uh, tear, um, uh, macro aneurysm, um, exactly. a lot of reason. Exactly. Um, so. Yeah. Okay. okay. So what, what we as mentioned, we decide with the patient that we will go for, we have to explore it. So we need to remove the cataract. It's very dense. You cannot see at all from the, uh, cat, from the uh, cataract lens and combined with surgery. And I told you, this is very important point. As Khashab mentioned, you have to uh, disclose it for the patient that if we have, for example, this is second due to a long-standing retinal detachment or long tear or something like that, or then similar, so you might be after removing the vitreous hemorrhage, you might something, it's a retina is ischemic, ischemic or something happened, retinal fibrosis. So the visual prognosis is not that uh, good. So we have to, um, I cannot, we cannot say that the vision will improve a lot. This is very important in counseling the patient before surgery because you don't know exactly what's happening. So. Um, what also came to my mind, by the way, I mentioned it could be somehow tumor or lymphoma or something. Another thought came to my mind also in the differential diagnosis. But anyway, we discussed with the patient to go and the, to go, do combined uh, fecal vitrectum and see what's inside. So let's now continue the video. Uh, yes, so the, as you see here, the, uh, just to stop here, you can see how dense was the cataract. For this patient so this could do also maybe mask the, the what's happening in the retina it could be that's why the patient cannot tell me exactly what when he starts to lose the vision it was very vague like eight months 12 months like that so the cataract was so dense i will not go through the cataract we try to to remove the cataract first and um, after that doing ia uh, first, you know, in combined cases, you I prefer to put the infusion first, uh, trocar, and leave it because after that, the soft retention will be, the IOP will be soft, it will be challenged. I put the lens uh, before the, I know that some uh, surgeons prefer to uh, keep the lens at the end, but for me, I like to finish the anterior segment at one step and then go back for the posterior segment. Now, this is the, how it looks like the high from the vine. You can see here, uh, dense vitreous hemorrhage, as you can see here, and I'm trying to, I don't know, okay. I'm trying to just layer by layer. You can see if this, I remove one layer, I did another layer. I'm trying to, trying to explore what's this. So there is a shower of blood coming and you can see here again, there is one hole here. So we usually start peripherally just in case if this is the retina. And you can see here how the, uh, the, this area is coming up, the, the blood showering of blood growth is coming out again. And you can see here, it's another layer here. So that's, that's the step here. So if you stop here and just ask the, my colleagues, you can see here now, this is one layer and this is another thin layer there. This, I, I hope that you can see it, yes. This is a one layer here. I remove one layer already and this is another layer and this is a third layer with a thick and like a thick uh, paper or something like that. They, they could, uh, do you think this could be a retina? Or it's just a uh, uh, vitreous chysis and this is one thin layer of the vitreous, which is the, the, the coronary. No, it's became not the like retina. That. Yeah, exactly. So. Okay, so I, I decided, yeah, I put in mind, it could be a very thin ischemic retina. But at that point, I realized that it's, I cannot see any blood vessels there. Maybe it's not obvious in the video, but if you can see, I'm trying to look if there are any ghost vessels here. So it give me the clue that it could be the retina. But I, it was interesting for me to find this 
you can he, you can easily separate it in two or three layers. So it was the uniqueness of the blood. I think you can see another layer here. Uh, so it make it dissect the vitreous. We call we call it vitreous crisis. So we have different layer due to the chronicity of the blood. The blood was there for a long, long time. So it go through the vitreous and make it a layer, as you can see here. So, okay, so we decide it's not the, the, the retina, it's just a very uh, organized vitreous hemorrhage. As you can see here, any movement, you had a lot of showering cloth coming from the behind, from the back of this uh, vitreous. So we decide to, I decide to go and, uh, 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 try and also here in such kind of cases, it's better if you dissect it layer by layer. Try not to do it in block and remove all in one pieces because you don't know exactly what's behind. So my uh, my my approach was trying to remove it layer by layer, as you can see here. Trying to get step. I don't want to catch the retina at any time or at any uh, during the surgery. So one more advice here in that kind of cases just to do step by step or layer by layer. Don't go and plug the section and this is a vitreous hemorrhage and everything is fine and go and eat it. So what I'm doing here, I'm trying to remove layer by layer. And we stop here. I found here at the end, there is a giant, you can see here giant, I call it cloth, giant cloth. In this kind of giant cloth, you cannot remove it in one piece. What I'm trying here, I try to do the segmentation, divide it like uh, in cataract divide and conquer, <laughs> as you want to mention that. So I think it piece by piece because it's a very, I uh, mean, risky to try to remove it, it all in one. It's maybe attaches the retina. You can easily do the retinal detachment. So what I'm trying here, I'm trying vertically to dissect or the segment the, the uh, as you can see here, the blood clot, trying to separate it from the periphery, from behind. But the last piece you can see here, there was a, a retinal tear here. I'll show you now in a minute. You can see it. Uh, now, after all this, you still you can see a layer of blood still or clots attached to the retina. So that's why I use the, the soft tip needle. I use the active suction, just hold it because you cannot remove it. It was very thick. So you, uh, you hold it with passive uh, or negative suction and then you can separate it from the retina and then you activate the active suction, holding it with the endolite to feed it. So it was also thick layer of blood still there on the surface of the retina. Going back to the same place here, which is the pathology is here. You can see here I'll, uh, in a minute. This is just uh, uh, some uh, here. You can see the retinal hair, and there is subretinal membrane, a very big and fibrous one. And I think there is the reason or the source of uh, the hemorrhage. The location of this uh, membrane is uh, extremely uh, atypical for me. In a case of choroidal vascular membrane, you can see it's at, along the upper arcades, and there was a retinal tear above in that. So it was very thick membrane. It takes for me like 30 minutes to remove it. And after that, I weak air fluid exchange, trying to flatten the retina hair. Uh, it was nothing there. But the question here, um, this is just to flatten the retina under air. It was nothing now done. The retina was okay. Everything is fine. Doing endolator at the end of the tear and the periphery and both silicon oil in this case. So my question now because uh, this is the lendo laser just uh, complete lendo laser about the edge of the tear and put silicon oil and remove it after three months because of the tear was big and that's the end of my uh, presentation so my question now what could be this membrane because it, it could be croydon nevascular membrane because but the location for me it's not typical location it's not very macular it's just at the outer upper arcades so any thoughts from my colleagues? What could be yes, the uh, Dr. Ahmad and Nadim, please? Um, 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 actually, beautiful uh, surgery, Ahmed, uh, as usual. And uh, I totally agree uh, with you to go uh, step by step and uh, um, always take your time in such case. Uh, do not rush or else you will uh, face up. Um, uh, you can eat up a, a big part of the retina, actually, unnoticed. Uh, for the membrane, it can be a typical choroidal nevascular membrane, which is uh, uh, peripheral. But um, as well, I would think of um, uh, subretinal uh, um, hemorrhage as well. 
that because if you compare the uh, texture of this membrane or this uh, mass that you removed from the subretinal space, it is uh, more or less similar to the mass that it was yeah. on top of the retina. So it can be just a subretinal hemorrhage. So it can be a, a macro aneurysm, for example, and with the bleeding subretinal and uh, uh, extensive Break hemorrhage. Bridges, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, uh, the, both of them, for me, would uh, be uh, a probable uh, diagnosis. Okay, Dr. Nadim, you have any other things to add? No, nothing to ask, but uh, very interesting case. <laughs> uh, just a few comments. Uh, I agree uh, with both the, uh, Ahmed uh, that uh, the, the presence of this subretinal clot is pretty atypical unless uh, there is some choroidal pathology and uh, not necessarily be a choroidal neovascularization because it cannot occur at that area, but it has to be something which is bled like uh, Ahmed told, subretinal hemorrhage. Or if we have noticed anything on the surface before you took that clot out from the break uh, on the retinal vasculature, or when you remove the clot, did you notice any area of an area of RPE damage or the Brooks damage there. And if it is so, uh, then it may be something growing from underneath. If no, you will see the choroidal area abnormal, uh, something which bled from the choroidal side. Or as he has said, I may say, if, if it's a macroaneurysm, it can have uh, such a massive bleed. If the patient is on aspirin, or anything like that, a polypoidal lesions can also bleed, okay? So, however, uh, I would, what I do in these cases, which has dense, vitreous, hemorrhage, organized, not been touched for years, uh, I don't go straight to the disc. Usually, you, they will have some uh, vitreous separation from the retina. So, while I am doing at the equatorial region, I just nick into one of the uh, side, preferably on the nasal side. Uh, and then if I can see the color of the retina under that, and I look for blood vessels. So if I don't see the blood vessels, I'm pretty sure it's part of the cortical vitreous. The moment I make an opening, uh, you will see dehemoglobinized liquid blood starts to come out and will blur your uh, field. Once you suck most of them through the small window, you might be able to see some blood vessel through that window. If you see that, you are confident that that is the thickened cortical vitreous uh, with uh, hemoglobinized color because of the iron. And uh, you will be safe enough to trim in the periphery first and then go towards the center. That is how I used to approach. And the wonderful case, to thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nadim. Uh, uh, I think we already uh, give uh, enough time for the retina. Thanks for these uh, two cases. Very nice and excellent presentation and nice discussion. Uh, if there is any uh, things before we move to the second uh, part of our uh, meeting, any comment from our speaker, Dr. Lilian or Dr. Ahmed, Ahmed Nadim, Dr. Safwan, Anyone of you didn't have to do, add anything? Just no, in a you. few minutes. Uh, I think you continue. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the retina. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Uh, appreciate. Uh, be with us and we will move. Just I have one thing. Uh, many people, I don't know this one for the management here, and if they are here, me. There is a lot of our uh, participants, they are trying to connect, but they are not able. I received many, many. Uh, WhatsApp and messages about that. Uh, I don't know what is going on. If you can just uh, check, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Jason. Okay. So now just we will move to our second uh, part of our uh, uh, sessions and we will have uh, uh, oculoplasty. Uh, and uh, before we didn't introduce, unfortunately, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Walid Abdullah. Uh, he is going to be with us also. Dr. Walid Abdullah is an MD of RCS. 
consultant ophthalmologist, pediatrics, uh, pediatrics ophthalmology, strabismus, and oculoplasty. He is a fellow of Royal College of Surgeons, Glasgow, UK, fellow of Pas Pascon Balmer Eye Institute, uh, Miami, USA, and fellow of uh, Limoges University, France, fellow of International Council of Ophthalmology. Uh, good evening, Dr. Walid, if you are with us. Uh, hello, Dr. Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Uh, we didn't see you. Okay, anyway, me. now we will have uh, the first talk for the second part by Dr. Uh, Habibullah Atimadi, and he is going to talk about uh, uh, his talk. Sorry, just. You can't say it. I'm sorry, yeah. No, he has. Uh, Habibullah, yeah, he is going to talk about the thyroid. Uh, disease, uh, refractory thyroid eye disease options in management. Uh, Dr. Habib, you are with us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Assalamu alaikum. How are you? Yeah, please. You can start. So share. let me share share the screen. Okay. One second, one second. Where is my talk? Um, you know, how can I go and browse? browse. Screen, share screen. If you are not uh, ready, we can ask Dr. Walid, then you can just... Uh... Yeah, yeah, let Dr. Walid talk. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, Dr. Walid, uh, if you are ready, Dr. Walid. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah, hi, how are you? Yes, um, Dr. Walid, please. Hello, yeah, Dr. Walid, you can, he is going to present uh, the role of uh, uh, stem cells in the management of 3G. Okay. Can you, can you see my screen? Yes. No. No, no, not yet. Share screen, please. Okay. Yeah, share screen is here. Yes, yes. Please click on the the. Yes, now okay, Walid. Okay, just enlarge. Okay. Bismillah uh, rahim Thank you um, for inviting me, uh, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, the role of stem cells. Uh, uh, in the management of trigem. So um, we all know that trigem is very common in our area and it is because of course of uh, the ultraviolet rays uh, which is coming um, from the sun in our area very commonly. The histopathological change in the trigem is coming in the sub-epithelial connective tissue of the, of the conjunctiva, which is uh, whether um, elastodystrophy or elastodysplasia. Uh, um, so, um, because we are all facing this condition and we need to answer those questions to manage properly uh, the condition. So why, when, and what procedure you are going to use and how you are going to do it. And of course, when you are choosing this, you are going to make the balance between the benefits and complications. So uh, first with uh, why we're going to treat the region, uh, um, whether only you are going to treat it when it is going to have a manifested uh, visual impairment because of corneal uh, involvement centrally or because of irregular astigmatism, which is caused by the uh, most of the regions, or because of restrictions in the motility, which is happening when it is extensive or because of disturbance of the ocular surface integrity, um, causing disturbance in the quality of vision, dryness and delen, and many things like this from the surface, or because of atypical appearance of some of them, which is making you doubtful of some aplasia uh, or something like neoplasia. All these are reasons, but when you are going to do, you are going to do the trigium when it is going to reach this, or when it is just like this. You are going to, to do it whether it is nasal or, or temporal. You are going to do it also when it is uh, um, um, atrophic or fleshy, aggressive ones. So the idea is uh, if there is complication like, like uh, sloughing and ulceration of the head or when there is simpliferin. So basically we all all tresia are indicated to be treated, but fleshy elevated tresiums crossing the limbus, encroaching the pupil are of highly indication to be treated, of course. Uh, now the question is what to do. Uh, 
of course, different modalities additional to the excision of the. So the adjuvant therapies to prevent recurrence is the, is the one which is going to be for discussion. So what you are going to add plus to excising the pterygium and leaving a bare scleral area. You are going to use mitomycin, radiotherapy, only conjunctival graft or conjunctival graft with stem cells, or you are going to go for amniotic membrane. So our uh, uh, suggested conjugant uh, treatment is the limbal conjunctival graft with stem cells. And there is a study I did a few years ago about this. So we chose 40 eyes of 20, 32 patients <clears throat> combined between primary and recurrence cases, recurrent cases. Um, there is no, no other ocular illnesses uh, in this study. All patients done with the same surgeon, with the same procedure uh, for treating the region. So this is the, the data, the democratic data of the study. And now we are going to say that all patients went through uh, peribulbar local anesthesia, incising the body of the region first. So it's not starting from the head, we're starting from the body, four to five millimeters back from the limbus. And the head of trigium was separated from the corneal epithelium with peeling technique after removing with uh, uh, the, the, the knife if there is some adhesions, but usually with peeling technique. And the graft was taken exactly with the same size of the bare area of the sclera. And uh, there was a continuous, um, whether from the superior or inferior temporal, temporal uh, uh, temporoparbar uh, conjunctiva. This area is uh, taken according to if there is any glaucoma suspicion, uh, we are taking from the inferior part, but usually we are taking from the superior part. So the graft was moved and sutured with 8O vicryl, and the donor site was left to be epithelialized alone without any uh, suturing. Um, complications came um, with this uh, percentages. So uh, recurrence showed uh, uh, only in uh, three cases after one year follow-up and some scleral scarring showed in 10% uh, of the cases. Delin showed on only in one case, with, which was an aggressive one. So why we are going to use uh, limbal conjunctival graft? Uh, limbal conjunctival graft gives us many really advantages. Like it acts as a spacer. Uh, healthy unexposed conjunctiva will come to the area uh, of the bare sclerer area from unexposed uh, uh, conjunctiva. Uh, it will provide a fire break to uh, the proliferation of the residual abnormal conjunctiva and epsclerer tissue. And the limbus is going to come from, uh, uh, to correct the limbal dysfunction and the limbal graft will act as a barrier again. And then the stem cells will supply the corneal epithelium for a new healthy one. And you will transfer a healthy limbus to the affected area without weakening the donor side. So the conclusion will come to uh, that limbal conjunctival graft appears to be an effective way and technique in preventing tresium from recurrence and can help to improve the best corrected visual equity in patients. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walid, for this uh, excellent presentation uh, uh, and interesting results you mentioned while you are doing the stem cell procedure for treatment of uh, tresium. Uh, Dr. Habib, if you have any question to Dr. Walid or any comment. Uh, no, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Walid. Uh, uh, just uh, shall we discuss now or later on? Yeah, we can. Yeah, we can discuss now for one minute, two minutes, no problem. Um, how postoperatively? How? What was the percentage of uh, cases where you, you had to use uh, five of you, or did you use five of you postoperatively? No, no, no. We didn't use that. The five fillers here, you mean? Yes. No, no. No, we, we uh, uh, in, in a comparative study, other study, we used 
uh, mitomycin, um, but not in this study. This study was only to show the efficacy of uh, uh, of uh, limbal, limbal conjunctival graft. Yes, it was published uh, on PubMed. It is published in uh, internationally. Well done. And another question: When do you send your tritium for histology? Uh, did you see this case which I presented? When yeah, you yeah, have yeah. any any suspicion that there is there may uh, be a, even carcinoma in situ or any any atypia, we are sending. Of course, you will not lose anything if you will send because uh, exactly. of course this 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 um, um, this is not the routine for the normal pterygia, of course. But uh, for any case like this, we are preferring, of course, to, to, to send. And it is documented that some cases are having some malignancy changes. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, Doctor Safwan, very fast, please, yes. Uh, Doctor, uh, yes. you mentioned the conjunctival graft and stem cell. Yes. And, uh, uh, we did, you didn't show us the, clearly, surgically, how uh, are... I have a video if you if Dr. Muhammad will allow me to share with you for this uh, because the you know the, the the lecture was not planned so if you want me to share with you the video no, no, uh, no. I will try to uh, okay we can we can do it maybe if we have a time at the end of the sessions please okay, okay. this is what I expected no. yeah I'm just my question to the stem cell you are implanting yes. the stem cell Yes, yes, you will go two millimeters in the clear cornea. We're going to go to your side, Dr. Safwan. So no. we'll get clear cornea. Uh, okay. So you will get the limbal stem cells and you, you can with the microscope to see that you are really taking the, 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 the stem cells. Okay. I had one question very quick. Uh, still, yes, by please. the way, the limbal area, not only the cornea, they have a stem cells. So the stem cells uh, covered conjunctiva and the cornea. So the limb is all, they have stem cells. So you don't need to go completely too much in the cornea because you still need to keep some stem cell in the in the donor area really true in the start we were in the start of the the work we were going a bit more uh, uh, in uh, the cornea after that we are not that much of course because of that this is correct this is dr osama's uh, word that are, are correct that we are not going that much in the clear cornea but if you want to be 100 percent sure of course you will go mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So we need okay to move fast. Uh, so now we go to my dear friends, Dr. Habib. He will give a, a case series about refractory thyroid eye disease. Dr. Habib. We are hearing you, Dr. Habib. You can start us. Hi, can you? Mohammed? Yes, yes, go ahead, please. I was disconnected. Shall I go in the presenter's view? No, you, yeah, go to the presenter. Yeah, you are okay. Good now, right? You can hear me? Yes. Okay, one second. How can I stop? Just, just, yeah, on computer, Dr. Habib. Yeah, 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 one second. You can see my slides, right? Yes, yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. so we will talk about the refractory thyroid eye disease, uh, a couple of case series. And I would like to thank uh, uh, all of you, Dr. Muhammad, DOS, for, for this. Uh, a special thanks goes to Dr. Fatma Habrush, and Dr. Manal, the department. Uh, this is our, <coughs> our beautiful Abu Dhabi. Uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us, keep everybody safe. Uh, I have no financial disclosure to say, so I will do, this is my outline of the talks. We will go through some cases and we'll talk about the refractory thyroid eye disease. Um, so thyroid eye disease uh, <coughs> is quite common problem in, uh, in thyroid dysfunction patients and uh, uh, it's an autoimmune disease that severe thyroid eye disease can cause the optic uh, nerve compression. And, uh, <coughs> and the main state of the treatment when somebody has optic nerve compression is either corticosteroids, IV steroids, or some, in some centers oral uh, or, or surgery uh, or optic nerve radiation. I'm not optic nerve, I mean the uh, orbital radiation. So <coughs> recently biologics have been shown to be effective which are non-responsive to systemic thyroid eye disease, or they have a recurrence following completing the systemic steroids, or they show uh, uh, side effects of the systemic steroids. These biologics are rituximab, infliximab, tocilizumab, teprotumab, and there are a couple of others, which really, uh, they have been <laughs> some cases, uh, reported cases. 
of these, tocilizumab and tepotumab uh, are uh, uh, better studied. Uh, the aim is to describe <coughs> our experience for severe thyroid refractory uh, thyroid eye diseases. So by refractory thyroid eye disease, we mean that uh, these are the inclusion criteria, clinical activity score of six or more by clinical activity score, clinical and radiological evidence of optic nerve compression, that is decreased vision, decreased compromised color vision, visual field defects, and the CT scan evidence or MRI evidence of optic nerve compression, a combination of them or one or two of them. And they should fail to high dose of oral steroids uh, or oral or IV steroids, or there, sh there should be a recurrence of aggressive disease after initial response to systemic steroids and complications related to systemic administration of the systemic uh, of the steroids. So these are our inclusion, and this is what we call a refractory uh, thyroid eye disease, where the optic nerve is compromised. So our, uh, we give IV to silizumab, eight milligram per kilogram uh, for four months, so once per month, plus minus uh, continuation of the systemic steroids, plus minus azathioprine, and the documentation of visual activity, hair tail, exophonometry, ocular motility, uh, activity, thyroid function tends, TSI levels, LFT, and, as well as interleukin-6 levels, lipid profiles, and we also noted all of the side effects with Elisa. So and this is a case which came to us with counting wind, uh, <coughs> four months uh, complaining of the co uh, counting finger in the right eye, severe thyroid eye disease, and uh, and uh, when she came, she was, color vision was zero, counting the red, visual field was lost. And then, um, and she got progressively, we had to convince her for another cycle of IV steroids. It, she, it, she did not improve. And with the four doses of the cyclosporin, uh, of the, of the tocilizumab, her vision came back with, uh, with uh, a six, nine vision and uh, uh, resolving of relative apparent kidney defect and improvement in all aspects. This is another case <laughs> which was with us for a long period of time. Um, we had a problem with her coming to the clinics from time. So this was in June 2018, July 2018. As you see, she's getting worse, uh, 2019. And uh, this is, uh, where is that now? Let me see. So this is the February 2019, okay? So <laughs> we, we had, a difficulty in uh, in convincing. I mean, she was not responsive. This was this was. Look at her eye movements. Okay, look at her eye movements, especially in the up gaze. She cannot look up gaze, and this is <laughs> after four doses of the uh, tocilizumab, uh, uh, and she is now awaiting orbital decompression. So. Uh, So I think, so this is actually the same, same patient. Now, this is another patient who came to us non-responsive really to anything. You know, this was a thyroid eye disease, losing sight and severe uh, uh, proptosis as well as chemosis. And, and really we couldn't do anything with her. So we started this tocilizumab with her and she slowly improved if you see the pictures. And here it is she uh, before, um, uh, before and after them. Uh, course of treatment completed. <laughs> I would like to show you this case as well. The right eye, again, the usual scenario that decrease in visual activity, color vision, and as well as uh, decreased vision. And this tocilizumab, her, 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 <coughs> her inflammatory site subsided. Uh, her proptosis improves from 30 millimeters to, to 27 millimeters in the right eye. By the way, this patient had left eye surgery already elsewhere, not in our institute. So this is uh, after four doses of tocilizumab, and she improved a lot her vision, visual fields, color vision, everything. And this is a couple of weeks after the right lateral orbital wall decompression. And uh, I will show you our results. At the moment, we have about 12 patients, but I'm, we have analyzed six patients. All of these patients, you know, their proptosis improved, their visual activity improved, and um, all of them, they had previous IV steroids, which were non-responsive to that. And, uh, and the, the adverse effects 
were really very good actually, except the one case which we had lipidemia and this lipidemia, all we have to do is to wait a couple of weeks before the lipidemia, uh, lipidemia resolves. And one patient had uh, <coughs> back pain uh, during an, one of the last infusion. And uh, uh, two of them had pure tisulizumab. Uh, one had uh, azotype, so, uh, so three had continuation or tapering of oral steroids and all of them, the oral steroids were stopped with tapering dose. And <laughs> two patients had azotaprine, which were stopped again uh, approximately six months after initiation. Clinical score activity, you can see all of them, they improved. Uh, right eye proptosis, they improved as well. Left eye proptosis, they improved as well. So in some cases, up to six to eight millimeters, <laughs> which is amazing, you know? Some of them, they don't need surgery. Uh, we said, oh, okay, we will give you, and then we'll do the surgery, but now they don't need surgery. Thyroid stimulating immunoglobulins in all of them, they were high and they, they, they decreased. I don't have the, the, the slide for the interleukin-6, but interleukin-6 also, all of them, they are increased and all of them, they improve. Now, <clears throat> as the discussion, thyroid eye disease is very complex. Autoimmune disease with multiple treatment modalities are needed. You know, it's not an easy, you know, you have to be with these patients between two to four years. Uh, Teprotumab has been recently approved in the past uh, two years. Um, so uh, it's very, very promising, but uh, teprotumab is, is really, you know, a treatment course of eight courses. It costs 1.5 million dirhams. And uh, this, this tusilizumab costs 10,000 dirham per injection, really, depending on the patient's weight, eight to 10,000. We are looking now to see what is the reactivation rate after cessation, stopping the tusilizumab and how long does it take? Actually, we had one reactivation already, and but I think it's an excellent alternative to teprotumab. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, thank you, Mohammed and the US for everything. Thank you very much, Dr. Nadim. Uh, sorry, Dr. Habib, uh, for this an excellent presentation. Really excellent, um, and very good uh, experience also, and good management. Um, I have one question in my mind. Uh, I mean, what is the effect of these drugs? How it's work? Uh, in it's, giving it's interleukin six, so it inhibits the the action of interleukin six. And interleukin six <clears throat> is uh, is pro-inflammatory um, uh, 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 pro, uh, uh, substance, which you know the. So it's at the final levels of inflammatory process where it causes the inflammatory within the orbital cells, within the orbital cells, fibroblasts, uh, affects on fibroblasts, interleukin on the uh, white blood cells. It attracts, it's, it's chemoattractant, as well as it causes the transformation of the uh, cells into more inflammatory process. So it, it specifically uh, stops, binds to the, its receptor and it stops it from working. <clears throat> How is reverse the action? I mean, the effect of thyroid already available in it. Pardon? How it affect, give the effect by reversing the, the, the effect of thyroid? Yeah, no, so the, because as I said, it's an autoimmune, it's an immune process. So, so steroids stops the immune, the inflammation process are very high in the cascade. This one goes very low and very specific to the inflammatory process. So it practically stops, um, it stops attracting the inflammatory cells and the ongoing inflammatory process at the site in the orbit is also stopped. How frequently are giving these uh, drugs? Once a, month, once a month. Once a month. But we, and you we, are giving why through what? A local injection? IV, 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 IV. 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 Yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Habib. I mean, if you look at this picture, Mohammed, I don't know if you can see. It. So the right eye, we were treating for the right eye, but if you see the left eye, it improved as well, if you can see the, the, the pictures. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Oh, yes, Dr. Safwan. Dr. Habib, uh, is there any comparative study with the use of cyclosporine and steroid? No, no. There is no comparative study. No. So do you have. You mean systemic, systemic, right? You mean systemic cyclosporine and. Uh, yes. No, no, no. So these the cases, in these cases, cyclosporine and azathioprine alone doesn't work, Dr. Hmm. Yeah. 
Okay, Dr. Walid, do you have any comment or question before we move to the, our yeah. last? Yes, doctor. Very doctor, fast, please. Yes. Doctor Habib, uh, um, you have any experience with local injection of steroids? This is number one. And number two, the, um, are you going to replace uh, this? These medicines are going to replace the uh, the orbital decompression in your experience? No, I mean, uh, in some, I don't know the exact statistics because uh, we haven't done a lot of these. So the, uh, the only problem with these cases is that uh, the insurance doesn't approve it. So the patients have to pay. And uh, the ins for insurance to approve some of these cases have insured by, by approved by insurance, we have to do so much paperwork. And, <laughs> and some patients just opt to go to pay 40,000 dirham and that's it. That's number one. I don't think orbital, look, you saw one of the patients which had 30 millimeters of proptosis. She, he came down to 27. And then we did uh, orbital decompression, which he came down to, mashallah, to 20. And uh, so possibly you can, you can avoid orbital decompression in 20% of the case, cases, but I don't think it's more than that because Proptosis improves, but in patients who have more than 26, 27, it counts 23, and then what? So you have to decompress them. And I okay. think the same, the same would be true for the tepotumumab. And, and from um, the, first, the first part of the question was the local injection, peribulbar injection of steroids. I don't have experience, but I know our colleagues in Egypt have excellent experience, and we are awaiting them to publish. However, after every single decompression, I inject... Uh, the uh, steroid uh, uh, into the uh, into the surgical area. I have had a oh, couple couple of high uh, IOPs after after this, but I think it's a very very good remedy treatment uh, post surgical post orbital decompression. But I have no experience with uh, uh, treating the active thyroid eye disease with uh, retrobulbar or parabulbar peribulbar injection was set it. But our okay. colleagues in Egypt have excellent results. Yeah. Uh, thank you thank very you. much. I think we need to move to our last uh, part of this uh, session. Uh, and we will have the first speaker, Dr. Uh, Safwan Al-Bayati, will give a case presentation in refractive surgery about astigmatism. This is Dr. Safwan. Good evening, everybody. I think that we will uh, go through and share directly to start because uh, we already pass over time. Hopefully that we can be on the time. So uh, these are a case presentation. And first of all, thanks to Dr. Mohammed to, to give me this opportunity. And this is the first case. Now, uh, a female present 27 years old with this uh, refractive error, minus nine for right eye, minus 9.25 and minus 9.75. Point eight, the aided vision for both. And she's seeking for any refractive surgery. She's been promised for a trans PRK elsewhere. And when we are saying to, to her retina, it's fine. This is the right eye and this is the left eye. And it's fine for the corneal map. Usually I'm starting with the tangential map and this is for the right eye. It was perfectly fine. There was no any contraindication for any refractive surgery. And when we will go to the uh, higher derivations, it's the same, and it was within the accepted limit. Now, left eye, same, and uh, everything was perfect. Higher derivations, everything was perfect. So it's accepted. Now, Pentacam, it shows that she has a um, vertical uh, 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 astigmatism, both, and the case is accepted for the refractive surgery. So our option for the treatment here, it was LASIK, laser PRK, and ICL. So I don't know whether we, I can ask my colleague, uh, Dr. Uh, Osama, he's there. Yeah, he's still awake. Okay, so Osama, he's there and he's awake. So we can ask him whether what he prefer for this case. For minus nine and above, but I go for ICL unless there's a AC dip is a problem or, or well, yeah. well, I can I, I can agree with you, uh, but usually, Doctor Osama, um, uh, when I'm when I'm doing such a cases, in twenty seven minus nine, I will go to have an idea about 
the axial length. So I went to have an idea, and that's the idea. The axial length is 22.8 for the right and 22.9 for the left. And the can we have minus nine in such patients? The, the answer is no. So it's very clear that we have an abnormal issues or an, an something wrong. And that's the wrong. It's a, a, a nuclear uh, myopia or uh, uh, um, uh, myopia resulted from the cataract. And that's the left eye. And we went, we changed all our approach and we went through and we checked the periphery of the retina and we decided to go through a cataract. So my uh, message through this case is that we need to be careful when we are deciding because a few cases that th this patient was postponed for the surgery means that she was in her way to do the trans PRK and she stopped it for a second opinion. So the, the issue is that she finished all the investigation for trans PRK and then we, uh, uh, she came for a second opinion. So we can imagine that trans PRK for minus nine in this case with this kind of cutter. Okay, now that's the issues that she decided to go through a um, uh, 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 trifocal and her vision was corrected and this is the result after the correction and we end up with minus 0.25, minus 0.25 with a toric trifocal. Okay, now let's go to the second case. Now our second case have female, 35 years, contact lens user, start to be uh, intolerance to the contact lens uh, and phthalmic history shows an implantation of refractive lens, both eyes, AC lens right and ICL left. And this is the uh, 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 visual acuity and the, 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 um, uh, all her readings uh, pre-op, unaided for right 0.2, for left 0.16, aided 0.6 for right, one for the left with minus 2.75 minus one, minus 3.75 minus one. High order versions 0.85 total for the right, and 0.37 for the left. Trifoil, 0.74 for the right, where there is an, uh, a refractive lens, and 0.11 for the left. And we can see that the higher order region is high in the right because there is an a, a, a refractive lens. Comma for the right was within accepted limit, but for, but for the left, it's a little bit high, but it's accepted still within the accepted limit. Spherical abrasion for the right and left within the accepted limit. If we are going through, we will see that the higher order abrasions for the right is a little bit high. Now, that was the uh, specular microscope and was fine for both because we have an, 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 a refractive lens for the right and ICL for the left. Retina, both fine. This shows uh, changes definitely, but most uh, the trochlear pressure was normal and all her measurement and record that she presented, it was the same. So we considered that it's a myopic with the, with the visual field was uh, uh, within the accepted myopic changes. And this is the retina for the left and this is the right with uh, uh, artisan lens in, the, in its position central and uh, the eye looks fine and uh, the centration of the lens is it's fine also. Left, uh, this is after dilatation, sorry, and it can be dilated, so position and location of the lens is perfect. Now this is the left with the, with the ICL before dilatation, and this is with the dilatation, and the position of the lens and the centration is per perfectly fine. Anterior OCT for the, for the right and left, for the right, sorry, which is with the, with the artisan, it looks central and the, uh, the iris lens, uh, uh, human lens and the artisan uh, diaphragm, it's, it's perfectly fine. Now, if we will go to the left with the ICL and you, you can see that the vault is, is perfect and the angulation is perfect, so everything is fine. 
and there is a PI because the lens was an old one, old fashioned. Now, if we will go to our reading Pentacam for topometric, all the, the reading that uh, done for the cornea active surgery on to the cornea. So that's, that's, that's why I'm presenting it in a way that uh, for our option, it will be accepted. And these are all. The angulation by Pentacam was clearly accepted and fine, 38.5. For the uh, this is for the right, and this is for the uh, for the left with ICL, and you can see that it's twenty. But there is a big PI surgical done. This is the higher derivations for the right, as I mentioned. That the total uh, root mean square it's high because of the artisan. For the left, it was low because the ICL uh, didn't create any ocular uh, uh, higher derivations, and. If we will go to the total corneal power, you can see there is a, a, a definitely we did it and we sh it shows um, astigmatic changes very clearly in the left more than the right. Again, tangential uh, map was clear for the right and left. And for preparation for any interve uh, 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 surgical intervention for the cataract, we did everything and it was uh, the total corneal power because I'm doing it and because I'm, I need just if, we, if I decide to go through a cataract for a toricity or not. So I'm doing the total corneal power and it was very clear here. Now, all these investigation, I did it just to reach to this option. And I think that uh, my dear colleague, Dr. Osama, he is sharing me with this option. We have here two options, main, main as uh, bioptics to correct the refractive error in this uh, uh, case, which is post uh, right eye uh, artisan, left eye ICL. Either we can do a fake lens extraction with a clear lens extraction to correct the refractive error in this patient for both eyes, or do a bioptics refractive correction. And we mean by bioptics is a top up. And that bioptic will be guided by corneal wave front, LASIK or laser, or it will be guided by ocular wave front, LASIK or laser. I think that Dr. Osama, he's uh, very expert in, in dealing with, the, with these. And I think that he's, he's waiting for me to, to share him with me for, for the option. So Osama, what you will go through what? Third option. To third change option. the artisan to ICL. Uh, the, what do you mean by third option? There is, there, there's only two options. Yeah, my third option is to change the artisan because the artisan still the slightly descender slightly and the vision is not good and still myopic. So if I change this artisan with yeah. ICL with okay. accurate power, I think we'll okay. solve the problem for this patient. Okay, so so here the artisan with with the with the with the uh, uh, re replacing it to the ICL, right? That's correct. Okay, and what about the ICL? Eye, the left eye. Then you can do laser, to laser by refractive surgery. Okay. So what I did is that, uh, as I show you, the artisan uh, was not showing uh, uh, a lot of um, uh, ocular. Uh, it, it's still the cornea was the the main source for the higher derivation. So I went through a, a bioptic refractive correction guided by corneal wave front for both, and I didn't remove it because. The issue is that when I asked the patient for any intervention for a lens, just to remove the lens, she refused at all to do any intervention intraocularly. So that was the only option for me for both eyes. And you can see that the result was perfect. And she ended up with 0.9 for the right and one for the left with the refractive error right, minus 0.5, minus 0.75, still with the rule, and left minus 0.25, minus 0.5, 90. And that, uh, uh, that was, uh, uh, yeah, she was very happy with this uh, refractive uh, uh, end. Great, thanks for you for, for- Thank you very much. Very nice and excellent presentation, Safwan. We can move to the next speaker, Dr. Osama. And he is going to talk about managing enhancement procedure post laser refractive surgery. Please, Osama. <clears throat>
we have only 11 minutes. We need to finish as soon as possible. I know I don't want to stress you, Sama, but no problem. Yeah, it's Whatever with Muhammad now. Okay, we'll see if it's coming. Why well, it doesn't open? Can you see my screen now? Uh, but you didn't select. Can you select only the presentation? Yeah, I selected. It's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Not coming. Yeah, now we click yeah, some on that. Yes. Is it okay now? No. It doesn't come as a, as a presentation? No, we are seeing only the, the different LASIKs, only the Tables only, yeah. I open it twice, so. Oh, Osama, can you just stop uh, sharing? Stop share and go again, yes. Yeah. Open it. And, and select and the particular window. I'll close down. Okay. Open, Osama. Is it okay now? Sama, if you can do one thing, please. Um, I just close, stop share, open it alone without sharing first and make it down. Then after that, yeah, yeah, you can open it for yourself before you share. I did it, just, uh, but I'll check okay. it. Okay, now open. Yes, it's open now. Okay. Go ahead. Just make it on a slide show and that's it. From down, yes. Okay, that's the hiding. Okay, uh, no problem. You can go no like problem. this, Osama. Yeah? Not okay, not should be fine. It's okay now? Yes, Osama. Perfect. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so basically, I'm talking about uh, post -lasic enhancement. I'm sure you had many patients now. People come to us who had laser surgery and the LASIK and they have refractive error need to have a surgery. I always ask why this patient have refractive error. It could be when you do the surgery, they may have refractive error residual after straight after laser surgery because of undercorrected, overcorrected, or creating the flap itself can change the refraction of the patient. And the other reason why people have refractive error return, what you call regression, which could be from epithelium hyperplasia, stromal healing, or people who come after many years, it could be because of the axial lens, especially if someone had a very young age, or lens change, especially people at age of 40. But very important really to exclude ectasia as a cause of this refractive error, because if it's a cause of ectasia, you need to treat it. You cannot do any further laser surgery. Epithelium remodeling is very important to think about because it can mask any fine irregularity. But one important thing is when you, if you do surface laser, if you remove all the epithelium, which was remodeling and could be thicker, by removing the epithelium, the new epithelium remodeling could be different thickness and that can give you surprises and refractive error not to predict it. Uh, always there's two options usually we do if we do LASIK enhancement either to lift the original flap or to do, so there's a missing, either the original flap, we're lifting it, or we can do surface laser, either PRK or trans-PRK. There's another modality, which some people, you can choose it. If someone had femto laser, LASIK before, basically you could creating another side cut and then lifting the flap, the new side cut. And there's a study show is very effective way to do another lifting a flap, but just with the new flap edge to reduce the epithelium and growth. The treatment profile, when you choose what laser I want going to use, is the best thing, always use a standard treatment profile for the patient, uh, especially if the patient's happy with the correction with the glasses, vision is happy, so you don't need to do any complicated profile, but you could consider wavefront treatment, topo guided treatment in selective case, such as patient who had night vision problems, uh, people had uh, small optic zone treatment, or they have the center ablation, 
uh, always remember if you're using this wavefront or topo guided that you could over correcting and you may remove much more tissue than normal. So use it just for selective cases. Otherwise just use this normal profile of the laser. Always, always when you consider flap lifting, always we think about two major risks really, the epithelium and growth and ectasia. That's the two things we worry about, but it could have many risks like TLK, abrasion, strea, tear film, tear uh, flap tears or infection. So like any previous surgery. Uh, risk of epithelium and growth, the duration between the actual surgery and enhancement, that's the, the most common risk factor why people develop epithelium and growth. It's more common if you use a microkeratome before than femtolaser, if you have hyperaerobic treatment because you're affecting the edge of the flap. But the most important factor really is the surgical technique and the surgery experience. If the surgeon very experienced how to handle flap lifting and look at the, all these fine details, the risk of epithelium and growth is much less in their hand. Uh, epithelium growth uh, studies show it's about 1%, but the risk of epithelium growth increased much high, especially after three years from the previous surgery. Complication of PRK on the flap, uh, common one is corneal haze, but it's all the risk factor of PRK like pain, slow recovery, recurrent corneal erosion, infection, uh, it's, it's still there. But one different factor here, as we mentioned about the epithelium itself thickness, remodeling of the new epithelium, it can affect the predictability of reactive error of this patient. So it's nice to know this epithelium patient thickness that will give you a predictable factor. Risk of haze, one study by Corona, when they did all PRK without metamycin C, risk is was very high and many patients lose best corrective visual acuity. So standard of care nowadays, we need to use metamycin C for every patient who need PRK over LASIK flap, regardless what refractive error. Metamycin C really changed the, all the way how we're correcting this patient, but still we don't have idea what concentration we should use and the duration. So there's a lot, there's no fix it, but we need to use metamycin C and studies show many concentrations have the same effect. But there's still like there's a chance of haze of, after BRK in this patient, especially if you're treating very high refractive error, if your ablation depth will go through the flap thickness, so it's nice to know the flap thickness beforehand. Uh, if you do the BRK earlier than one year from the LASIK surgery, or if someone had a history of colloid, they are more risk of haze than other people. But the advantage of the BRK really, by technically you eliminate the risk of epithelium and growth. A retreatment of the flap, so you, when you're treating of the flap, as you know, the flap doesn't induce any strain to the cornea, so by removing some tissue of the flap, technically reducing the risk of ectasia of this patient, but also if the patient had fine wrinkle, which may affect the vision, you could use the chance that you could do surface laser, either trans -PRK or BTK with PRK, ideal to smoothing the surface, so treat the wrinkle, and at the same time to reflect, uh, treat the refractive error remaining of this patient. Uh, we did a study when we were in the UK comparing the LASIK flap lift and PRK, and really it's a big number of patients, 1,520. Uh, and looking at the different group, metamycin C and the flap lifting, uh, is the enhancement spherical equivalent is very close to each other for BRK group or flap lift group. Uh, same for myopia and hyperopia. And after three months, really both of them achieve very good predictability. After surgery, slightly better with flap lift. The same things for hyperopic group. For myopic also achieve very good best corrective vision. However, the quality of vision and 6.6 and 6.5 vision is slightly better with the flap lifter group than the BRK group. Same also for hyperopic vision. And about the safety, people gain more vision, people who are lifting a flap than do the BRK over the surface for both groups. So slightly better lifting a flap than the BRK in our study. So when you had the patient, you need to decide, shall I lift the flap or not? Decision really you need to have to think about two things, either risk of epithelium and growth and ectasia on one side when you're lifting a flap, or the risk of uh, slow recovery, pain, haze, and the predictability and precision of the vision in the other side. So patient expectation also another factor. So remember that if someone had BRK, it's, they do be, uh, if you had LASIK, sorry, if you had LASIK before and you do PRK, they have different experience. So this patient really, they don't like the top up he did because they have suffered pain, which, which 
before with the had LASIK, there's no pain, fast recovery, so they have different experience. So very important to include the patient uh, in, the, in the decision making. Uh, my personal experience and recommendation uh, to lift a flap if you had a surgery less than three years, if it's my patient, or at least I know uh, the surgical information, if there's no button hole, no problem with the flap, and it's good to have uh, stromal thickness measure, or the best thing to do OCT for this patient. If you had OCT access, it's good to measure the stromal thickness, so you know that's how much, if there's enough tissue to remove it without risk of bactasia, but also to make sure there's no missing button hole or something which you may find in Sobras if you're lifting a flap for someone you don't know about him. Uh, however, it, I recommend the BRK with metamycin C and not lifting a flap. If someone had very long LASIK procedure, more than three years, if someone had a history of coronary bridging during the surgery or some had recurrent coronary erosion or there's a sign of anterior basin membrane dystrophy, if there's vascularization across the flap or there's very strong haze and the flap edge, that's make it difficult to lift and trauma. So there's more risk of epithelium growth. If someone had epithelium growth in the same eye or he had epithelium growth in the other eye, so it's better to avoid it in the second eye. Uh, if Can someone, we conclude, Usama? We already finished the time. So basically, in conclusion, the flap enhancement, it's, if you lift the flap, it's very predictable, more effective, and comfort fast recovery. But you can consider also surface laser as alternative option. It's uh, Especially if you worry about ectasia, no enough tissue, stromal remaining thickness. Uh, and if someone you do it after many years of the laser surgery. Always you need to use metamycin C for any procedure, surface laser over the flap. And thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Osama, for this very nice and excellent presentation. Uh, sorry, we don't have a time also to do any discussions further, but uh, I would like to thank all our speaker and panelists they share in this uh, session. And special thank also to those and uh, all the team they are behind organizing this uh, uh, prestigious conference. A special thanks also for Dr. Subarjadia, the president, and Dr. Smart uh, Namarta for also kind invitation. Thank you all and uh, good much. Thanks a lot. Bye -bye. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you Thank much. you. That was Thank wonderful. You. Thank you for keeping in time. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and all Thank speakers. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. All right, so let's move ahead, ladies and gentlemen. Now we are in Hall B and you're watching International DOS Conference. And now the next session is Singapore Society of Ophthalmology Complications and Challenges of High Myopia. And to chair this, we have Mr. Gavin Tan, Dr. Marcus Ang. And let me tell you that we have total four speakers. So I'd like to request Mr. Dr. Gavin Tan to please take it over. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to the Singapore Society of Ophthalmology uh, Symposium at the DOS conference. Uh, good afternoon to everybody, and I hope you've had a good um, meeting so far. Uh, today, our session will be talking about the, the complications of high myopia. I have a, a panel of colleagues here with me, and uh, they'll be covering a variety of topics that covers uh, both retinal, glaucoma, um, complications, as well as imaging issues that have arised with the increasing prevalence of high myopia. Um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, um, who's also our co-chairman, uh, Dr. Marcus Ang. He's a cornea refractive specialist, as well as our clinical director of our myopia center. And he will be talking about imaging in myopia, the challenges and advances. Marcus. Thank you very much, Gavin. Uh, and thanks very much to the organizing chairs uh, for inviting the Singapore Society of Ophthalmology for us to speak at this symposium. Uh, we thought it would be a good idea to share on a topic which obviously is an important aspect of our clinical um, uh, cases that we see in Singapore, especially East Asia myopia. It's recognized as a growing problem, not only in Asia, but also spreading to the rest of the world. Uh, so um, the first talk that I will be sharing on is the advances as well as some of the challenges in imaging the myopic eye. Um, and so without further ado, I'm just gonna go to my slides. So I've pre-recorded the, the lecture, so let, let's see if it works.
सर ऑडियो इज नॉट कमिंग डॉक्टर मार्कस योर ऑडियो इज नॉट कमिंग या वी कैन हियर नाउ I need to share my share my audio as well. Okay, just, just give, give me a second. Now you can yeah. stop sharing. Yeah, I want to share. I have to share my audio from my computer as I'll well. I'll guide you. I'll guide you. Just stop sharing once. Yeah. Yeah, and again, click on the share screen. Yeah. Do you see the share left sound. hand button? Share sound. Yeah. Button. Yeah. Yeah. Do that. Thank you. organizing committee for this invitation to provide an update on the advances in imaging for myopia these are my financial disclosures none of which are relevant to my lecture today in this lecture i will be talking about the importance of imaging the myopic eye as well as various indications and challenges of imaging Myopia is now recognized as one of the major public health concerns around the world and especially in Asia. In particular, there's an increasing number of persons developing high myopia who are at risk of visual loss. And this is compounded by the trend of aging populations around the world. Moreover, myopia is associated with an increased risk of potentially sight-threatening complications. Thus, Imaging the myopic eye plays an important role in identifying complications early and monitoring myopia progression. However, this can be challenging due to the irregular shape usually associated with high or pathologic myopia. Today, I will be discussing recent advances in imaging that may overcome some of these challenges. Fundus photography is a key part of clinical evaluation and serial monitoring of myopic macular degeneration. While this captures most of the key changes in the posterior pole, some myopic changes begin and extend from the periphery. Moreover, traditional fundus photography often is unable to fully evaluate changes associated with posterior staphyloma formation due to its limited field of view. Wide field fundus photography potentially captures up to seven times the area of a traditional fundus photo. This would allow for detection of peripheral retinal changes such as cirrhosis vessels or non-perfusion associated with staphyloma formation. Wide field fundus photography also allows for a more holistic evaluation of the myopic fundus. While objectively documenting images of the peripheral retina. OCT technology has also improved. allowing for better visualization of the vitreous and choroid enabling non-invasive angiography and a wider field of imaging OCT is a useful imaging tool to diagnose and monitor macular changes associated with myopic traction maculopathy while it can also be used to evaluate deeper layers such as the choroid and sclera associated with pathologic myopia Myopic CNV, which has traditionally been diagnosed and monitored using invasive dye-based angiography, can now be monitored and diagnosed using non-invasive OCT angiography, which allows for rapid non-contact serial imaging and monitoring of treatment response. And this complements existing imaging techniques to aid clinical evaluation and management of myopic CNV. Thus, Multimodal imaging enables clinicians to now use a variety of characteristics to identify the various phases in myopic choroidal neovascularization. OCT angiography also allows for a closer examination of vascular changes associated with myopia, as choroidal changes may play a key role in myopia progression and development of complications. Automated segmentation software now enables us to perform detailed analysis of retinal and choroidal vascular layer images. However, it must be recognized that accurate segmentation of the choroidal vascular layers, especially in myopic eyes, is still challenging at the moment. Nonetheless, 
Future improvements in this software could allow us to better understand the role of choroidal vasculature in myopia and pathologic myopia. Another advancement in OCT imaging is the improved resolution, depth, and field of view, which allows for a more holistic evaluation of the sclera and Brooks membrane in highly myopic eyes with posterior staphyloma. Currently, objective imaging and measurements in eyes with pathologic myopia and posterior staphyloma is challenging and require modalities such as MRI, which are not readily available and cannot be routinely performed in the eye clinic. Thus, advances in wide field OCT imaging may allow comprehensive 3D reconstruction of highly myopic eyes, allowing for objective measurements and monitoring of staphyloma progression. Together, wide field photography, wide field OCT and OCT angiography has enhanced the potential for evaluating myopic eyes as well as its complications. Another clinical unmet need is the evaluation of the myopic optic depth, where the abnormal structures makes it difficult to diagnose glaucoma and differentiate this from myopic optic neuropathy. Recent improvements in OCT imaging may lead to novel biomarkers which predict risk of developing myopic optic neuropathy. Finally, recent advances in evaluating corneal and sclerobiomechanics biomechanics may help identify eyes at risk of myopic progression or staphyloma development. While the inclusion of OCD imaging into biometry systems may improve measurements, especially in myopic eyes. In summary, recent advances in imaging technology has shown great potential to impact clinical evaluation and management of patients with myopia. I'd like to acknowledge my team from SERI and SNEC, and I thank you for your time. Thank you, Marcus, for that very comprehensive talk on imaging in myopia. Um, I think we will hold the questions until the end of the session. And I think I'd like to just, just go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is Dr. Wong Chi Wai. He's a surgical retina specialist with the Singapore National Eye Center. And today he'll be talking about the complications of high myopia. Chi Wai. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. All right. Okay. So good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you once again for the invitation to speak today. I'll be touching on the complications of pathologic myopia, uh, which will include posterior, staphylo posterior staphyloma, uh, myopic macular degeneration, as well as myopic choroidal neovascularization. So first, let us uh, talk about posterior staphyloma. So here you can see uh, this is the shape of a non-myopic eye. A myopic eye will, be, uh, will have this axial elongation. And an eye with a posterior staphyloma has an outpouching of the posterior fundus that has a radius of curvature that is smaller than the radius of curvature of the adjacent uh, sclera wall. How do we diagnose posterior staphyloma? So most commonly what we do uh, is uh, clinical examination with a slit lamp or with a binocular indirect ophthalmoscopy. Uh, but B-scan, uh, OCT are both very useful modalities for characterizing uh, posterior staphyloma as well. And 3D MRI is again also very useful, although it's mainly used in the research setting nowadays. And with wide field fundus photography, it has become even easier to uh, diagnose posterior staphyloma from uh, fundus photos alone. So this is uh, three-dimensional MRI, uh, which can nicely capture the configurations of different types of posterior staphyloma, as you can see here. Uh, Swap source OCT with its uh, wider scan 
with. Uh, it's also very useful for picking up the uh, edges of the posterior staphyloma. So here you can see a change in the scleral uh, curvature. And there's also a change in the thickness of the choroid as the staphyloma dips down into the, its wall over here. So this is actually a wide field OCT scan. And with a wide field fundus photography, uh, we cannot pick up uh, posterior staphyloma that has, they are very wide. So for example, in this patient who has a wide uh, macular staphyloma, you can see the change in contour of blood vessels as they move from the one part of the scleral wall into dipping into the wall of the staphyloma. And also most staphyloma has a coral retinal atrophy at its edges. So this can be picked up easily on white field photography. There are several types of staphylomas, but uh, in general, you can group them into macular staphylomas, which can be divided further into white and narrow macular staphylomas. Then you also have the peripapillary staphyloma, the nasal ones, which are uh, more rare, and the inferior ones, which are rare as well. And also other types, uh, some of which I'll show later here. So now with swept source OCT, uh, we can now uh, we are able to now uh, reconstruct three-dimensional images using the two-dimensional B scans. So in this image, you can see uh, this is an OCT B scan. And with the reconstructed three-dimensional image, you can actually see that this patient has a compound staphyloma with an apex, one at the optic disc and one at the macula. This is another three-dimensionally uh, reconstructed image which shows a compound staphyloma. And in addition, you can see a horizontal ridge here of the uh, dome-shaped macula. Uh, if you only did the horizontal cut <clears throat> of, the, of the OCT B scan, you will not pick up that uh, dome-shaped macula, but it can be easily visualized on the vertical cut. This is another staphyloma. It's a white macula staphyloma with uh, inferior apex. So posterior staphyloma is one of the hallmark lesions in pathologic myopia. Up to 50% of uh, patients with high myopia may have a posterior staphyloma. And the prevalence varies by age, refractive error, as well as the, the type of diagnostic modality used. Uh, it can also be present in non-highly myopic eyes. And some of these conditions where posterior staphyloma can be seen uh, in the absence of high myopia will be retinitis pigmentosa, Libus congenital amaurosis, as well as uh, a macular toxoplasmotic scars. So how does a posterior staphyloma affect vision? So patients who are developing posterior staphyloma would experience an uh, increase in their myopic refractive error. Some patients experience visual distortion, especially if the edge of the staphyloma uh, is near or at the fovea. And patients would also experience a reduction in retinal sensitivity. So this is a study that we did at the Singapore National Eye Center where we found that uh, macular sensitivity as measured by microparametry was uh, significantly negatively correlated with the presence of macular staphylomas. Also, posterior staphyloma is a risk factor for myopic macular degeneration as well as myopic CMV and also myopic traction maculopathy, uh, which uh, uh, Professor Gavin Tan will be talking about later. So is there any treatment for posterior staphyloma? Uh, unfortunately, no, but the current treatments for posterior staphyloma is uh, aimed at treating its complications. So for example, scleral reinforcement and macular buckling uh, is sometimes performed to relieve traction caused by posterior staphyloma or pathologies like myopic macular hole retinal detachment. But uh, future treatments are in the pipeline, such as scleral cross-linking as well as scleral regenerative therapy, which hopefully can help to uh, arrest the progression of posterior staphyloma in these patients. So now let's talk about myopic macular degeneration. Myopic macular degeneration is the main site threatening complication of high myopia. Here you can see uh, uh, different stages of myopic maculopathy as classified by the meta PM classification. So here is no myopic uh, retinopathy, category zero. Category one will be tessellated fundus only. Category two will be diffuse coral retinal atrophy. Category three, patchy atrophy. And category four, macular atrophy, where there is severe visual loss. 
In addition to the categories, you also have presence of plus lesions, uh, right. which include lacquer cracks, choroidal neovascularization, as well as fuchs spots. So myopic CMV is, a, is an entity that is specific to uh, patients with myopia, uh, but it's not often not easy to diagnose. So some of the uh, uh, factors that we we'll take into account would be if the patient has a myopic refractive error of six diopters or worse, axial length of 26 millimeters or worse, or the presence of myopic macular degeneration, then you would uh, perhaps classify this CMV as a myopic CMV. So conventional angiography, fundus fluorescent angiography is still the gold standard for diagnosing a myopic choroidal neovascularization. But OCTA, as mentioned by Professor Marcus Ang, uh, is also a very useful modality. Here you can see a, a OCTA uh, on fast image of a myopic CMV. So the traditional OCT B scans is, is also very useful for the diagnosis as well as a assessment of activity. So in patients with active CMV, uh, myopic CMV, you'll see a fuzzy outline of the lesion, disruption of the uh, external limiting membrane, and uh, this variable amounts, usually small, uh, very low amounts of intraretinal fluid or subretinal fluid. So this distinguishes it from neovascular AMD. With treatments, the lesion becomes a hyperreflective and also acquires a very distinct border. So OCT by its own uh, can sometimes help us to assess activity in without having to do a fundus fluorescein angiogram. How about OCTA? So OCTA, I think, is a useful modality for diagnosing uh, uh, myopic CMV but it's not as good for assessing activity because uh, after treatment, okay, even if the OCT and the FFA shows no uh, signs of activity, the hypervascular, uh, hyperintense lesion in the outer retinal segments is still present. However, I think that it's still a useful modality for uh, monitoring the treatment response as well as recurrence. Here is a patient uh, who had a myopic CMV. After three injections, the myopic CMV lesion has become smaller and more, uh, uh, quite a more compact configuration. Then when the patient came back with a recurrence, you can see clearly that the, the lesion has increased in size and also adopted a more uh, loose configuration. So not all bleeding in uh, myopic patients is due to myopic CMV. This is a patient with lacquer crack and lacquer crack hemorrhage. So if you see, if you can look closely here, you can make out a lacquer crack here, which is more apparent on the red free. And you can also see that brick in the Brooks membrane or OCT scan. On OCTA, you see absence of that uh, vascular lesion that you see in a myopic CMV. It's another uh, lacquer crack with bleed. So there's this characteristic appearance of uh, it's less hyper intense compared to the myopic CMV. And you can still make out the retinal layers quite clearly above it. And most of the lesion is between the RPE and the Brooks membrane. So these lesions are uh, resolved without any treatment. So how do we treat patients with myopic CMV? I think uh, gold standard treatment is anti-VEGF. And this was a study that looked at two different regimes, a single injection with PRN injections thereafter, or three monthly injections plus PRN, uh, which is usually what we use for neovascular AMD. And they found no difference in the visual outcomes between the two uh, regimes, but the one plus PRN regime achieved the vi visual acuity gains with much fewer injections, usually about two to three injections for these patients. So when do we stop treatment? We look at disease activity, which includes visual acuity, OCT, as well as a, a fluorescein angiogram. So in the radiance study, which looked at uh, two criteria for stopping treatment, disease, disease activity or stabilization of vision, they found that both uh, criteria uh, achieve similar visual outcomes, but using disease activity uh, achieved this with much fewer injections. 
What else do we need to look for as we treat these patients? About a quarter of them develop a recurrence within the first two years and especially in the first year. So for these patients, usually I would uh, monitor them quite closely within the first year and especially to look at the fellow eye because about one third of them will develop a CMV in the other eye. Some of the related complications should also be looked for, for example, macular hole formation. And um, when patients complain of a decrease in vision or increase in metamorphopsia, then there is a, you should have a low threshold for performing uh, fundus fluorescing angiography to look for any uh, non-obvious uh, malpic CMV lesions. So in summary, posterior staphyloma is a hallmark of pathologic myopia and it's associated with complications such as MMD, malpic CMV, as well as uh, malpic traction maculopathy. And current treatment is still only targeted at uh, the complications of malpic CMV, uh, as well as malpic traction maculopathy that uh, Professor Tan will be talking about in his talk later on. I'd like to acknowledge the Singapore National Eye Center High Myopia Clinic, uh, the Medical and Surgical Retina of SNC, as well as Seri Imaging Group for my talk. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Chi Wai. That was great. Um, again, I, I'm not seeing many questions on the Q&A, so uh, I think we will move on to the next uh, speaker. So I'd like to introduce uh, Associate Professor Gavin Tan. He's a surgical retina specialist at Singapore National Eye Center, and he'll be sharing a little bit about managing uh, the surgical complications associated with high myopia. Hi, give me a second to share my screen. And of course, thank you to the organizing committee for inviting us to give this symposium. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the surgery for the complications of high myopia. Uh, these are my financial disclosures. So I think the previous two speakers have already gone into pathological myopia in, in very high detail. Uh, in terms of the, the surgical issues, we do know that pathological myopia results in vicious cinerosis. And this premature vitreous synergesis results in a differential adhesion between the, the peripheral uh, vitreous macula um, relationship as well as the liquefaction of the central vitreous. And this results in adhesion and vitreous macula traction. And we also know from the, all the other images that were shown so nicely, posterior staphyloma exerts some tangential tractional forces uh, that results in the inward pulling of the macula from the scleros um, wall, and that can result in various problems. And so the three major surgical complications of high myopia include ma myopic macular schisis, macular hole with or without detachment, and of course, ragmatogenous rec retinal detachment. So myopic macular schisis or myopic tractional maculopathy is a condition where because of the tightening internal limiting membrane and, and vessels uh, coupled with the staphyloma and the elongation of the posterior um, pole of the, the eye. This results in a stretching or splitting of the retinal layers. And schisis can occur with or without foveal detachment. It can be staged according to its extent and severity. And we typically develop um, significant visual impairment when the schisis is associated with uh, an outer lamella foveal detachment as in here. Whereas a lot of cases with a uh, purely uh, Skysis without detachment can maintain very good vision for, for quite a long time. Our center published a paper a couple of years ago that looked at 50 eyes with myopic macular skysis, and they found a majority of cases remain stable throughout the follow-up, 70%. And one of the good predictors of when vision would deteriorate was when there was changes in the central retinal thickness, or as that would be visualized as worsening of the skysis. In the minority of eyes that progress, uh, 30% um, of these eyes progressed, and of these 30%, about two thirds had two lines or more loss of vision, and of these 10 eyes underwent vitrectomy. So what are the indications for surgery to treat myopic macular schisis? Those include, obviously, the causes of vision loss, the development of ocular melar hole, progressively worsening schisis that's associated with drop of visual equity, and of course, in some stages, they may develop a full thickness macular hole with or without detachment. So in general, the surgical technique for treatment of myopic macular sciences involves a vitrectomy of island peel. Doing a foveous sparing island peel is quite popular now for certain advantages we will discuss. 
And often there's actually no need for, for long-term gas tamponade if no full term thickness macular hole develops during surgery. Just an example of a case, an only eye patient with 11 diopters of myopia, axial length of 31 millimeters, was previously 6'6 uh, vision in this right eye. And this patient noted an acute onset paracentral scotoma with a drop in vision in 6'9. As you can see, the patient has uh, myopic fovea schisis with an um, outer lamella de detachment involving the fovea. And so this patient had surgery done. Uh, most of these patients will also have cataract present. So we often do a combined surgery for these cases. Once the cataract is removed, we do a complete vitrectomy, make sure we've uh, created a posterior vitreous detachment if it's not already there. Then we stain the ILM. My preference is to use Brilliant Blue, do an ILM peel. In my case, I prefer to do a fovea sparing peel. So I leave that central um, ILM area and I trim the ILM remnants from the edges uh, so they don't accidentally get pulled off as you do any fluid air exchange at the end of the surgery. So this is so. What's the advantage of a fovea sparing macular peel? This reduces the risk of post-operative or intraoperative macular hole, and island peeling itself can be quite a traumatic procedure, especially in this thin skittic um, inner retinas. And so, by avoiding the peel, you avoid damage to the inner retina and the fovea area. And this, for example, this patient, and this is within the first week post-op, can still see the reflection. We left air in this eye, and the lamella hole had already resolved, but the skisis is still there. And we do know from various cases that skysis doesn't disappear immediately after the surgery. In fact, in some patients, this is an example, vision may be a little bit worse in the initial post-op period before the anatomical changes start to resolve and vision starts to improve with even recovery of the ellipsoid zone months later. Another example of a case like that. And we do know from our study that visual acuity tends to worsen initially even at the first post-op month, it's about the same or worse than baseline. And at about three to six months, then you really get a visual improvement uh, that the patient will notice. So you do need to counsel your patients that this is not going to be like cataract surgery where it's a quick fix. And this is shows there are corresponding anatomical changes uh, with time that explains the resultant slow, gradual recovery of visual acuity. And the recovery of anatomy from our study found that foveal detachment resolved at a mean of about 3.8 months. And the skysis altogether could take a little bit longer to resolve at about four and a half months. And the cases where there was recovery of the ellipsoid zone disruption, that usually took even more than six months on average. So the other big group of conditions that can occur in high myopia is myopic uh, macular holes. And this can occur with, with or without a macular rectal detachment. We do know in various studies that up to 8.4% of pathologically myopic eyes have myopic macular holes. And this is resulting from the, uh, the vitreous macular traction that we discussed earlier, as well as the reduced chororetinal adhesions due to RP atrophy that makes these cases more prone to developing macular detachments. So the, myopic, the mac management of macular holes, it's not too different in myopic or non-myopic eyes. Um, in general, you want to do a past plan of vitrectomy with posterior vitreous detachment. It's, it's usually coupled with an internal limiting membrane peel with air or gas tamponade. And you may do with or without post-op posturing. And that gives you, in general, a 90 to 95% hole closure. We know the major point that you want to achieve in the surgery is the relief of vitro macular and tangential traction. And that's generally done with posterior vitreous detachment and internal limiting membrane peel. And that's the challenge in highly myopic eyes. And often we also provide tamponade to allow migration of molar cells and associated neurons to fill that defect. In myopic macular holes, this can be even more challenging. So people have tried techniques such as using ILM flaps, and uh, which has become very popular and quite, um, quite standard of care in many institutions. And at the same time, a minority have also tried to reduce the staphyloma um, by using macular buckles, as my colleague uh, mentioned a bit earlier, Dr. Wong. So this is an example of a myopic macular hole. And a complete vitrectomy with PVDs performed. Again, I like to use Brilliant Blue to stain the ILM. Sometimes in these very uh, atrophic maculars, 
uh, adjusting the, the filters on your light source or your scope can improve visualization of the ILM. And in this case, a, a internal limiting membrane flap was left behind with gas tamponade. And so in highly myopic macular holes and macular hole RDs, we tend to do an ILM flap. Uh, in the macular detachment cases, you can flap the ILM into the hole. And that has been shown in various studies to improve the uh, reattachment of the retina as well as hole closure. Of course, there will be cases where it, there's previous failed surgery or you lose the island flood for whatever reason. And there are various alternatives that can be used that include caps, uh, posterior uh, or anterior capsule, autologous blood with uh, amniotic membrane transplants, as well as in some cases, people have tried full thickness retinal transplants. In myopic macular detachment with a macular hole, I always like to emphasize that it's very important to make sure you clear all the cortical vitreous and my personal preference is to stain these cases with trimcinolone. That really allows you to ensure that you remove all the cortical vitreous before you go on to peel the ILM. And in this mac myopic macular holes with detachment, for me, putting the ILM flap is a standard procedure. And in order to ensure that the flap stays in place, you sometimes do need to try to stuff the flap into the hole before you do your fluid uh, air exchange. So this is just an example of a case with a myopic macular hole detachment presented with counting finger vision. Um, again, often these cases have combined cataract, which do need to be dealt with at the same sitting. And in this case, the patient not only had an ERM, but also had a very dense, sorry, not only had an ILM to deal with, but also had a very dense uh, epiretinal membrane that had to be removed. And once that was removed, the ILM was stained and the ILM peel was performed. And in this case, a, a lot of the uh, ILM around the macular hole actually came off of the ERM peel, so there wasn't a good area that I could um, peel and turn around to create a flap, but in the hole was quite small and in spite of not having a flap, the patient did well and recovered to 621 vision. So a flap is not absolutely necessary, but we do know from the literature and from experience, especially the larger holes, it does provide an advantage. And what people have been trying to use now to assist their surgery is of course intraoperative OCT, in this case in the macular hole, in the only eye patient, a 600 micron full thickness macular hole. In this patient, an ILM flap was performed. My usual preference in macular holes is to provide gas tamponade, but in some cases I may consider otherwise. In this case, um, at the end, you could see that of the surgery, a nice large ILM flap had been created. Uh, and after the fluid air exchange had been performed, the intraoperative OCT actually revealed that the hole was really almost closed. There's a tiny gap there, not clearly seen. The flap was very nicely over the, uh, the gap. And in this case, because it was only eye patient, there was an advantage of just leaving air in instead of using a long acting gas tamponade because it allowed faster visual recovery. And that's where having the information to be sure you've achieved your goals at the end of surgery with intraoperative OCT can be used for these cases. And in this case, by one week post-op, the gas, the air bubble had disappeared and patient had recovered 630 vision and eventually managed to recover 612 uh, vision after three months. So the last common surgical complication in high myopes is retinal detachment. We know that the incidence of retinal detachment is higher in myopic eyes. And we know the various considerations uh, in these myopic eyes can make surgery more challenging. There's instrumentation issues in a longer eye. You tend to have skittic vitreous and adherent posterior hyaloid. There's a higher occurrence of multiple breaks. There's a lower anatomical success because of multiple breaks, large breaks, missed or new breaks. And there's a higher occurrence of PDR post-op. We also know from various studies that these cases tend to have these very occult, small posterior breaks that can be easily miss over the atrophic uh, posterior pole. So it's very important in these cases to look for these posterior breaks and they are often in the perivascular area. So as mentioned, the outcomes of retinal detachment in high myopia 
tend to be worse than in cases with moderate or low myopia. In our own experience, however, we found our first op anatomical success rate to be similar whether or not the myopics were high myopics or, or moderate myopics. But we did find that in our audit that the incidence of doing a combined buccal vitrectomy instead of primary vitrectomy or scalar buccal was much higher in these myopic cases. And perhaps we postulated that, that might account for the similar success rate compared to other um, retrospective studies. In our pediatric retinal audit, however, we did find that the patients with high myopia and retinal detachment did far worse than their uh, counterparts that did not have higher myopia with a lower first operation success rate, higher rate of PDR, and worse an anatomical as well as visual outcomes. So the treatment of retinal detachment is quite similar. You can use a sclera buckle. The consideration of sclera buckle is sclera thinner with a higher risk of perforation. Or primary vitrectomy can be done. This may be advantageous, especially in pseudophagic patients. My personal preference is to ensure very meticulous vitreous shaving in these patients. And because of that, I tend to use adjuvants such as uh, triamcinolone to ensure that I stain the vitreous adequately. And I do 360 degrees indentation to ensure my vitreous base is well shaved. As mentioned earlier, a lot of patients may choose to do combined buccal vitrectomy in this case is because of the higher risk of uh, PVR and lowered uh, historical primary operator success rate. There may be advantages as well in fake cases where you can't clear the vitreous base or in cases with extensive lattice or multiple breaks. So I tend to use a 360 encircling band, a 240 or 41 band. And there have been um, mainly retrospective studies that have shown combined surgery in these highly myopic eyes or high risk eyes for PVR tends to do better than doing primary vitrectomy alone. And of course, if they do develop PVR, the management's quite similar. You want to relieve traction and you want to consider using a longer term tempera. An example of a myopic eye that developed um, secondary preview after the first primary surgery, in spite of the fact you can see the 360 conch paratomy here, the buckle already on the first surgery. And the PVI can be quite, quite extensive. And it's very useful to do staining, in this case, brilliant blue again to help you remove all the membranes. And very difficult to remove membranes using a chandelier and bi a bimanual technique can be very, very useful. And with that, I come to the end of my talk. So high myopia of the increased axial length, staphylomas, abnormal virtual retinal adhesions, and extensive choroidal retinal atrophy can result in many surgical complications, including myopic macular skysis, myopic macular holes, and regmatologist retinal detachments. There are a lot of newer developments in current in surgical techniques that allow us to still have very good outcomes in these cases with hatch complications or myopia that require surgery. And I thank you very, very much for your time and attention. Thanks very much, Gavin. That was great. Very exciting. Um, just a quick question I want to ask. So you mentioned that a lot of these, as we know, these highly myopic eyes actually have, uh, usually have early onset nuclear sclerotic cataracts. And actually, even uh, in a normal situation where we're just doing cataracts, biometry can be quite challenging. What do you usually do, uh, aim for, or how do you get around this problem if they have a cataract, you're planning to do like a macular detachment? Is biometry an issue? And what do you do with the fellow eye, which is usually very highly myopic? Um, so yeah, so, so I think you need adequate counseling of the patient. Most of these cases, um, when they start to have the vitreal retinal changes, they're already in their 40s. So they're already press biopic. Um, my preference is still to, to, to discuss, I mean, you know the standard options. You can leave them plain or have contact lenses on the other side. If they have significant cataract or they may consider early cataract surgery in the other eye. I find that the Abarrett formula um, personally works well for me. It gives me quite reproducible uh, refractive outcomes. Um, the, the only cases where I do occasionally find where I still sometimes get refractive surprises are cases who have a complicated history where they have had retinal uh, LASIK before and then subsequently a complicated retinal detachment that required a buccal surgery. And somehow both LASIK and having a buccal that changes the uh, anterior-posterior relationship in the effective lens position does make the, even the Barrett formula a little bit inaccurate at times. But it's always safer to err on the side of uh, aiming a little bit myopic in these patients because having been myopic all their lives, they usually prefer to have a bit of myopia than if you end up with a hyper, hyperopic outcome. 
Great. Thanks for those tips. I think uh, really important because um, a lot of these high myopes may have had refractive surgery before as well. And that really complicates the matters. And I'm sure, you know, in the presence of, uh, you know, macular traction or even a shallow detachment, I mean, um, getting an accurate biometry is certainly going to be a challenge. So but last but not least, uh, we have Dr. Rachel Chong, who is a glaucoma specialist from SNEC as well. And basically, she'll be talking about a very another very common complication associated with high myopia and pathologic myopia, uh, which is glaucoma. So, Rachel, please. Thanks, thanks Marcus. Let me, um, set up. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to you today. My name is Rachel Chong, and I am a consultant in the glaucoma service at the Singapore National Eye Centre, where I lead a dedicated service for high myopia patients who are receiving treatment for glaucoma or who are suspected to have glaucoma. Today, I will be speaking about some of the diagnostic challenges we face when assessing a myopic disc for glaucoma and share a few perspectives that I have found helpful. I have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk. Studies that report on the association between myopia and glaucoma have been divided thus far, with some reporting a greater risk of glaucoma progression in certain eyes with myopic features, while other studies have concluded otherwise. A group in Rotterdam recently published a meta-analysis that examined the risk of sight-threatening complications of myopia, where they found that a diagnosis of glaucoma that was based on visual field defects and optic disc aberrations was associated with an overall odds ratio of close to 2 for any degree of myopia, and this increased to 3 for moderate to high myopia of minus 3 diopters or worse. It is important to note that the diagnosis of glaucoma in all of these studies referred specifically to the presence of optic disc cupping with neuroretinal rim thinning and visual field losses on automated perimetry that were consistent with glaucoma. However, as we know, the presence of typical glaucomatous features may not be so easy to discern in many highly myopic patients. The reasons for this include issues with spatial and color contrast due to flattening of the optic cup and stretching of the laminar cribrosa that occur during axial elongation, as well as irregularities in the parapapillary zone poor retinal nerve fiber layer reflectance, and a wide range of anatomical variations seen at the optic nerve hit in myopic eyes that may lead to inaccurate estimations of the optic disc size. Also, various types of retinal pathology seen in myopia may give rise to visual field defects that mimic glaucoma. Ultimately, there is no real gold standard at present for establishing a diagnosis of glaucoma in highly myopic patients. Part of the problem that underlies this diagnostic challenge is the fact that the pathology of both diseases demonstrates significant structural overlap in the form of decreased retinal ganglion cell density that is seen in glaucoma as well as high myopia due to generalized thinning of the neuroretinal tissues arising from axial elongation. In addition to the structural overlap in disease pathology, poor retinal nerve fiber layer reflectance a long axial length and a lack of correction for ocular magnification often make it difficult to obtain good quality scans in highly myopic eyes using OCT. Several studies have proposed myopic normative databases, although these are difficult to implement due to the large variation in refractive error that is prevalent in different populations and the wide range of anatomical features seen in myopic eyes. Despite the limitations of the current glaucoma diagnostic tests in highly myopic eyes, there are at least a few features that seem to be common in some of these eyes. The average circumpapillary retinal fiber layer thickness decreases with increasing axial length, except in the temporal sector, and this may be due to a lack of correction for the ocular magnification effect that can arise from both a large refractive error and an increase in axial eye length. The regional distribution of the superior and inferior arcuate retinal nerve fiber layer bundles 
also tend to shift temporally. And finally, the average and sectoral GCIPL thickness decreases with increasing axial length, independent of disc size. Therefore, this could be more useful for eyes with high myopia. Here is an illustration of a myopic patient with red disease on optic disc OCT due to temporal shifting of the inferior and superior arcuate bundles, leading to them falling short of the normative data range. However, this patient does not have glaucoma. Apart from challenges with structural testing for glaucoma, we also know that myopia in the absence of raised intraocular pressure or neuroretinal rim thinning can give rise to visual field test patterns that look like glaucoma. Some groups have attempted to investigate specific risk factors for progressive visual field losses in highly myopic eyes and have described the following high-risk features. It is possible that myopic eyes may have a different type of optic nerve disease termed myopia-associated optic neuropathy, although this remains to be clearly defined. These patients may have concurrent normal tension glaucoma. However, we must be aware that glaucoma isn't the only cause of progressive visual field loss in highly myopic eyes. In this clinical case, we have a 45-year-old Chinese lady with myopia and thin corneas following refractive surgery. She also has a family history of glaucoma and a history of tension headaches, although her maximum intraocular pressure was less than 21 millimeters of mercury. She was diagnosed with bilateral normal tension glaucoma and underwent a right phaco trabeculectomy. These are pictures of her discs showing thin neuroretinal rims, particularly in the superior quadrants in both eyes. And her visual fields do show progressive widening and deepening of the inferior scotoma in the right eye over time, as well as in the left eye. While it is certainly possible that she had an NTG, on closer examination of the optic discs and OCT, it was also apparent that she had peripapillary intracoroidal cavitations. Now, PICC is seen in 5-7% to of high myopes and are described to be frequently associated with typical glaucomatous visual fields and may also show progressive visual field loss. Hence, it is important to exercise caution when interpreting the extent of visual field loss due to glaucoma in a highly myopic eye. Here is another case of a 57-year-old lady, post-membrane peel with normal cornea thickness and intraocular pressure, who was referred for possible left normal tension glaucoma due to visual field progression. Photos of her discs here show thinning of the neuroretinal rim it was most prominent in her right eye, while the left eye actually looked relatively unremarkable. OCT imaging of her optic discs were not of very good quality, as is often the case in highly myopic eyes, but were suggestive of diffuse circumpapillary retinal nerve fiber layer thinning in both eyes. Here are her visual fields that do show apparent progression of an inferior arcuate defect in the left eye, which the referring clinician was concerned about. However, as seen here, circled in red, there was a steep drop in the threshold sensitivity at a discrete location, which is usually more suggestive of underlying retinal pathology rather than glaucoma. Hence, in view of the recent history of membrane peel, as well as relatively healthy looking optic disc and intraocular pressure in the left eye, I elected to treat just the right eye for now and to watch the left eye for the time being. Finally, I would like to share a few general tips for assessing the disc in myopic eyes, which I have learned along the way. First of all, always dilate your patients and try and take photos if possible to document the appearance of both the disc and macula. Try and look for disc hemorrhages very carefully, turn on the red free filter if necessary. And I find that this is often helpful as well to look at the way the vessels arch um, and to spot the presence of any unusual kinking or bayonetting at the optic disc. We've already spoken quite extensively about the pitfalls of interpreting OCT as well as visual field tests in patients with high myopia. And as mentioned, sometimes GCIPL may be more helpful. 
finally consider each patient holistically in terms of carefully considering their age, the extent of the visual field loss, whether it affects both hemifields as well as the points of central fixation, um, as well as the presence of any other risk factors, including previous refractive surgery or family history of glaucoma. Another important thing that I found very helpful is to try and make friends with your retina colleagues because quite often they may offer valuable insight into other causes of visual loss that these patients with high myopia may be suffering from. So thank you very much once again for your kind attention and I do look forward to hearing from anyone with any questions or valuable advice regarding this extremely challenging field. So I think we have about five more minutes left. Um, don't see any questions on the chat. So, Gavin, do you have any? So, so, so why? So, given these, it this is an epidemic that's going to be growing in Asia. Um, do you do you see, Marcus? How how I mean, we have taken certain a way of approaching it at at Singapore National Eye Center. Uh, what do you think should be the the kind of holistic approach uh, at the ophthalmologist and general ophthalmology community should try to take to these patients because they are very, very difficult to diagnose. And sometimes you really need specialized imaging equipment that not everybody has in their, their individual clinic. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that myopia, as it grows in terms of prevalence, um, we're going to see more and more of myopia associated complications as well. I think that the solution is a holistic view uh, in terms of the management of patients with high myopia and pathologic myopia. At SNEC now, as you know, we started a service which combines the expertise of anterior segment surgeons like myself, retinal surgeons like yourself and Chiwai, glaucoma surgeons like Rachel, pediatric ophthalmologists, et cetera, et cetera, to come together to manage patients from childhood to adulthood and into the, you know, uh, the late adulthood um, because basically we see we need to manage the whole spectrum of uh, potential complications associated with myopia. And together, I think that will improve not only the management of such patients, but also the understanding of the disease. Um, so I think it's a very challenging uh, topic. Um, and patients with myopia, high myopia, and its associated complications do require a more comprehensive approach. Um, do we have any uh, uh, comments from maybe Chiwai on this? Uh... Yeah, I do agree with you. And um, I think we also uh, need to be uh, very collaborative with our allied health professionals, um, like optometrists uh, industry to help to uh, refine our current imaging modalities for these patients because um, what we have now are uh, not uh, optimized yet for uh, diagnosing these conditions in, in highly myopic patients, especially for glaucoma. Uh, so I think everyone needs to come together uh, to, to help uh, these patients uh, at least uh, prevent them from developing uh, sight threatening complications if we can. And if they have already uh, developed uh, visual impairment from these conditions, then we hope to be able to at least uh, optimize whatever uh, visual function they have. So, so Chiwa, you also mentioned a little bit about trying to change the behavior of the sclera because we, I mean, from, from the retinal point of view, a lot of the complications are the result of, of the staphylomatous change. I don't know if the staphylomatous structure also or the sterile structure is important for the glaucoma complications, but Chiwai, I mean, would you be able to update us on, on what do you think are the latest uh, developments that will come out and, and where do you think this, this will provide value? Will we really have something that's preventive or hmm. it's still going to be treating end complications again? Yeah, so I think uh, there are a few aspects to this um, so it's medical and surgical aspects. The medical aspects would be the uh, scleral cross-linking, which I think is still, uh, it's still at a very early stage. And there's still a lot of uh, issues where that uh, we need to think about uh, how to apply the therapy and whether it will affect the optic nerve since it's so uh, close to that structure. Uh, scleral regenerative therapy is also very interesting, but again, it's 
still in a preclinical stage. And these uh, therapies would come into use if we could use it to prevent the development of staphylomas. So I think uh, still there's a lot of research that's required to actually detect uh, which patients are at higher risk of developing these staphylomas. In uh, a lot of China uh, groups in China, they are using posterior scleral reinforcement uh, in patients who already have posterior staphyloma to try to arrest the growth. Uh, and these are patients without complications like myopic traction maculopathy, and they, and they uh, believe that they can get good results from these as well. So that again, uh, I think we need to have larger trials, longitudinal studies to see if they truly work. Yeah, and maybe finally, do, uh, Rachel, are there actually any treatments specific to glaucoma in high myopia at the moment? Because I think not only is this a diagnostic issue, it's also a treatment problem, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, that's very true. I think one of the issues, we're not entirely sure what the mechanistic underpinnings are for glaucoma in highly myopic patients. And, you know, we have enough difficulty trying to define what the disease is. Is it actually glaucoma or another form of optic neuropathy? Um, I think, you know, it's, it's quite key to pin down these things before actually developing any ideas. I mean, people are looking into sort of non-IOP modulating treatments for glaucoma, and it's highly likely that these would be more applicable to patients with high myopia and glaucoma as well. Okay, I think our time is up. I, I thank all our speakers very much for, for all those enlightening talks. And again, we thank the organizing committee for inviting us uh, from Singapore to participate in this meeting. Thank you very, very much. Thank you so much, everyone, for keeping in on time. And what a wonderful session we had. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, so we have a quick break of 30 minutes. So we'll be back again with the next session at 6.30 p.m. Thank you so much.
Hi Samira, how are you? You're better now? Aha, I'm negative now. Your son is happy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My younger son was in UK. He came back on 12th. Mm
Hello, good evening. Feel like a, I hope we have all the okay. Dr. Gulani is also there. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, welcome everyone for International DOS Conference, and we're in Hall B. The session is from six thirty to eight forty-five. So, first of all, I like to introduce chairman, moderator, and panelist. Chairman, we have Dr. Ritu Arora, Dr. Kirti Singh, Dr. Jayesh Bhalla, Dr. Manavdeep Singh, Dr. Rajesh Sina. Moderator for this session will be Dr. Shibul Bhartiya. Dr. Sunita Dubey, Dr. Hardeep Singh, and the panelists, Dr. Sahiban Sethi, Dr. M. Vanathi, Dr. Jaya Gupta, and Dr. Devang Angamo. So I request the moderator to please take it over and start the session to call out the first speaker. Uh, Sunita, are you oh, there? Can you? Yeah, yeah, I am there. Okay, so, can okay. you start? So I welcome you all to the International DOS Conference. And uh, our session is a combined session on cornea and glaucoma. So without much ado, let me uh, call upon the first speaker, Dr. Samira Khan Irfan, and she'll be speaking on an insight into filamentary keratitis. Dr. Samira, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, Dr. Namrata, Mrs. Subhash Dadia, thank you so much for inviting. Uh, this is a wonderful meeting and wonderful opportunity to meet all of you. So uh, my topic is on filamentary keratitis. And uh, uh, can you see it, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you have to yeah, play it because it's not full screen. OK. I think, yeah, this will be, yeah, we can. Okay. So it's a chronic recurrent condition in which mucus strands called filaments are formed over the ocular surface. They are firmly adherent to the cornea. With each blink, the eyelid pulls upon them, and this results in extreme pain, grittiness, and an irritable red eye. So in order to understand how filaments are formed, first we need to know the significance of mucin in the tear film. Oh, I can't go to my next slide. I can't uh, move my slide. Uh, can you can you stop uh, your slide share and then re re share again? Okay. Now, yeah. Okay. So significance of mucin in the tear film is twofold, that uh, mucin is produced mainly by the conjunctival and to a lesser extent by the corneal goblet cells. Normally, there is a fixed ratio of aqueous to mucin. They are in a balance uh, in, in the tear film and mucin perform two important functions. As shown in figure A, they flow to stream molecules in the aqueous and uh, engulf any foreign particle like bugs that land on the ocular surface, which are then washed out of the tear film, thus acting as scavenger molecules and protecting the ocular surface from infection. The second important function of mucin is that the corneal epithelium is water repellent or hydrophobic. And that, that means it prevents the water from entering into the stroma and maintains its clarity and transparency. 
So the surface epithelial cells of the cornea, they secrete a layer of positively charged protein called the glycocalyx, which forms a smooth uniform coating. Over this glycocalyx, the mucin, which are negatively charged, they are attracted and this coating then makes the corneal surface hydrophilic so that the aqueous component of the tear film can stabilize over it. Now, any alteration in the balance of these two components can result from aqueous deficiency or, mucin or excess evaporation of aqueous. Or number two, there is an excess of or abnormal production of mucins or there is an abnormal ocular surface with punctate epitheliopathy. So these conditions, they may occur in tear film deficiency like Sjogren's and Steven Johnson, vitamin A deficiency, in thyroid eye disease, in lacrimal gland tumor, or the ocular surface may be altered as in recurrent corneal erosion syndrome, in neurotropic keratitis, bullous keratopathy, prolonged patching, uh, production of corneal incisions, sutures, or in ocular allergy. So understanding a bit of pathogenesis is that there are two basic pathogenic mechanisms. A decrease in aqueous component results in an increase in tear film osmolarity due to increased concentration of solutes. So this results in a chemical inflammation and the result of uh, an, a release of inflammatory cytokines and enzymes from eosinophils and lymphocytes. And this creates a vicious cycle of chronic inflammation and ocular surface damage, which is shown there in the figure as tiny punctate erosions, which are stained by fluorescein. So as the amount of aqueous is reduced, the excess amount of free mucins, now they accumulate in the conjunctival furnaces and they join together by disulfide bonds thereby forming mucus strands. And the free mucin molecules are now no longer available to coat the apical corneal epithelial cells. The cornea becomes hydrophobic and this further increases the inflammation. The site of these uh, epithelial loss, they act as a high energy pits or a nidus to which the mucus strands adhere firmly. The corneal epithelium grows around the mucus to form a filament. The filaments are gelatinous as seen in the picture and they are refractile structures being firmly adherent by a head to the uh, uh, area of denuded epithelium. And then there is a free tail of varying length that floats in the aqueous. Filaments do not take up fluorescein, but they stain well with rose bengal and lysamine green. Uh, by the help of which early uh, uh, defects or subtle cases of filament formation can be noted. So this slide, this shows diagrammatically how filaments are formed, that is at the area of epithelial loss, the mucus it deposits and the corneal epithelium then tries to grow around it. So the head is made up of a central core of descommated corneal epithelial cells as shown in figure uh, e, and uh, they are surrounded by degenerated uh, conjunctival epithelial cells and entwined in a thick layer of mucin. They can become as long as uh, from 0.5 millimeter to 10 millimeter long strings. So with each blink, the upper layer pulls upon the filament and this causes further shearing of the corneal epithelium and breaking down of intact uh, basal epithelium with the exposed trauma, this prevents healing and re-epithelization. So a vicious cycle of epithelial damage and increased in inflammation with increased filament formation ensues. So many people, they try to do a manual debridement of filaments, but this should not be done as the head, uh, as shown in figure F, it is firmly adherent to the underlying trauma. So pulling upon the head will cause traction on the adjacent corneal epithelial cells and it results in more damage and further ocular surface inflammation and recurrent filament formation. Then uh, what about uh, uh, cataract surgery, site of incision and uh, on the keratoplasty incisions uh, and the sutures? Filaments, they form there because they, these uh, cataract surgery is mostly done in the elderly and they already have coexistent dry eyes or myobomin gland dysfunction. 
then the incision injures the corneal nerves and produces a localized tear film instability at that site. Then intraoperative manipulation, presence of sutures acting as a foreign body nidus, then the eye drops uh, with preservatives in it, given pre-op and post-op, all these factors, they result in filament formation post-op. Then a word about weakacy, because that is a very important cause uh, of uh, in which filaments are seen. They are in weakacy, inflammatory mediators are released from eosinophils and lymphocytes. Then there is lymphocytic infiltration of lacrimal gland and conjunctiva, which reduce and reduce secretion of aqueous, mybum, and altered mucin production forming strands. Limbitis causes further instability of the tear film and loss of limbal stem cells with poor healing. The incidence of dry eyes in allergic conjunctivitis is up to 60 to 70 percent. And uh, taking oral antihistamines or diuretics further reduces aqueous production. So all these factors need to be corrected before we can get rid of filament formation. So management is a three-tier approach in which there is proper assessment and treating the underlying cause, such as diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, thyroid eye disease, vitamin A or D deficiency or weak C. We need to treat the ocular surface inflammation to render the cornea hydrophilic and prevent further epithelial degradation. And then number third step is to dissolve the filaments rather than to remove them or pluck them. So the drug armamentarium should include lubricants, which will reduce the mechanical stress. They will dilute the inflammatory cytokines and stabilize the tear film. Then number two are anti-inflammatory agents like tacrolimus, cyclosporine, acetylcysteine, tetracyclines. Steroids are usually avoided, but they can be given for a short while, like uh, fluoromethylone in the initial stages, as, it, as it's a very painful condition and acute red eye. Filaments need to be dissolved with acetylcysteine eye drops, 0.3%. And people like to give NSAIDs or bandage contact lens or hyperosmotic lubricants, but they actually worsen the condition because uh, uh, an eye with filament formation is a severe form of dry eye and the environment is already hyperosmotic and with an acidic pH. So uh, instilling hyperosmotic lubricants will further cause pain in that eye. And acetylcysteine, uh, it was recommended in literature to give 10%. 10% is highly hyperosmotic. I was giving, uh, uh, preparing 5% uh, uh, about 10 years back, and that, is, that was also causing pain. And then um, when we tested the osmolarity, uh, even of 5% solution, the osmolarity was about 1300 milliosmoles. So I started preparing this 0.3% eye drops and its osmolarity is 350 milliosmoles, which is almost isotonic to the ocular surface and it is dissolved, prepared by dissolving 15 milligram acetylcysteine in distilled water. I'm using distilled water now because all the prepared eye drops, they have an osmolarity of 300 milliosmoles already. So if you use uh, this acetylcysteine powder in a lubricant, which already has 300 milliosmoles osmolarity, then the osmolarity will be triple, triple uh, so around 1000. So it's better to dissolve acetylcysteine powder, which is available as this mucolator, which is used by asthmatics to dissolve the mucus secretions. And uh, it can readily be made by everyone if they are not available commercially as uh, at my place. So acetylcysteine is really a game changer. It dissolves the mucin, the disulfide bonds are broken in the mucin molecules, and they are broken to tiny mucin molecules, which are easily washed by the tear film. Uh, acetylcysteine has anticollagenase effect. It reduces corneal thinning, corneal melting. So in all cases of uh, corneal non-healing ulcers or in corneal melting, it is an excellent drug. It is uh, uh, strongly anti-inflammatory by inhibiting uh, uh, metallomoproteinases and cytokine uh, secretion. And then it improves mybum secretion as well as, as well as it has shown to improve uh, uh, reduce neovascularization. It has an anti-angiogenic effect as well. 
And then a word about tetralimus and cyclosporine. They are much better, more potent than steroids, topical steroids, because this disease is not going to go away in a short while. The treatment has to be continued for five to six months. So it's better to give steroid sparing uh, anti-inflammatory agents like tetralimus and cyclosporine. And they are potent uh, calcineurin inhibitors. They inhibit T-cell mediated immune response, promote corneal healing, and improve the secretion and quality of all three components of the tear film. So with a high safety profile and minimum side effects in comparison to top topical steroids. So the take home message is that filamentary keratitis is a recurrent and debilitating disease. It indicates an underlying severe tear film instability so with the correct and a systematic approach to diagnosis and management, the acute condition can be effectively controlled and the incidence of, and severity of recurrence uh, is minimized. The mechanical removal of filaments should not be done as it promotes more formation. So acetylcysteine topically is safe and is 100% efficient. It must be combined with lubricants and anti-inflammatory therapy and do not forget to treat the underlying cause. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Samira. It was a wonderful presentation, very informative. There's one question in the chat box. How do you treat the acute painful condition of filamentary keratitis? Well, by all these uh, means, lubricants, preferably uh, preservative free, then number two, uh, not mechanically removing the filaments, but melting them with acetylcysteine. So if acetylcysteine is prepared in distilled water, and as I told you, only about 15 milligram dissolved so that the concentration is 0.3%, it's, it's isosmotic and it's not painful at all. So it enhances the patient compliance. So 5% or even 10%, that is extremely painful to put in still into the eyes. And the lubricant yeah. eye drops and anti-inflammatory in the form of tetralimus. So that cures really uh, very effectively. Yeah, because this uh, acetylcysteine is not used very commonly. So uh -huh. you're sure it's very easy to yeah. prepare? So, but, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that's a very good information that I think you need to use this acetylcysteine. And what are the indications of using steroids? Steroids, uh -huh. I uh, give fluoromethylone. Uh, uh, to begin with, initially for a week or 10 days, then I tell my patients that, okay, this is a medical drug. It will cure it will be red eye immediately. But then in the long term, this condition is going to come back with recurrences. So you give a patient, a introduce a bottle of steroids and they come back with gl having glaucoma. Because in adults, uh, about 5% uh, uh, are highly responsive to steroids. And <laughs> so I think it's not safe to introduce steroids. It's better tetralimus and cyclosporin. Very good. And generally, we see a lot of uh, filamentary keratitis post-operative, especially in patients who are predisposed to. Yes. So it's eyes. very important to use a screen all these patients yeah. uh, for going for cataract surgery for dry eye because they are in that age yeah. group. So we're very yes, happy yes. to do that. And start the therapy. Uh, what here. lubrication uh, you give, um, uh, what uh, preservative free drugs you prefer for lubrication? Of well, we have uh, this hyaluronic acid preparation available in Pakistan. So I get, okay. get that. But short of that, CMC, I find it's good. It's a uh, longer acting and stays on the cornea. It's a longer residence time on the cornea. Yeah, so as a general ophthalmologist, a glaucoma specialist, not being cornea specialist, the general impression is that you can do debridement, mechanical debridement. But, uh, you know, I, today I learned that it should not be done. No, no, it's firmly adherent. And when you pull, you're, you're actually damaging the adjacent epithelium. Yeah, so sometimes they are very, very, they cause a lot of foreign body sensations. So we are tempted to remove them. <laughs> So I think it should not be done. We will move to the next one, Sunita. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Samira. Thanks, Atran, for taking out time. I know you have a very busy clinic just now. Uh, it's Thank wonderful you. to be here. Thank Thanks. you. So, uh, okay, so the next talk is uh, by uh, Dr. Shizuka Ko.
And she is working on update on contact lens correction for keratoconus. Dr. Shizuka, please. Okay. Uh, can you see my slide? Yeah. Yeah, Shizuka. Okay. okay. Hi. Uh, Hi everybody, I'm Shizuka Ko from Osaka University, Japan. It is my great honor to be invited here to give a talk today. Let me start my presentation. Today, my topic is update on contact lens correction for keratoconus. Particularly, I'd like to focus on optical quality and refractive effect of corneal rigid gas permeable contact lens and our newly developed innovative soft contact lens. The global consensus on keratoconus and ectatic corneal diseases stated that the use of corneal GP lens does not slow or hold the case progression. As you know, there are many options for management for keratoconus. Rigid gas permeable contact lenses are widely used in cases of unsatisfactory vision with glasses or conventional soft contact lens. Moreover, in a patient with keratoconus who has failed the trial of conventional corneal GP lenses, other options are available such as hybrid keratoconus design soft contact lens, mini scleral and scleral lenses. Currently, much attention has been given to the quality of vision in clinical practice. As you know, wavefront sensor is widely used in our clinical practice and useful to evaluate optical quality quantitatively. This is a typical case of keratoconus. The vertical coma is dominant and the simulated retinal images are comic like. With the corner GP lens wear, the high vibrations derived from the anterior corner surface were decreased because the irregularity in anterior corner surface was corrected with the GP lens. This results in superior quality of vision. When we apply dynamic vector analysis, you can understand that the vertical coma is dominant among the components. Corner GP lens wear can correct the irregular astigmatism. However, you may notice that smaller comet-like retinal images in the opposite direction remain due to residual vertical coma from the posterior corneal surface. We know that corneal GP can effectively correct irregular corneal astigmatism from the anterior surface and there is still the residual irregular astigmatism derived from the posterior surface of the cornea. However, refractive effect on posterior corneal surface is unknown. There are three major feeding approaches of corneal GP for keratoconus. The apical touch, where lens bearing in on the apex of the cornea, the apical clearance, in which lens bearing is directed on the placental cornea without apical touch, and the three point touch, where lens bearing is shared between the apex and the placental area of the cornea. 
Regarding vision, the eight goal touch and three point touch methods often have superior visual performance compared to that of apical clearance heating. Possibly due to the fact that the flat lens better masks irregular astigmatism. Actually, in our clinic, the apical touch and the three point touch methods are used. The advantage with OCT is that it can identify and distillate both corneal surfaces, even in eyes with corneal GP. Shown here the representative Fourier maps captured with OCT in a keratoconic eye. The original color coded map is divided into spherical, regular astigmatism, asymmetry, and higher order irregularity components. Now you can see the Fourier maps captured during spherical corneal GP wear from the same eye. Significant reduction of the colors in the Fourier maps with GP lens indicated the refractive changes in the posterior corneal surface. As demonstrated in the table, echo touch or three point touch feeding of spherical corneal GPs caused significant changes in the spherical, regular astigmatism, and asymmetry component from the posterior corneal surface. We are wondering if the corneal biomechanical properties of keratoconus correlated with corneal flattening induced by wearing corneal GP. Correlations between the difference in Fourier indices with and without corneal GP and the corneal biomechanical parameters obtained by Corbis were analyzed. As shown here, all purely biomechanical and comprehensive parameters were significantly correlated with the difference in the spherical component observed with and without corneal GP. The correcting effect of corneal GP on the spherical component of the posterior cornea was greater in biomechanically weakened cornea. This result indicates that posterior corneal surface flattening during corneal GP wear is greater in the severe keratoconia. Flat corneal patients often experience discomfort when wearing corneal GP, potentially leading to intolerance and ultimately discontinuation of lens wear. Therefore, there is an unmet demand for com comfortable and easy to fit soft contact lens that provide optimal correction of vision in keratoconus. We developed a prototype soft contact design standardized with five different vertically asymmetric power configurations rather than using custom made lenses, which were adjusted for patients individually. The concept of the lens in the, in the same way as different parameters are available with toric soft contact lens for optimal correction of refractive error in patients with astigmatism. Let me share with you the representative case. This is the typical keratoconus case. Without any correction, the pattern of high order variation is typical one, which shows an increase in coma. When she wore this asymmetric soft contact lens, you can see the significant improvement of high-order 
and retinal image quality. You can see the changes in each Zernic vector term calculated from ocular high vibration with and without contact lens. There was a significant reduction of vertical coma. We found that the slightly different ratio on primary eye gaze was associated with suboptimal correction of coma. Therefore, we modified the lens design. Optical zone was intentionally decentered superiorly by 0.7 millimeters. As shown here, optimization of the location of the optical zone in asymmetric soft contact lens improves correction of coma abrasion and on eye optical centration. This is my summary for today. Uh, Wherein corneal GP corrected the posterior superficial component and corneal regular and irregular astigmatism. Novel soft contact lens can correct coma abrasions and provide an easy to use, convenient, and cost effective alternative to individual visual customization for cured cones. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Shizuka. Are there any questions for her? It was an excellent talk. So any questions, if anyone wants to ask? So I think it was quite explanatory in itself. So there are no questions. So we are moving on to the next talk by Dr. Shaukat Aram. And she'll be speaking on OSSN paradigm shift in the management. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay, good, good evening. Uh, thank you, Delhi Ophthalmology Society for inviting me in this international virtual conference. And my special thanks to uh, Professor Shubhash Dadia and Professor Namrata Sharma for inviting me and the whole DOS team. So my topic is OSSN, Paradigm Shift of Management. I am Shabhutra Shapur from Bangladesh. It's not moving. Okay. Uh, ocular surface formous neoplasia is an encompassing term to precancerous and cancerous epithelial lesions of the conjunctiva and cornea. It comprises dysplasia, uh, conjunctival intraepithelial neoplasia, and invasive squamous cell carcinoma. We all know that 70% of it occurs in male and 75% in older patients. And 75% occur at the limbus. And the predisposing factors are sunlight exposure, immunocompromised status, human papillomavirus 16, and acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And sunlight exposure, it causes actinic keratosis, solar keratosis, for muscle carcinoma of the skin, serodama pigmentosa, and papillion liver syndrome. So presentation, most of the patient present with an ocular surface lesion, which is uh, from subtle to large, according to the duration of presentation and according to the advancement of the disease. And there is redness, irritation, and watering. And usually it is um, in, in the interpalpable area near the limbus. But uh, vision is not affected, but if the cornea, it, is, it encroaches the center of the cornea, vision reduces. It may be gelatinous, papillary, leucoplakic, or nodular. And there is always two, some positive findings like feeder vessels and intra, intrinsic vascularity. And these are rose bengal positive and fluorescent stain positive. That is very uh, unique of this condition and sometimes the when it, it is in advance the periocular uh, uh, lymph node uh, subvenibular lymph node or anterior cervical lymph node would be involved and it is mostly unilateral but 
um, sometimes could be bilateral. In my practice, I have never seen a bilateral case till now. And rose bundle and process change is very helpful for diagnosis and delineating the uh, this, uh, in this rose bengal staining, we, you can see that it, the margins are uh, well delineated by the uh, stain and we can now uh, plan for the management of the, of the surgery um, after staining the with rose bengal. This is here and it, it, it comprises of subtle uh, inosseous lesion to uh, leucoplatic lesion. It is gelatinous lesion to a nodular lesion. And this, this is very nauseous, but this looks a little aggressive. So these are all the uh, picture of uh, CIN. And CIN, one good thing is it doesn't never, it involves the whole of the epithelium, but never crosses the basement membrane. And these are some pictures of, a, of CIN. There is abundant keratin and feeder vessel we can see here. It is a pigmented lesion. It is a papilliform lesion uh, with uh, intrinsic vascularity, and it is also a, uh, with epithelial vessel and speckles of uh, rose bengal staining. These are uh, pictures of CIM. And squamous cell carcinoma, we can see that this is very aggressive, and it is vascular, and intrinsic vascularity more than that of the CIM. And the uh, feeder vessels are very much tortuous and large. And dilated so uh, it it can be pre uh, presented with large nodule or um, uh, not that elevated but looks aggressive eh? and the uh, progress progression is very fast these cases and the bad thing is here in the histop histopathology it breaches the uh, basement membrane and goes to the stroke Leukoplasia, and some, there are some points to ponder and to remember. Leukoplasia is usually absent or very minimal in CIN, but it is uh, it, extensive leukoplakia is in favor of squamous cell carcinoma. And the presence of feeder vessel and intrinsic vascularity favors in squamous cell carcinoma. But thick, in our pictures, we have seen that thickness doesn't mean that it is malignant. It could be CIN or malignant. Uh, the nodular lesion causes suspicion of invasive squamous cell carcinoma. A diffuse lesion can masquerade as chronic conjunctivitis. In our practice, we have seen many times some of the patients, they go to different ophthalmologists and treat it as conjunctivitis. But when they come to us, to the ocular oncologist, and they, we find them that it is an advanced disease, advanced case. Uh, and treatment is different, difficult. It can infiltrate the cornea and sclera to have the intraocular extension. May extend into the orbit causing proptosis. I've seen in my practice that uh, in recurrent cases and in, uh, in primary when there is hepatite, uh, uh, HIV positive, huh? in those cases, uh, it, it happens. Proptosis is most com mainly common and can metastasize to the regional lymph nodes. So we have to palpate the regional lymph nodes whenever we suspect a case of OSSN. Rarely distant metastasis may occur. Aggressive variant includes spindle SL squamous carcinoma, maybe epidermoid carcinoma, and adenoid squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, besides rose bengal test and fluorescent stain, we can do one test for uh, diagnosis of the uh, OSSN or it to, to see its extension. That is high resolution anterior segment OCT. What can we get? Hyperreflective thickened epithelium and an abrupt transition from normal to abnormal epithelium. Here we can see this is the OSSN and there is abrupt transition. So we have to, uh, we can do it to see the scleral invasion or corneal invasion. So treatment plan, there are, we can do, go for surgery or we can go topical medication, um, chemotherapy or other immunotherapy and plant brachytherapy. These are, these are our options. And there are two schools of thought. One goes for, one school of thought goes for the topical treatment, initially primary treatment, and another for surgical treatment. 
So topical treatment, those are for corneal OSSN and that diffuse placoid lesion compliant patient who can come for follow up, adjuvant for age involvement with dysplasia or CIN and chemo reduction. And if it is a large thing for chemo reduction, we can go for, with topical. Surgical is invasive OSSN, unsure of invasion or death, we, can, we have to do the surgery. Localized nodular tumor, intolerance to topical chemotherapy, and poor compliance. So surgery, we know that excision of tumor with 4 millimeter margin clearance, alcohol cryotopitelectomy, cryotherapy to resection age, it is double top piece, uh, double phase top age cryotherapy, cryotherapy to resection base, lamellar keratectomy, lamellar sclerectomy, amniotic membrane graft. We can do it by suture or glue. And complete the, uh, the surgery should be non touch, no touch technique. We will not touch the lesion. And how do we improve success? There are some principles. We have to do the edge clearance, we have to do the base clearance. If needed, we have to give new adjuvant therapy and histology guided adjuvant treatment. That is a very important point, four points. And this is a small video. Uh, first, we, we have to mark with a marker, a four millimeter from the, then uh, in, uh, we excise the lesion with non-touch technique and going, and then excision. Now after remove, after excision, uh, it is the uh, edge and uh, cryo, cryo is given is at the edge then to the base i think uh, we've lost yeah. connection from uh, the family yeah we have lost connection So in the meantime, let's have some discussion. Yeah. Dr. Namrata is also a corneal expert. Uh, Ma'am, I have yeah. put a question in the chat box. If you can reply this. So topical chemotherapy that is available is topical mitomycin C and uh, topical interferon that is uh, available to us. I think Dr. Mili was showing a very nice case of surgical resection on how to do it. And we normally like to debulk the topical uh, with the topical therapy first, like to debulk the uh, OSSN and then uh, take for surgery uh, at a later date. Uh, Dr. Shizuka is also there. Dr. Shizuka, would you also have some comments on OSSN? Hey, I, I don't have such cases. Uh, okay. So we generally give topical mitomycin C uh, uh, in uh, three cycles, uh, off and on cycles. So it's like 0.02% uh, uh, given in QID doses, two weeks on and two weeks off, and three such cycles have given. And uh, if uh, most of the smaller OSSN would respond to this, and sometimes it's heartening to see how you actually see nothing on the uh, cornea. But uh, the bonds, which are larger ones, have to be debulked first with the chemotherapy, and then at a later date, uh, you can do a surgical excision for them. This is more so when the OSSN is recurrent. What about, uh, Dr. Namrata, what about the use of interferon, uh, topical interferon topical drops? Topical. Are they available? Yeah, they are very much available, and they can be tried, and they are given also, and they have results which are comparable to or even uh, better than mitomycin C in some of the studies. Uh, because it is set, said to be less toxic. The only problem is that uh, uh, with this is that it is expensive. Mitomycin C is affordable and patients can really afford it, but topical interferon is expensive. And what is the dosing schedule for uh, use of topical interferon? So topical interferon also goes into the same doses only. You have to give uh, in international units. I'll just uh, refer to that and uh, we'll uh, let you know the dose. And uh, the results are similar to those of mitomycin C. Okay. What is the role of high resolution ASOCT? You always yes, Ma'am, you wanted to say something? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I had this question that uh, as Professor Shokat was uh, uh, telling regarding the role of high resolution ASOCT, 
so like i had this question to ma'am saying that is it uh, good or uvm has an upper hand uh, no uh, uvm is good but now if you see uh, the studies which are coming from dr uh, from uh, miami baskin palmer where dr carol cap who's done maximum amount of work on this has very clearly shown that even with the asocit which is high definition and i think dr milly was showing a very nice picture of you know you can make out whether it is just hypertrophic epithelium or the the, the nature of the reflectivity is just it just changes when it is malignant so there are clear cut characteristic signs even described on high definition ocit so if you don't have a ubm uh, cornea people you know generally have a high definition asocit but will not have a ubm unlike the glaucoma people so uh, you can pick it up even uh, on that and what about role of impression cytology in the early cases it has a role to play because you can always pick up the dysplastic uh, cells and that is the first thing in fact that we get done uh, for ossn whenever we suspect it because you can immediately uh, distinguish between the benign and the malignant lesions because some of sometimes it's not malignant appearing to be like ossn then you know you don't have to start you know mitomycin c in those cases so it really helps uh, In, in that in that manner so can you differentiate between cin and squamous cell carcinoma spindle yeah, cell yeah. types on the basis of impression cytology or you require histopathology for those uh, differentiation for those, in the diagnosis for those clear cut differentiation you do require histopathology by histopathology so generally what is recommended is excision with white surgical margins so that we anyway do and you get a specimen for biopsy also yeah So should we move on to the next talk now? Yes. So thank you, Dr. Namrata, for answering all the questions. So our next speaker is Dr. D. S. Grover, and he is a renowned glaucoma specialist uh, from Texas, and he is extremely passionate about surgical innovations. And uh, uh, the technique of GAT has been developed by him, which has gained a lot of popularity, especially in. in country because it's quite cost effective so i would now request dr grover to go ahead with his talk wonderful well thank you thank you all for um inviting me to speak and uh good morning good day and good evening to everybody around the world um so honored to be here and to speak to you about something i feel passionate about which is which is gat um and these are my financial disclosures none of which i think are really pertinent to to today I'm going to start by just talking about my general glaucoma surgical algorithm, and then introduce what GAT is, uh, show some videos, uh, some data, and then um, kind of go over some indications and, and, and supplies that I use. You know, I think any glaucoma specialist can appreciate that the current standard of care is uh, needs to be improved. You know, this is what we do to patients, and trabeculectomies have saved millions of patients from going blind. Uh, but I always ask myself, you know, if I had glaucoma, would I want a trab in my eye? And uh, I would want, in truth, everything done possibly before I would have to have a, trabe a trabeculectomy in my eye. And I feel the same way about tube shunts. You know, I want to do everything I can to avoid having to put a tube in a patient. Uh, I basically tell my patients that I'm a fancy plumber, and uh, you know this is my surgical algorithm. You can either open up the patient's inherent outflow system, or um, or reduce and turn down the faucet. Um, you can either open up their own outflow system or create a new outflow system. And what we're going to talk about here is kind of the uh, that chart in the upper upper right quadrant where you assume the patient has an intact outflow system and you're opening it up. in a circumferential way, 360 degrees. So trabeculotomy is not a new thing. Uh, trabeculotomy has been around for a while, uh, but classically it was done ab externo under a large scleral flap. And it was actually described in the uh, in the 60s by uh, some of the great thinkers of angle surgery, uh, Redmond Smith, uh, where he would basically um, isolate Schlem's canal, cannulate it with a, a nylon suture, retrieve it a couple of clock hours away, put it back in, and then he would pull and create a segmental uh, trabeculotomy. And I love this picture right here because this is really the land, the key of circumferential trabeculotomy. You see uh, the trabecular flap opening up. Cleaving anteriorly and laying flat, and we haven't far, um, you know, in our thinking, but we've just come far in our uh, imaging technology. We can see exactly what Redmond Smith was describing in the '60s using OCT today. 
<clears throat> now, Morton Grant, which is also one of the, he was also one of the great thinkers in our field, really did some fundamental landmark studies and showed that about 75% of the resistance to outflow in glaucoma, in primary opening of glaucoma, was the trabecular meshwork. Now, David Epstein redid those studies and showed it was about two thirds, uh, but regarding that, the vast majority of resistance to outflow in primary opening of glaucoma uh, and most secondaries. Uh, is the trabecular meshwork. And a lot of these studies were coming out of Japan um, for ab externo, showing tremendous success rates. For example, here in developmental glaucoma, you never see 90% success rate in glaucoma surgery, uh, except in developmental glaucoma. Uh, here's a uh, study comparing uh, ab external trabeculotomy in POAG and in pseudoexfoliation. Look at the three and four year results. I mean, they're essentially no different than the TBT studies. Um, and uh, here's a study that I really thought was powerful, showing uh, the treatment for steroid-induced glaucoma, which we know that we think the trabecular meshwork or the back wall of Schlem's canal is implicated in steroid-induced glaucoma. Uh, and this actually shows that trabeculotomy was actually more successful than trabeculectomy. Uh, this last study kind of compared, okay, well, do we get better success when we open up more of the angle? So it compared harms trabeculotomy, metal trabeculotomes with a 360 trabeculotomy, showing that the more of the angle you open up, the better success you get. What's the problem with ab external trabeculotomy? It takes a lot of time. It's invasive. You're violating the conjunctiva. You're violating the sclera. And that may, in fact, um, and, you know, have implications for, for further surgeries down the line. Um, and so we're, we're really witnessing, I think, a tremendous evolution in this technique. And about 10 years ago now uh, was the very first time in October of 20, uh, 2011 was the very first time we, we came up with this technique uh, called the GAT surgery, which is an ab internal circumferential trabeculotomy. And this was, uh, we hired an illustrator to highlight some of the key portions of the surgery, initially making a goniotomy, cannulating within the eye uh, using a 5 proline suture, passing it around 360 degrees. And through two small paracentesis, you have a 360 degree circumferential trabeculotomy. And here's some still frames of that using that 5 proline with a blunted tip. I'm gonna show a quick video uh, of, of this technique. And I'll point out a couple of things, the kind of do's and don'ts. And this is a good example of what you shouldn't do and should do. Uh, you can see I broke a little blood vessel here. You wanna really avoid that. Um, this is a uh, this is a left eye, so it's a temporal and infranasal incision. I put a little myocol because the patient's phacic, uh, putting some uh, Helon GV, and then I've blunted the 5 proline suture, and you can see that blood is coming around and getting in between the interface of the gonio and the cornea, which is going to obstruct the view just a little bit. I'm making a goniotomy. You can do that with an, uh, a 23 gauge needle or an MVR blade, and you can see that blood starting to obstruct your view a bit. Um, and then I like to depress on the back wall of Schlem's, uh, on the back, on the TM, so you can see the back wall of Schlem's canal. So I washed off that blood a little bit. And this is key. You wanna go as tangential as possible to the back wall of the canal. You don't wanna go uh, into the back wall of the canal. And in truth, once you get about 90 degrees, you can see I'm gonna keep looking and making sure that I'm, I've turned the corner. Once you've turned the corner, you pretty much are gonna be uh, in a good place. And then you'll feel as you're going, the resistance starting to increase. And once it's past 180 degrees, as you're pushing this way and the suture has to go this way, you're gonna really feel it. If, you can do, if you're just doing this and it's going, you're probably in the wrong spot or it's gone super croidal or it's popped out of the canal. But that resistance you, is a good sign. And just when you give up hope, um, you actually start to see the suture come around. Um, and then what I do with my microsurgical instruments is then I reach over uh, if you reach under, it can kink in the in the angle in the eye. So I reach over, just retrieve that tip, uh, and then um, and then I actually just hold it there, and then I'll pull um, on my external portion, and there, within a matter of minutes, uh, you have a 360 degree trabeculotomy through two small paracentesis. And here we've described this is showing a little bit of that wave, episclerovenous fluid wave. You're going to see some blanching, um, which. Uh, uh, we've we've shown is correlated with outcomes, and uh, and Zainab, who's also on this panel, uh, published a result showing outcomes with the wave and GAT specifically. Uh, so we know that's a good uh, prognostic indicator. Um, so let's see if this actually worked, though. All right. So this was actually the very first initial time that we reported the technique back in 2014. Our initial results in both primary open angle glaucoma and secondary 
glaucomas, showing that at one year you have a sustained and significant drop in IOP, a sustained and significant drop in medication dependence. Uh, and at one year, we had a cumulative proportion of failure of anywhere from 0.1 to 0.3. Uh, we also reported in the British Journal of our experience in primary congenital glaucoma and juvenile open angle glaucoma, getting tremendously uh, high success rates, what we'd expect to see in angle surgery in, in children, you know, seeing pressures go from 27 down to 14 and 2.6 meds down to 0.86. So it's a, I think it's been a tremendous addition to our ability to take care of kids. Back a couple of years ago, I can't believe it's already three years, uh, we reported our two-year outcome data um, in GAD in the Journal of Glaucoma. I'm gonna review that just briefly. I want to spend some time just orienting everyone to this slide because I'm going to keep this uh, organization a little consistent. You can see on the, the columns this POAG. These are patients with POAG that had GAT. Sorry about the formatting issue. This is patients that had a combined phaco GAT with primary open angle glaucoma. And these are my pseudophagic patients that had a GAT. These are the secondary patients with a GAT, the secondary combined phaco GATs, and the secondary um, uh, pseudophagic. Gets. Uh, the key thing, whenever you're looking at, especially this MIGS data, but I think any data, you kind of have to ask yourself, okay, who are these done in? Are these done in the patients where you see with the eye stent trial, where they're just mild glaucoma, ocular hypertensives, or are these in patients with real disease? And you can actually see, and these are the key three things I look at when I evaluate any type of study when it comes to surgical outcomes. What's the pressure, what's the meds, and what's the stage of disease? And so these patients, as you can see, had real glaucoma, mean deviations on visual field of anywhere from six to 12, uh, high pressures in the 20s and 30s, and on two to three meds. So this is not the mild glaucoma. This is the real disease, the blinding condition that we all battle every day. And what do we see? And across the board, at two years, you can see um, the mean ILPs dropped for anywhere from 20s to 30s down to 14, and the mean medication dependence dropped anywhere from two to three down to about one and a half or so. Nothing is without complication, obviously. Uh, the vast majority of complications we saw uh, were hythema, Again, these were our initial results. This is the very first group of patients we did this on when we first developed this in 2000, in about 10 years ago. Um, and so you are seeing a couple episodes of, you know, if you, I don't do this in patients with a sutured lens or if they have um, an, is it, is that lens instability, uh, you can, if you're, uh, if you're not careful, cause an iridodialysis or cyclodialysis. Those are usually resolving actually. Uh, this one recurrent hyphema was a patient of mine who was a yoga instructor. And every time she kind of did yoga, she, she had a recurrent hyphema. So I keep that in my back of my mind. I won't do this in patients that scuba dive or are aggressively uh, valsalving or working out. Um, you know, what's exciting to see is that after, over the past 10 years, there are more than 20 peer reviewed publications from around the world uh, on GAT. And so uh, it's nice to see that this is not just coming out of our practice, but it's being replicated um, around the world. And uh, so in conclusion, I would say GAT is a novel, safe, minimally invasive Conjunctival sparing surgery. Uh, the success rates at two years, the cumulative proportion of failure range anywhere from 0.18 to 0.35, and cumulative proportion of reoperation. Patients that actually needed surgery were pretty low repeat surgery, 0.09 to 0.28, depending on the group. Traditionally, the secondary groups did better because we do know that the disease is in the trabecular meshwork and, uh, and the patients that had combined surgery tended to do a lot better. I would love to see a prospective GAT study get started. Um, we do wanna keep reporting our longer follow-up. We're gonna be soon reporting on our five-year outcomes. Um, I, I really think when it comes to, to MIGS, we need to start thinking about cost-effective delivery of care. Even in the United States or other uh, countries where we don't take cost as uh, into consideration as other uh, other healthcare systems do, it's not realistic for us to be spending you know fifteen hundred dollars U.S. dollars or two thousand dollars on a small stent that will lower the pressure by one or two points. And when you can do something like this for four dollars or less, I think it has tremendous implications for uh, delivery of cost-effective uh, glaucoma surgical care. Uh, so, you know, in, in potential implications for India, um, you know, when I've done, come to India uh, and, and performed this, I've actually seen the results to be quite, uh, quite impressive. Uh, I think some of that reason may be uh, because, you know, in, in, at least in the U.S., patients are on drops for 15, 20 years before they even consider a surgical option sometimes. And I think that there's a chronic 
uh, impact of those drops, as evidence also suggested by the LIGHT trial showing SLT was better than latanoprost and lowered the risk of, of surgery. Uh, I think the same thing can be true across the board with medication. And, and the patients that I've operated on in India had relatively advanced glaucoma, but their eyes were so much such like they were virgin eyes that really hadn't been abused by drops for about 15 years. Uh, we're soon to be presenting the, the, the one-year outcomes with um, Dr. Swati and uh, Venkatesh uh, at, and, and um, Kavita at, uh, at the Arvindai Hospital in Pondicherry. So it's really, we're going to have be able to report it in India, our outcomes in India on, on Indian eyes. Um, this is one of my favorite slides. Uh, this is from my friend, Bryce Ford, who kind of put together a, a price per millimeter of mercury, and, and this is Canadian dollars, showing the, the cost that it takes to lower one millimeter of mercury for GAT is about 0.80, about 81 cents. Uh, this is thankfully not a map of COVID, but uh, this is actually a map of uh, what GAT has been done world wide. As far as I know, uh, it's being done in probably over 26 countries, as far as I can tell, hopefully more. Um, and, um, and that really makes me makes me excited. Uh, this is really this is if you want to take a snapshot for anybody interested in doing GAT, this is kind of what I use uh, for GAT. And every year, um, you know, pre-COVID, uh, even post-COVID uh, through virtual meetings, uh, we host a course at the American Academy of Ophthalmology on GAT. And um, when the world opens back up again, um, I do always have an open, po open door policy in my operating room uh, for anybody that wishes to come out. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'd be honored to uh, come back at a later time and give a more specific nuanced discussion about GAT uh, for those interested. You know, this is such a still, a, I can't believe it's been over a year. We're still battling this pandemic and uh, my heart goes out to my my family, my friends and my colleagues in, in India and around the world uh, that are still battling this, uh, this uptick. Uh, so I hope you all continue to stay safe during uh, all this madness. Again, there's nothing better than fresh air, but it's so important right now for us to continue to take care of ourselves. Uh, our families, our patients, and our colleagues, and and you know it's also still an, a wonderful opportunity to just to just laugh, and and enjoy the wonderful things the internet has to provide. So um, you know these are two of my current favorite little memes or 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 or, or jokes, uh, but you know this this pandemic has also given me a just such a tremendous renewed sense of gratitude. And I'm so thankful for, you know, for my family, for my wife, uh, for that, for my family, my kids, uh, for my friends and all the colleagues and the familiar faces I'm seeing on this call. Um, and, and I still, to this day, every day when we sit down as a family for dinner, um, all of us, including the kids, go around the table and tell everybody one thing that we're grateful for, because although this is a stressful time, I still think we have so many things to be to be thankful and grateful for. And I'm so thankful for the Delhi Ophthalmology Society for inviting me to, uh, to speak here. Thank you for the moderators and the planning committee. Um, Appreciate the uh, invite from uh, Professor Daria uh, Sharma and, and Dubey for uh, for having me here. It's always exciting to be able to speak on this. Uh, so I open any any questions. Please don't ever hesitate to reach out to me. This is my glaucoma work group and, and emotional support group. Uh, it's my all my partners. But uh, please don't hesitate to reach out or uh, or email me if you have any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Grover, for a wonderful presentation and wonderful video. And uh, in India, we are still in infancy as far as makes are concerned. And this is simply because of the cost factor. And I think GAT is the answer. So the simple question is, how many cases it will uh, need to master the technique or maybe learn the technique, not master? Because it may not be that easy as it appears in your hands. Yeah, you know, I think angle surgery is is a technique that is obviously doable and learnable, uh, okay. you know, uh, but it's a specific skill. So uh, the first thing you need to understand, obviously, the, the key things are number one, angle anatomy, and number two, gonioscopy, uh, you know, because if you can't, you don't know what you're seeing. And if you can't see what you're supposed to see, you can't do the surgery. So what I would say, actually, for anybody interested in first learning angle surgery at all is after an uncomplicated cataract surgery. Well, fun, first, in the clinic, I have a gonio prism in every one of my exam rooms, and I use my gonio prism 40 times a day, easily. Um, 
And, and I would tell you that I came out of fellowship 11 years ago, feeling pretty comfortable with, uh, with gonioscopy. Um, but after doing it 40 times a day, five days a week for, for five years, it really, it took me to a different level. And, and, and so I would say practicing it every day in the clinic is important. And then after just an uncomplicated cataract surgery, the lens is in the bag, you still have viscoelastic in the eye, you can take a deep breath, you're about to wash everything out, just tilt the patient's head, tilt the scope, throw on a gonial prism and just look. You're not doing anything. This is the safest time after cataract surgery, eyes formed, lenses in the back. Just look. And then once you look after a couple of times, then get your second instrument and just put it in the eye and kind of get that textile, tactile feedback of what it's like just to be in the angle. That I think is such a, an important step before you just jump in because if you can't see what you're doing and keep the eye formed, you can't do the surgery. So after just getting comfortable looking at the angle probably 10 or 15 times, putting your second instrument in the eye and just holding it there, uh, not doing anything, that's such a key, key step. And then it builds on itself. Then you can go in and get a microsurgical instrument and just kind of pinch it and kind of just see what it would be like to kind of move it around uh, before you jump to do your first gap. There are some other things, angle surgery, that I think are a little bit easier um, that still may be a little cost effective. Um, you know, the Tenito blade is a reusable instrument. Uh, the Kahook dual blade is also something that you could try to delve in. And the Kahook blade, although in the U.S. it's considered disposable, you can, you can gas it and, and reuse it again, theoretically. It's off-label, but you could consider doing that. The Tenito blade is reusable. Um, and, um, and that would just give you that, that use of comfort with just the limited goniotomy, which I think can help lower the pressure by by a couple points and if you can build up like that then i think you set the stage for for gat but remember and this is something that always strikes me i still remember my very first cataract surgery and it took me probably two minutes three minutes just to do a paracentesis and and it, it you know and 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 we've all been there and and so you shouldn't be able to do gat the very first time you try it the first time I saw cataract surgery, I thought it looked super easy. And then I got tremendously humbled. Uh, and I still do every day uh, by cataract surgery. Um, and so the same thing is true with GAT. You know, you got to build on it, do some steps. Um, but again, I'm, I'm happy to, to come back and give a more nuanced talk on each of these steps and it's just more, more videos and tricks that we've learned um, at a later time. Thank you, Dr. Clover, for this uh, wonderful tip that you have given that after cataract surgery, we should try it. So that's a wonderful tip. I just want to ask you, how do you blunt the tip of proline? Uh, I uh, I actually use low temp cautery, and and what you do is, uh, and I have a couple of videos that I can I can show at a later time. Uh, you want to you just bring it as close as possible, or actually just a little bit close, and you don't want a big big mushroom tip. What I do is the minute I see it change is when I stop. You want the smallest tip you can create. Uh, if it's too big, it's it's going to be too large for the canal and it's going to be hard to get through. So uh, I will basically, I'll turn on the, the, the low temp cautery, get it close. And the minute I see it change, then I stop. If it's too big, I just cut it and do it again. Is it just before the touch or it, the physical touch is required with the cautery? No, uh, I don't, I don't touch it. It's just, I just get it close. Um, and, and again, proline is, you know, super inexpensive and you just get a large piece and just play with it. Um, but you want just the smallest possible tip possible. And if you mess up, you just cut it and then do it again. Mm, thank you so much. So any special cautery or uh, you can use your, uh, in cautery, which we're using, you, you have to use the unipolar cautery process, right? Uh, I use a yeah a, a, a handheld cautery um, that that. Is it available know, in India? Because I or can you just tell us where should I get we get it that cautery? I think it should be. It's not the cautery that can hook up to your uh, FACO machine. It has to. It's a. It's a heat. It's a heating source. Um, I've had friends in Peru actually use a, a candle. You know, or, or a, okay. a fire. I'm and, and show get it. What do you do, Zainab? Yeah, yeah. I, I can show it later in my video. I have I have uh, one video showing the cautery. Okay. 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 It's available okay. from uh, Ma'am, can I answer that cautery? It's a yeah. yeah. on that's a punctal cautery. Ma'am, that's a punctal cautery. Yeah, yeah. That's what that's I was the, wondering. We can that's use the it. Cautery we use for SFIable and all other things. It's a very low. Yeah, 
Yeah. Is it something like uh, unipolar cautery, which is used by Yamane's technique for just for yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah, it's just the heating. Yes, it's sir. just the heating source. You Absolutely. know, you can use you can use a flame, but I would say just make sure they turn off the oxygen in the OR. You can use a flame too. Um, you know, uh, it, it doesn't have to be a, a something too expensive. It's just you just need a heating source. Dr. Uh, uh, this is Dr. Shams Tuman from Bangladesh. Do you experience any hypertony in such uh, after doing this surgery? So um, you can, um, but when you get hypotony, um, it is due, it's iatrogenic, right? Because the, uh, the, the episcleral vasculature um, and the downstream collector channels create an inherent resistance. So your floor is probably episcleral venous pressure, which is around 12 to 15, depending on the patient. Um, if you ever see hypotony after this, it's that there's been a small cyclodialysis cleft created or a large one. Um, so the surgery itself and trabeculotomy and there's some debate to this. The, the, that Japanese literature actually thinks there was a paper out there showing that they feel that circumfrontal trabeculotomy creates a bunch of microscopic psychodialysis. And, um, and you can see uh, a ciliary body effusion after this in patients with a little bit of psychodialysis. In my patients that have a pressure of 10 after GAT, I do assume that there's a small probably psychodialysis because they're beyond where I would put episclerovenous pressure. But if you have no psychodialysis cleft, um, typically you get the patients to be anywhere around, you know, 13 to 15, sometimes 17 on no medications. And then uh, you can reintroduce one drop and get them down to 15 or 14. So if you don't get that episcleral venous fluid wave, uh, suppose the collector channels are also involved in the pathology. So what do you do there if you have done a successful GAD, but you don't see that wave? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so the study that we did that uh, that basically showed the presence of a wave, um, and, or let me reverse it, the absence of a wave, um, one third of patients went on to need further surgery if there was no wave. Uh, but you could flip it around and say still two thirds of patients without a tremendous wave still had did not go on to need surgery. Um, Zainab, what was your, your paper, uh, if you want to speak to your paper on GAT and the wave specifically? Yeah, yeah we look for the, the wave in patients underwent GAT surgery in our clinic. So it's my, uh, it's my uh, first uh, choice, actually, as a surgery in glaucoma patients. I, uh, it's, uh, it's my uh, favorite procedure. So uh, what we found was the cutoff value uh, was 4.5. If you uh, if you get a wave uh, after surgery uh, more than uh, 4.5 clock hours, then then it's a good sign, and then this means that you don't need to uh, add and you don't need to uh, put on your uh, put your patient on uh, additional medications. So so the, that's the most uh, important finding of our study. So this so, means yeah, that if you have a wave lower than four or 4.5, this means that according to our data, this means that you need to uh, put on your patients, uh, put on uh, extra um, glaucoma medications. We still haven't used the wave for intraoperative surgical decision making. You know, on a very rare patient, would I say if there maybe I had one chance of, of doing a surgery and... Um, you know, actually, I take that back. I did it in a child and with Sturge Weber, where I was going to go in and do a, do a two. And I went in the eye and I did a gap first and I touched her angle, saw that she had some level of angle dysgenesis. And then I saw the most amazing wave. And because of that, I actually didn't do a tube. I just kept it as a GAT and she was three years old. That's three years ago. She's done extremely well. Um, but uh, I still haven't because in our study, two thirds of patients did not need further surgery. When I don't see a wave, I still, I'm not going on and at the same time doing a tube or a trap. I will still give some hope. Um, but I do use the wave to talk to my patients. And then the recovery room, when, if they have a, an amazing wave, I'll say, you know, ma'am, you had a great wave. I'm very optimistic that this is going to work. Or, sir, I didn't see a wave. And I tell them right away, sorry, I didn't see a wave. There's a chance this surgery may not work. 
and we may need to come back later and do something else. So I will, I will use that for my own expectations, setting the patient's expectations. Um, and in one time I used an amazing wave to prevent me from doing a tube that I had planned to do. Um, but if I don't see an amazing wave, uh, it's rare that I will move on to do a different surgery at the same sitting. Yeah, that, that's so, what I do. Can I uh, can I ask a question, Davinder? Um, could you please uh, make a quick comment on hemigat procedure? So, uh, would, do do we need to open up all the system in all patients? I mean, it works in it works very well, for example, in sodium exfoliative patients. But you, when, once you open up all the system, you know, uh, you you have you mo you have more hyphema. So, what's what's your um, opinion? Yeah, so so hemigat is something that um, Patrick Goy in Canada kind of started to, yeah, to develop, and it's basically still doing a proline, but instead of passing it around 360, uh, you're basically passing it around about 180 or 90 and 90, and maybe opening up 180 to, of the of the uh -huh. eight degrees of the angle. Um, and uh, and I think the I mean Patrick is going to publish his results on it. I think they're almost as good as 360, but a couple millimeters lower. So I, I think that's very reasonable. You know, I think. If you if you have a patient that's pseudo X, or where where you think that you can get away with just opening up half of the angle, um, I think that's less invasive. It's less tissue destructive. I think it will theoretically lower your risk of hyphema. You may have a not as tremendous of a pressure lowering, but you may not need it. Um, and so I think there are times where you know I have patients where I'll either do a tenito blade 180 degrees or 180 degree gat. Um, and I guess in theory, the benefit of that is if there later on some ability to treat the trabecular meshwork or you have still half of the trabecular meshwork untouched and you've opened up half the angle. So I, I do think that, um, and I think technically, uh, hemigat is a little bit easier. So, uh, because you can just go in half a 90 degrees, pull 90 degrees, pull, and you've treated 180 degrees. So that also would be a great way to, in the learning process of getting comfortable with this. So I, I do think there's a definite role for, for hemigat. Uh, and I, I make that decision based on the stage of the patient and the degree of pressure lowering that I want. Yeah, thank you. That's what, that's Dr. what I think. Uh, Dr. Uh, Grover, I have a question. Uh, uh, I, for the, uh, especially, uh, can you give us any tips for the beginners to assist in cannulation and how to uh, decrease the um, uh, amount of hyphema? Yeah. So, um, so a couple of things. Uh, one, you want to minimize intraoperatively your episclerovenous pressure. And actually, since this, I've changed my whole approach to every surgery I do. Every patient I do, they're like this now. Their head is above their heart. They're in reverse Trendelenburg. And that minimizes episclerovenous pressure. That will minimize blood reflux in the operating room. Number two, the best way to minimize any complication during angle surgery is maintaining your anterior chamber. If you start to lose your chamber, reform it. You've got to, and, and then if you get any blood reflux, reform the eye and tilt the patient even higher. Um, uh, two is, is what we talked about, uh, visualization. You've got to be able to see it. You need to make sure the patient's head is tilted for the way and the scope is tilted towards you. Understanding landmarks, intraoperative gonioscopy, um, make a large MVR or a, a 23 gauge needle incision, make a goniotomy so you can really see where you're going and then come as tangential as possible to the back wall. Uh, you don't want to aim into the back wall like this you want to come as parallel as possible to the back wall so you don't break through the back wall of Schlem's canal. Those are such key things. And then the last thing is that we used, we got burned really badly immediately back in 2011, 2012 with hyphema because we were seeing a wave. Um, but now if I see a tremendous wave, I leave a little bit of helon in the eye. You, that will prevent immediate post-operative hypotony. So if you see a tremendous wave, leave about a 20 to 30% helon fill. If you don't see a wave, don't maybe leave a 10% helon fill. But if you see a tremendous wave and some blood reflux, you want to keep the eye formed. You want the pressure, leaving the OR to be about 21. And on post-op day one, I dream for the pressure to always be about 17 with a little bit of helon in the eye, maintaining the chamber and, and have the patient avoid Valsalva, have them sleep on their back with their head above their heart um, and, and really minimizing anything that will increase episclerovenous pressure. So during surgery, also the head end should be elevated. Elevated, yes. Yeah. So, say that again. Grover, how do you... It seems everyone wants to learn GAT today only. 
<laughs> You're yeah, I mean, let's, uh, what we can do, I have, I have yeah. so much information on this. Um, yeah. And uh, what we can do later, if you guys would indulge me, and, um, uh, and I'd be honored to come back, um, because you can see I'm obviously very passionate about this. We, uh, we will have you later for the detailed presentation. Yeah, or I can give a yeah. more extensive instructional kind of step-by-step -step yeah. approach to all these things. Yeah. But thank but you very much for your yeah. 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 Well, thank because you Because we all. all are doing uh, uh, guniotomies and even trabectomes, and we are familiar with the, uh, with the handle surgery, but I think we need to start GAT now. So yeah. I, yeah. we just want to get tips from you how to start. Yeah. Well, that would be my dream. Good. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you very much, Dr. Grover. And now uh, I would call upon the next uh, speaker. I think Dr. Sharavi and Dr. Sylvia are not there. And uh, they're not there, it seems. So, and Dr. Shaukat Ara wanted to present her remaining talk, which was missed because of the poor connection. So are you there, Dr. Ara? Yes, yes, I am here. Yes. Okay, so if you want to present, kindly present. I'm having problem again. Okay, I think you can sort out the problem. I can call the uh -huh. next speaker yes, by yes. then. Yes. Uh, Dr. Arun Gulani, he'll be talking on keratoconus to 2020. Gulani keratoconus treatment algorithm. Are you there, Dr. Gulani? It, it appears he is not there because it's not there in the chat box also. Oh, okay. Even he is not there. Okay, no, his, no, his name is there, but uh, in the panelist. Yeah, his, his name, name was there. there, actually, because I yeah. saw his name. But uh, among the but people he's not who responding have, right now. No, among the people who have joined, his name is not there. No, no, it's there. Uh, I can see Dr. Gulani, the panelist. Name is... But he's not responding. Can someone find out whether he's there or not? I'll ask he, has to in, he has to unmute himself because he's muted. Okay, so and can you do that? His video please? is also off. His video is also off. Camera is also closed, yes. So, can you please uh, unmute him? Oh, yes, he's turning on the camera now. Okay, okay. Dr. Gulani, can you please unmute yourself? Yeah, he's done. Dr. Gulani, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Can you see me? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Actually, mine was, I think, uh, 15 minutes later, but uh, I think the previous speakers are not here. Yeah. Let me just uh, set up for you. Hi, right, can you hear me? Yes, doctor, we can hear you. Well, good evening, everybody, first of all. Thank you, Dr. Namrata, Dr. Rajendra, Dr. Subhash for the invite. It's always a pleasure to be here. How's everybody doing out there with COVID? Situation is pretty bad in Delhi. I, I know, I'm there. I, I am myself nice. positive. Oh boy. And, uh... mm -hmm. Well, hope it gets better and uh, let's take advantage of these uh, seminars that we have. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the invite again. And uh, let's begin. I'll uh, share my screen in a minute. And please feel, to, feel free to ask any questions if you have.
Let me know if you can see, please. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. Yeah. Okay, lovely. All right, great. So I'm going to talk to you about keratoconus and my concepts of how I go after this condition. And I really want to change the way you think and process keratoconus. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes please. We can. You can. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Here we go. So I do want you to understand something. Keratoconus, of course, is a pathology, but I want your mindset to be 2020. And if you do that, only then you'll really cater to your patient's main ask, which is vision, not to leave them disabled in contact lenses and think you achieved something. Keratoconus 2020 is possible. This is keratoconus, all of us know this, and I'll share with you a few things which I want you to forever remember and get addicted to, which is patient outcomes. I always teach showing the patients, which is extremely demanding in my practice, but that's my style, which is to show you real results, not stupid graphs that can be fooled around with, really high demanding patients from all over the world whose life changes when we think this way. So here are keratoconus patients, all of them seeing 2020 in very demanding professions. And I want you to remember and then get addicted to the look of these patients. These are patients all in one day. And I happen to you have a group photograph before they flew back home. All of you know my concepts of teaching always is show me the patients. Remember, show me the patients. If you cannot show the patients, I don't want to see your results. Very important. Get addicted to your patient outcomes, not to your chart. So exercise and futility is what I call this. Grading keratoconus severity, scoring topography, is labeling the patient as complex, nightmares, impossible, and then scaring yourself and lowering the patient expectations, which is not an endpoint. That's complete failure. Just stop doing these things. You don't need to stage keratoconus. I've corrected up to 90 diopters keratometry, 30 diopters astigmatism. Please believe in yourself. Stop labeling these patients. They come to you for vision. They don't come for looking at how impossible they are and how inept the doctor can be. And of course, this is the biggest confusion in the world today. This is the third largest reason patients have started flying to me, extremely angry at their doctors because they are confused about cross-linking. Whole conferences, conferences that are going on on epi on versus epi off protocols. I use this protocol. My mentor uses this protocol and how thin a cornea can be crosslinked is brain dead if you cannot correct the patient. I want this to sink in. And later I'll teach you my keratoscoliosis concept of crosslinking. But right now I want this to sink in. This is brain dead discussion if you're not really taking your patients to vision. So what really is your goal? Leaving the patients dependent on contact lenses and delaying a transplant is not a goal. That's failure. Delivering vision without glasses and contact lenses to all levels of keratoconus is the goal. No harm if you fall short of your goal because not every patient can get there because of the advanced concepts of keratoconus and associated pathologies, but at least try. And you can always have the help of your optometrist who can use scleral or high definition contact lenses, even the 3D print lenses nowadays that can make up for that remaining 2020. But first, make sure as a surgeon, you attempt. This is the concept of adding contacts to these cases who are extreme, but still brought to independence to at least 20, 40, 20, 50 vision, and then 20, 20 with the contact lens. So the, the, the one most important thing, this is very important for all of you. The one thing I never look at in a keratoconus patients when they fly to me is the topography. I will let that sink in for you very harsh. I do not look at topography. That's the last thing I look at because I don't want any distractions. I don't want to look at this and go, oh my God, look at the colors, look how confusing, look how high the astigmatism is. Doesn't matter. This is what I start doing in every patient. I start refracting them myself. If it takes an hour, it takes an hour. Every patient who lands at my institute from anywhere on this planet, no matter how many surgeons come with them, this is what I do immediately. Meaning I refuse to believe that they cannot see. So I'm putting myself at the line there. Actually refracting them, going through them, even if they are scarred, have keratometry of 70, I'm refracting them. I don't look at anything else. And this is very vital, please, if you want to really succeed in keratoconus patients. I'll show you my thought process. I want you all to think, not get scared of keratoconus. This is a very important mindset that I want you to leave with today. Here are patients who come to me wanting to sue their surgeons. This is a guy with keratoconus. He's a pilot had premium cataract surgery, the doctor did yak caps a lot to me, but left him with high keratometry, anterior corneal scarring, hyperopia, presbyopia, astigmatism, and the guy's 2200, extremely angry. What would you do? Now, as a surgeon, you jump in and go, I can exchange the lens, I'm great, I can do this and that. No, think vision. 
The minute you think vision, your surgery will become artistic and minimalistic. You won't do silly things that will take away 2020. So what did we do in this case? If you look at my concept of 5S that I've talked about three decades ago, I break it into systems. So in this case, we have an issue. If you line it up like bowling, like pins, corneal scar, astigmatism, presbyopia, hyperopia, and high K values are the issues. So what do I want to do here? How can I, in some way, pick one surgery that will correct everything? In this case, what I first want to do is that one surgery that will fix all these issues is myopic laser surgery. But the patient is hyperopic. So you see how my focus becomes so simple. It's not about removing the lens. It's about how do I make this patient myopic? Because there's a deep chamber, because the patient has an open PC and the lens is in place, I put a piggyback lens. It takes four minutes to the same incision. Make the patient myopic. Now the patient is myopic astigmatism, which is a great laser profile to correct scarring, decrease keratomity, increase optical zone, and bring emetropia. This is what I call my concepts of how I stage these surgeries. So I promised this patient a ticket to Paris, but I took him through Iceland. The patient has to be confident to hang on to you while you took him there. So when I put a piggyback lens, actually I made his vision worse, 2400. But the patient is confidently waiting for you to do the next step, bring them straight to 2020. Here are patients with beyond 80 diopters keratometries, over 20 diopters astigmatism, all kinds of chondylectasia. You can correct them straight to vision. I'll save the video for later when we have time. And what's the GPS? It's my planning system where I never talk technology. I first go vision potential as you saw me, then I plan my surgery. Last, I pick my technology. And this is where I spend my time planning. Very important because I do not believe they cannot see. And of course, pick from the numerous technologies that we have in the target vision you want to do. This brings us to the core of today, my algorithms. So if you can please forget all the nonsense that doctors teach you about keratoconus and surgeries, I do over 21 techniques. It's called Think Outside the Concept. I broke it down into just two to make it simple. Structural surgeries, visual surgeries. Very, very simple. Any optical surgery you do is visual, so you're responsible. Every surgery you do to build them up to the visual is called structural. So let's go how I think. So here we are, and I built this just for you. If a patient has best corrected vision of over 20, 40, refractive error, astigmatism more than myopia, pachymetry more than 400, stable, regular, normal, no pathology, here's where I'm going. I'm not talking structural now because a patient has vision potential. So I'm going into my vision column and I'm picking laser because I can get all of those things corrected in four minutes with a laser technique, laser plasty. Now, here's a patient you should not forget again. Can you hear the sound? This is a patient having laser plastic on their 70 diopter keratometry, high astigmatism keratoconus, told by every surgeon in the country, nothing can be done. If you can hear, this is immediately and he's pretty funny. You're doing the second time. I'm from the inside out. This is fantastic. Any pain, No pain whatsoever. This is keratoconus, it's keratoconus, high, advanced, complex, all of the nonsensical labels they come from. And please look at the reflex I teach, the circle of sight I call this. Perfect reflex that tells you you've got a perfect shape, always translates to vision. Now, here is how I take uh, cross-linking. You have to first fix the vision and then cross-link. Later, I'll teach you again my cross-linking concept cannot cross-link first and then leave the patient blind. Here's the way I treat them. This is a prototype patient of mine, a far fighter who came to me, keratoconus. You can look at the astigmatism down to zero, laser plus T to 2015 vision, then cross-link them because he's young and he's done forever. Proof is always the patient. Now, patients who come to me with multiple surgeries, it doesn't matter. I've done patients with 18, 28 previous surgeries. Doesn't matter. I pick them where they are, move the ball to the end zone. So here's a patient who had multiple cross-linkings, ICLs, uh, PTKs on the cornea, all kinds of surgeries in different parts of the world. When he came to me, what do you think I started doing? Refracted him. Straight laser plastic over his ICL, over his PTK, over his cross-linking corneas, straight to 2020. Here are patients with scars with keratoconus. What I do, all of you know my corneoplasty concepts of what I do with scars. And you can see these patients with immediate endpoints Again, for lack of time, I'll just keep going. We can always see videos later if y'all need to. And these patients are immediate responses. I want you to at least see the responses of these people right under the laser. I just finished doing laser on your corneal scar, acanthamoeba scar. And acanthamoeba scar and take A lot more clear, things are sharper. 
I can show you videos later. So this is my in cornea techniques with scars, where I refractively never PTK. Any surgeon who's performing PTK is exposing their inability to understand optics or refractive surgery. So you go refractively through the scars, peel the scars off. Now here's my next level of thinking. Now, what if this patient has a BCVA of more than 20, 40, but myopia more than astigmatism, the chemistry more than 400, stable, regular, normal? Where do you think I'm going? Once again, because the vision is so good, I'm not talking structural, I'm going straight to vision. This is a great case for ICL, toric ICLs, all right? All of you are wonderful surgeons, so I'm not going into surgery unless you need me to go in there. I've used all kinds of faking implants among the first US studies over 30 years ago. These are the Russian, uh, Japanese, and uh, the uh, French uh, lens, and of course, the uh, late Dr. Slava Fyodorov's uh, ICL, which is now the Vision ICL, which is the most common one I use. And of course, these patients, these surgeries take minutes, four to five minutes, topical, and you can change these keratoconus patients' lives forever. Now, patients even with extensive k corners with superior stem cell deficiencies, grandchild granuloma, what do you do in these cases? Again, remember, as long as the patient is visual. So here, I first structurally built it. This was a collaborative case with Dr. Schaefer saying and me, and we built him with amniotic surgery, cleared up the cornea, went in with ICL, even with the residual scar. Look at the patient's vision. Very important, 2025, another ICL 2015. Now, what if the patient's vision is more than 2025? The patient has stigmatism, hyperopia, myopia, stable, regular, and normal. Here, if you see, I'm going again visual because remember the vision is better than 2040. That's your absolute watershed line. So I'm going into a lens-based technique inside the eye. You see the cataract there in the pathology? And you can use a toric lens implant. Please do not let anyone confuse you with studies. I've done this for over 28 years. All toric lenses work with keratoconus. It's just how you align the axis. You can see these patients, look at the topography, you see the astigmatism is still around four diopters, but we went inside the eye and corrected with a toric lens straight to 2025 vision, unaided. I'm always talking no glasses, no contact lenses. You have all these technologies available. The latest lens I've been using in patients to even help their reading in keratoconus is the Vivity lens. Very forgiving, excellent, and toric Vivity can be used in these cases too. Here are patients who are called extreme when they come to me. Patient has nystagmus, if you see. The patient has extremely high myopia, very high astigmatism. Without, you can see right there, 11 diopters, keratoconus. Uh, um, this is also a patient who has uh, albinism. All issues. Doesn't matter. The patient had visual capacity. That's where we brought them straight to 2025 vision. All right. Now, let's go to patients who are more than 2040 against so us still. And more than 300 mile microns packed, less than 400. And everything else normal. What are you going? I'm going to cross-linking these patients to keep them stable and perform my surgeries, which are visual after that. This is very important now what I'm sharing with y'all. This is absolutely important. I want us to hit you in the gut, get out of scoliosis concept. The biggest, biggest situation that is impacting, poorly impacting our patients all over the world now is indiscriminate cross-linking of keratoconus. Cannot cross-link them and think you did something amazing. You did not. You left them with poor vision and you permanize their disability. So look at the concept. Now, the black spine is the spine, the color, the green signifies cross-linking. I call it cement, all right? It is completely irrational to put cement on a bent spine and telling the mother, this won't bend anymore. See how great I am. You're stupid. You just left the spine bent. Why don't you straighten it first and then put cement on it? Now you're talking. Now you help the cake on a patient. These are all patients who've been helped despite poor cross-linking who came to me wanting to sue their surgeons. I feel very bad for these patients because it's indiscriminate cross-linking going on. And like morons, everybody's in conferences discussing what kind of cross-linking and they don't know when to cross-link. Completely wrong. Very big, very big situation in our ophthalmology practice. Cross-linking is a tremendous boon. I use it in all kinds of ectasias, RK, LASIK, uh, whatever complications that come to me, but you cannot do it indiscriminately. This is a gentleman I truly respect in this field, the pioneer, uh, Professor Seal himself. I'm a very big practice for fixing cross-linking complications. Again, not fixing them is one crime. Second, leaving them complicated is unacceptable, but easily correctable. Now let's go to a patient with more than 2060, stigmatism, hyperopia, myopia, but look, the cornea is about 250, unstable, irregular. What would you do? So now I'm not taking vision. See how the mind is so simple, so simple. This is not vision anymore. I have to structurally do something, but because there's high astigmatism, I want to do directional structural surgery, which is intact. It could be intact, scattering, whatever you get in your country, it's fine. 
I'm fine with that, but you're structurally stabilizing, strengthening and directing the cornea for future vision surgery. How simple is this? These are the intact techniques, uh, various techniques that I use. Again, I sit at the head end and I can put any axis. This way you don't keep changing your protocol and you can do these surgeries very simply. Let's take you to patients who are having this surgery. This is called the Gulani T intact technique, which stands for titratable, which means while I'm doing the surgery, I can actually see their vision change and the circle come up. And that I know is my endpoint. So you can see the reaction of the patient. Notice how the center circle is, well, this is the sealant that I use because I don't use stitches in any cases. This is the central area where the reflex, look at the patient's reaction. Put a special ring to control your all kinds of activity occurred of course. This is immediate. That's like titratable technique. You don't put it and think for tomorrow. Look at them describing their vision under the laser. Very important. Please get addicted to your patient outcome. Stop looking at graphs and topography and getting confused. These are the world's most intelligent patients who fly to me. Look at their reaction. I'm doing this just to inspire my parents. Very important. Patients, you can see here, topography, if you're interested in, I do this just to share with you all, because as I said, I don't look at them until I've done the surgery. You can see the changes in topographies, 10 to 0.1. This is a patient from Abu Dhabi with multiple keratoconic complications. Here are patients with all kinds of ectasia, like k corner surgical ectasia, LASIK ectasia. Look at the changes. Straight to vision, 23 to 1.4. There is just no limit. Don't limit yourself, please. After the ring is in, remember that was a structural surgery. You can still do laser plastic on top of it. Why? Because one, your cornea is strong and stable. Two, with your laser, you're removing astigmatism, which as you know, the algorithm of your laser, the eczema laser, removes the least amount of tissue. Patients who are flown to me with a broken Ferrara ring, like in this case from Spain, doesn't matter. The ring was still doing his job, so I'm not touching the ring. I, in fact, did laser to correct the rest of the astigmatism, bring the patient to 2020. Here's a patient with multiple surgeries from Egypt, had numerous keratoconus surgeries, including the 365 Kera ring, doesn't matter. I go straight for refraction. And there they are immediately seeing the difference. Now, what happens if a patient's vision is less than 2100? Irregular refraction, meaning I can't refract. Pachymetry less than 200, unstable, irregular. Scar, now what do you do? Again, think, now I'm not thinking vision at all. See how simple it is. I'm in my structural column. In the structural column, if I do intact, I'm not getting my scar. If I do cross-linking, I'm getting nothing. I must do a lamellar corneal technique to add tissue, remove the scar, build the strength for future refractive surgery. See how simple this is. So I'm doing lamellar keratoplasty, 11 minute surgery. You can use a $50 tooth blade, go into your cornea, add a thicker tissue to it, do a barracker anti-torque eight bite suture, remove it at six months, do laser or cataract, whatever surgery you want, straight to vision. So the lamellar keratoplasty can be automated, like you can see here, lasing a flap. I'll just go fast from the video. And keratoplasty does very important. Watch here what happens this compared to intacts. This actually decreases the keratometry and removes the scar, but doesn't change the astigmatism, which is expected, right? And that's where you'll come back with your refractive outcome. You can do a hand lamellar surgery, as you can see here. This is a case I'll of keep a the volume down. And again, with a $50 tooth blade, you can go and do any keratoconus. This is a 120 micron cornea I think I was working in. You can easily do it with your hand. You don't need machines. In fact, machines cannot do it. None of my femto lasers can do this. And you can then plan your cataract surgery. Remember, structural first, visual later. And you can see all kinds of lamellar techniques you can do straight to vision. Here are patients now of combination techniques, extremely high myopia, congenital cataract, intacts. A patient from Switzerland, what would you do? So I first stabilized her with the intact and then went in with a toric lens with full confidence. And you can see right there, patient brought straight to 2020 vision and flew for the first time without any family help back to Zurich. Switzerland. Here a patient who had come with 12 failed procedures for keratoconus, PDKs, PRKs, cross-linking, uh, intacts, ICL, everything, and now cataract. You can see what I did here. Basically structural first, I reversed the whole surgery, removed his ICL, left the intacts in place, and came back and put my toric lens as a one week apart. I call this the a fake concept, uh, popularized by Dr. Dick McCool. I absolutely love this concept, so you don't have to depend on machines of what lens to use. And you can bring these patients straight to 2020. Again, please look at the patients. Get addicted to the patient. That's one week later, I'm going into an empty bag 
And again, the ratio of sealant, no stitches, state to trying power. So with this, I hope all of you have understood the concept I would love to encourage you with, which is first, don't ever not believe that the keratoconus patient can see. And second, have the full confidence to take them to vision. My YouTube channel is full of surgical videos. I'm here for you anytime and any questions, uh, please shoot. It was a wonderful presentation, Dr. Gulani. Really mind boggling for us. Mind blowing. So I have a question. Should I stop sharing the screen, please? Yes, sir. Okay, go ahead, please. Mm -hmm. Sir, uh, you already answered that, that you never use sutures for your intacts, right? You never right. put any suture? Correct. Okay. And sir, uh, secondly, do you combine cross-linking with intacts? Tell me, why will you do that? Uh, sir, uh, the concept was this, that, that uh, like, I mean, for mechanical strengthening, that's it. Or you believe like uh, intacts alone should work? Doctor, what's your name? Where, where who's this? Sir, Dr. Jaya. Hi, Jaya. So if yes. you can, please, uh, for a moment, forget everything that has been taught to you and to anybody in this world, because I have, I guess, 16 to 17 calls over 35 emails a day from brilliant surgeons. And the questions are still stuck in 20 years before I started teaching. My point is very simple. When I'm just telling you that your each surgery should be optically having a visual endpoint, why then would you make a cocktail? Are you with me? Yes, sir. Absolutely. So you're doing nothing wrong. You're doing nothing wrong, but you're showing me complete lack of confidence in a visual endpoint. You're showing me that you're putting two mechanical surgeries. Remember, those are in my structural side, right, Jaya? Yes, sir. Intact and cross-linking were my structural side. They do not give you vision. Mm. So why would you do two structural surgeries and not take the patient to vision? What I would do in this case, when we have time, you can even, even tell me what the patient's errors were. Remember, my protocol is so simple, right? Best corrected vision, refraction, corneal thickness, any associated patha. It's so simple. Please do not look at these topographies written by PowerPoint surgeons who don't even do surgery. They're making all these scores and grades for you. They're confusing people like you, especially you guys in India, top surgeons. How many of you have seen brilliant hands? But I want to break that barrier today. I want you to realize that every surgery you do has to be visual. Cannot put in this and that and the patient's in a contact lens, failure. A patient doesn't come to you for eye surgery. Tell me one patient in your 300 strong patient OPD every day, who comes to you saying, doctor, I want surgery? Nobody. Yeah. They all so, say, I want vision. Yes. So let's raise the bar. Raise the bar. Anybody who's still doing a corneal transplant has completely disregarded 30 years of my teaching. I have the world's largest complication refractive practice on this planet. I haven't done a transplant for 26 years. What does that tell you? To me, any surgeon is doing a transplant unless there's only one indication. Again, please take this a little more personally. Any, there's only one indication, a full and full perforation into the eye. Besides that, if someone's doing a transplant, they are showing me that they have either no time or desire to take the patient to perfect vision. How many of you have seen a PKP with 20-20 vision uncorrected? Are you getting my point across? Doctor. Where's the doctor gone? Hello? Dr. Jaya, are you there? Dr. Jaya, please yeah. unmute yourself. Yeah. Oh, I'm unmuted. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so, doctor, you're getting my point. You're not doing something wrong, but I encourage you today. Please raise the bar. If your only child had keratoconus, would you do intact cross-linking and leave them in a contact lens? Ask yourself. No. You would want somebody to give him vision. Why then are we working at such a low level? Transplant is the easiest surgery in the world. 22 minutes, 16 stitches. Easy, brain dead surgery. There's no thinking, there's no planning. Just move a manhole cover to another manhole cover. Which patient sees 2020? It's disabled, it's disability for life. See where I want you to be. And if you really think through this, your practice will become so much fun. You saw me refracting. I do not look at $7 million worth of diagnostic instrument I have. I do not look at it. I exactly take a street retinoscope. You saw me doing that. And I start refracting. You'll be amazed. 
excite yourself with the fact that all your patients can see. It's just because you are having difficulty believing that they can see, you are giving them surgeries that are really keeping them disabled for life. Are you with me? So between us, it's amazing the kind of work you are doing, but today I really want to push you, rise and provide vision and even care to corners. That's why my concept has been called for 26 years. I've been teaching, think outside the cone. It'll force you to think. Doing a transplant is a brain dead surgery. Doing PTK is a wrong surgery. Which patient of your PTK sees 2020? None. You are chasing the scar, damaging the shape. Shape is what decides vision. Refractive surgery foundation is based on the shape of the cornea. Therefore, we flatten a myopic cornea, we steepen a hyperopic cornea. Am I right? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gulani, for the fantastic presentation and fantastic discussion. If there are no more questions, we can move on to the next talk. Gulani, a very motivating talk. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. I have to leave, but I'll try and come back for the next talk or any q and I'll be here for you. All right? Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Okay, so the next talk, I would like to invite Dr. Zainab Ekta. She is an associate professor at Medicana International Hospital. And her area of expertise include makes medical and surgical treatment and follow-up of early and advanced glaucomas. And she'll be talking on canal surgery in primary congenital glaucoma. Can you hear me? So see, you see my slides, right? Thanks for- Yeah, yeah, we can see your slides and hear you too. Great meeting. Um, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to be here with you. And so I'll be talking about uh, pediatric glaucoma surgery and especially on angle surgery in kids. So as we all know, uh, childhood glaucoma is a, a difficult disease and uh, it constitutes uh, up to 18% up to of child blindness. And it's the difficult disease because of different anatomy of kids and the difficulties in medication used in kids and different ocular anomalies and general anesthesia issues and amblyopia issues. And as we all know, primary congenital glaucoma is the most common cause of uh, non-syndromic glaucomas. So the... Uh, Diagnosis is very important. The key feature is intraocular pressure. But on the other hand, uh, intraocular pressure measurement in those kids uh, might be unreliable because of these issues, type of photonometer we use and cooperation issues again, and uh, anesthesia, speculum, the, and a different biomechanics of the kid's eye. So we need uh, to see uh, some, other un, uh, some other reliable uh, key features like increased axial length, as we all know, increased cap to disc ratios and change in re refraction. So follow up is very important. And then high iris insertion and some stress and morphological uh, changes. Mm -hmm. So the treatment is, so let's see the, let's uh, go through the treatment algorithm. Treatment is uh, mainly surgical, as we all know. And uh, first choice is angle surgery. And angle surgery is repeatable, as we all know. So uh, we're going to talk about turbiculotomy and GAT surgery again uh, in kids. And so we can repeat the angle surgery. And if they don't work out, we can go ahead and do uh, GDD surgeries and, and, and filtering surgeries. And we can add some diet laser at, at any time and uh, but, but we need to uh, keep the most important thing in our mind that we need to evaluate visual potential of kids before uh, further intervention in every step. So let's start with conventional surgery. That's uh, how I do my surgery in those cases. So we open up conjunctiva for external surgery. I prefer radial cyclical incision to find Schlem's canal. And you, can, you, uh, you cannot find uh, Schlem's canal in every kit because of the different anatomy in those kids. And uh, so you need to look for a clues. Uh, for, so you need to find the circumferential fibers of cyclical support. And so you need to look for acus flow uh, coming out, acus percolation and sometimes you need to, sometimes you can see the blood reflux coming out. And once you locate the Schlem's canal and you enter uh, the Schlem's canal with a metal or harm cervical tom in both sides and slightly rotate uh, it toward the anterior chamber, avoiding uh, touching the, 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 the corneal endothelium and avoiding the, the uh, endothelial detachment. So this is how it looks after surgery. 
And as we all know, circumferential surgery has more favorable outcomes compared to conventional ones, uh, if you look at the, the papers in the current literature. And of course, the, uh, the successful rates, uh, success rates, uh, most depending on the, uh, the, the stage of the disease. And in Turkey, we generally, maybe you guys have uh, the same issue. In Turkey, we generally have a moderate advanced uh, glaucoma childhood glaucoma. And this is our outcomes. We compare the, uh, the outcomes of circumferential trabeculotomy and, co and uh, conventional trabeculotomy in neonatal onset primary congenital glaucoma. And, our, and, and on the right-hand side, you see the, uh, the surgical success rates in first, second, and third year, 70 and, and 64 and 64, and it, it was higher compared to traditional one. And when it comes to circumferential trabeculotomy, and uh, you can uh, you can do it uh, with catheter or uh, or just uh, just the cheapest uh, version of it. You can use just the suture. And uh, we are doing a radial cyclical incision here again to find Schlem's canal. And I'm making uh, I'm doing uh, some blunt blunt dissections. And uh, you see here the presentesis and over the injection. And right after that, here is the cautery. So have you seen it? The cautery we use, this is a handheld uh, low temperature cautery. And we, we use this cautery also in GAT to blunt the tip of the suture. This is FIFO proline suture. And you can, you can follow the suture track and it does, this doesn't have to be a light catheter. You can, uh, if you look at it carefully over the cichlor, you can, you can uh, see the uh, threading suture parallel to limbus in uh, kids. And you can also put the just simple gonial lens over the cornea to check where you are, to check the position of the suture, if you want to see that. And uh, once you grab the distal part of the suture, you can pull it. But our uh, preference is to, is to create another uh, presentesis here and to externalize this, this suture tips uh, through this uh, presentesis and pull the suture tips slowly uh, avoiding iris trauma. This is a case with posterior embryotoxin with a high iris insertion, uh, as you see here. And you need, to be, you need to be careful at this step and you need to uh, pull the suture uh, so slowly and carefully because, uh, because you can see our uh, iridodialysis and uh, iris root trauma. So we don't wanna have this complication. So that in this way, you can, uh, you can do this more controlled fashion. You can also combine conventional and, uh, and suture trabeculotomy uh, to increase success. This is a case uh, with moderate to advanced uh, primary congenital glaucoma, as you might see, uh, see it from the corneal edema. We are opening up the conjunctival and applying cautery and uh, trying to find Schlem's canal. And you can see the cyclical chupor here uh, more clearly. And you can also see the great, uh, the good aqueous flow uh, coming out of the Schlem's canal here. And now we are, we are uh, doing a blunt uh, dissections here. And uh, you can uh, inject uh, the viscoelastic into the uh, Schlem's canal, or, uh, or you can dilate the Schlem's canal with using a harm cervicotom. This is what I do here. And once you get, uh, once you once you grab a five four pearl in situ with a blunted tip, we insert it into Schlem's canal as I showed you uh, before. And in dystrophic angles, they might stop in Schlem's canal, so that this this is what happens here. It stopped somewhere in the canal. Then uh, we pull the suture back and then try to do it in another way, and it goes. Uh, we we can uh, we can thread in the suture, but it stops again somewhere in the canal. And then uh, if this happens, you push the suture and then you let it get stuck in the canal. And now we are externalizing the proximal part of the suture and then start to pull the suture again. You don't need to grab the, the distal part of the suture. If it gets stuck in the canal, you can pull the proximal part of the suture. This is what I do uh, when once this happened in GAT procedure. And then you can uh, you uh, you have a nice uh, uh, 270 degree uh, trabeculotomy. If you wanna uh, if you wanna do a circumferential one, you can combine it uh, with uh, metal trabeculotomy, so that you have a nice circumferential trabeculotomy. 
So this is GAP procedure, as I, uh, as my friend uh, Dr. Gruber uh, showed you. Uh, and in this paper, uh, they found that the preliminary results uh, is good, and uh, in, in in patients with primary congenital glaucoma and juvenile low plane angle glaucoma, and this is my favorite procedure also in uh, adults and also in kids with clear uh, corneas. And this is how we do uh, in kids. In kids, we're, during that procedure, we we might have some uh, we might have some difficulties uh, finding a Schlem's canal because of the because uh, we we might need to uh, work under corneal edema. And we have, we might have some visibility issues. As and I, as as Devender showed you, I I, I prefer to uh, to push the posterior lip uh, just a little bit, as you see here, uh, to find uh, Schlem's canal and to see the back wall of the Schlem's canal. And I'm I'm going to stop here. You see the blood reflux in the in the canal once you enter the Schlem's canal, once you enter the anterior chamber. So you can use this landmark to find canal, to find, to see the Schlem's canal in kids. And then uh, once you enter the canal, uh, we have a pipe or prolonged suture with a blunted tip, and then you enter and start to thread the suture. And the mushroom is not that big, as Davinder said. And you keep pushing the suture, keep pushing the suture till the time you see the distal tip coming out of the, uh, from the ostia. And then once uh, you see that, you carefully grab the distal part of the suture and avoiding the tissue trauma in the angle. And you see the uh, reflux bleeding here. And then pull the suture ends, distal ends, slowly, so that you have a nice ab internal 360 trabecular tunnel. This procedure uh, is uh, applicable in kids. You see the, the, uh, the appearance of the canal just right after the trabeculotum and nice reflux. We, we want to see this reflux uh, and, and flow at the end of the surgery, which is a good prognostic sign. And in kids, we have another issues like iris insertion. If we have high iris insertions, you might not be able to find Schlem's canal or you might not be able to, uh, to enter the Schlem's canal. So that at the very beginning of the procedure, you might need to pull the iris root back using your instruments and you can use forceps or you can use a blunt spatula uh, as you see here or whatever you feel comfortable with. And the uh, first thing you should do is that. And then you can go ahead and do goniotomy and the rest of the procedure is, uh, is the same. And as Devander said, if you have some, these kind of uh, hemorrhage, reflux hemorrhage, please stop and uh, inject um, viscoelastic or wash out uh, anterior chamber uh, because the visibility in, uh, during angle surgery is the most important point uh, to get a nice result. Okay. So this is our preliminary results. Uh, as I said, we have mostly uh, advanced cases. So uh, we have a lower number of gap cases uh, compared to, uh, to adult cases. And because uh, most, almost most of the cases uh, presented with a, a severe corneal edema, we have 14 eyes with at least a six month follow-up. IOP decreased from 30s to 70s and medication decreased, uh, decreased um, significantly. And medication, extra medication, post-operative medication needed in six eyes and tube surgery in one case uh, and hyphema in almost 60% of cases. So what should we do uh, if this surgery uh, fails? So if, as we all know, uh, some of the kids has a poor prognosis at, uh, at, in the very beginning. Who are they? Uh, patients presented with uh, larger corneal diameters, larger than 14 millimeters, uh, 14 millimeters uh, or presented earlier than three months or, uh, or later than two years uh, have poor prognosis. And according to this paper, for example, risk factors, uh, uh, risk factors uh, are, uh, patient's age under uh, three months or, or, or increased axial uh, length of uh, 24 millimeters. And according to this paper, second operation was necessary in almost 30% of cases. And this is exactly uh, quite the same uh, in our patient series. Uh, the second operation rate uh, is uh, almost 30% uh, of our cases. So this is our another um, unpublished data. We're still working on it. And uh, these are the poor prognostic signs uh, associated with surgical failure in these uh, kids. Uh, what are they? 
uh, baseline ILP and um, and baseline corneal diameters and bilaterality and or and also the surgery converted uh, uh, converted metal trabeculotomy during the procedures. These are the bad prognostic signs and risk factors for surgical failure. So how do, to decide to go further? We need to follow up our patients after surgery. We need to check these parameters again, ILPs, axial lens, corneal diameters, and appearance and morphological changes. And, and we need to um, pay attention to these changes. And the most important uh, changes and most important sign is morphological changes like increased cup to this ratio. If you see uh, increased, still in, increasing cup to this ratio uh, post-operatively, so, th so this means that you need to do something further. Or uh, post -oper during your post-operative examination, post-angle uh, surgery, if you have something like that, uh, the, the thinning, sacral thinning or staphyloma uh, over your uh, previous surgery areas, so this means something. So you, need, you might need to do something because in those kids, IOP measurements might not be reliable, as I mentioned before. So uh, you might uh, do uh, trabeculotomy, again, if you have some space. Uh, as, as we have in this case. This is a case with a previous uh, trabeculotomy I referred for further surgery in our center. And as you see here, uh, there's a scarred previous surgical area in the, in the nasal quadrant, and we are creating another radial um, sclerosis incision and trying to find the Schlem's canal. We are having a nice reflux here, locating Schlem's canal, and then, as you see, and then inserted uh, six or proline suture or five or proline suture into the canal. And in those kits with, uh, with the previous uh, surgery area, this suture might hit the previous surgery area and it, it might get stuck in the Schlems canal or it might get into uh, anterior chamber so that you need to follow the iris movement during this process. If it, if it gets into the iris, uh, if, it, if it gets into the anterior chamber, it might hit iris and you might see pupillary movement as you see here. And this is what happens here. And uh, we, we saw a pupillary movement, an iris movement here in this quadrant, so that we decided to create um, another presenthesis. And with forceps, uh, we locate and find the distal tip and pull it. So that way, uh, we can have a trabeculotomy in the rest of the angle. Even if it's stopped in the canal, you can get a nice trabeculotomy uh, in, the, in the rest of the angle. You can do that instead of uh, doing uh, filtering surgery or instead of putting the tube in, in these risky eyes. So you can do the same thing uh, uh, also uh, in GAT. This is a case referred to our center, uh, eight-year-old uh, boy with the history of two traps uh, with uh, primary congenital glaucoma. In the OR, we, we are checking the angle. You see the filtering areas, the previous surgery areas, but the rest of the angle uh, looks untouched. Uh, the angle is dysgenic, so we decided to uh, go for inferior GAT procedure. So we create superior presentesis here, and um, we are uh, creating goniotomy incision, one to two millimeter goniotomy incision here, and then thread the suture uh, from superior to inferior quadrant. And what we expect is suture uh, is going to uh, is going to uh, slide in the canal uh, and then hits uh, and then we will hit the, the previous surgery area and get it might get stuck uh, in the canal. So this is what happens here, as you will see. Now it's stopped in the canal. You see the kink, and it stopped. It stopped in the canal, and then you, at this point, you can start pulling the proximal parts uh, to do inferior gut. You don't need to grab the distal part. It's not necessary. So in this case, we have the inferior uh, trabeculotomy uh, instead of putting the tube in. Okay, these are the post-op images of the case. This is the third, third post-op day and patient is going uh, great uh, after first year, like 15 or 40 millimeters micros without any medication. So to conclude, uh, primary congenital glaucoma is a typical disease and it necessitates lifelong follow-up, as we all know. Treatment is mainly surgical, but uh, additional medications are mostly needed. Angle surgery is generally the, uh, generally, uh, the first choice and it is repeatable and uh, it might be applied as ap external or ap internal procedure. 
and visual potential should be evaluated in every patient, in every kid, in each step. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jaina. It was an excellent presentation. And Thank again, you. lots of questions, but we don't have that much of time because we have last speaker also. But just one or two quick questions. One question from my side also. And most of these procedures get and uh, have external canaloplasty is done in primary developmental glaucomas. Is there any experience of secondary developmental glaucomas? Yes. Uh, we are still working on it. Uh, so uh, from a practical standpoint, in AFAQ cases, uh, it is not uh, successful. To, for, so we are analyzing our results, but I, I mostly, in AFAQ kits, uh, in post cardiac surgery, I, I don't tend to uh, do GAT surgery because uh, it's not successful. The, the tube surgery in those kids is, is the primary procedure, that's for sure. But it works in yeah. cases, uh, for example, post-PPV. For example, uh, I have a case series, different subspecial uh, TK series in patients with, um, uh, in aneuridic patients, in patients with uh, ROP cases, uh, after uh, ROP cases, uh, say, uh, after uh, PPV and lens sparing uh, parse plan and vitrectomy, it works. And patients also in kids with uh, persistent fetal vasculature, I have a case series. Uh, so I'm going, I'm currently uh, working on uh, these kits and uh, probably soon uh, I'll be publishing my results, but it mostly work, uh, work out in kids with primary uh, open angle glaucoma. But in secondary, in UIT cases, it works very well. In cases yeah. with juvenile open angle glaucoma, okay. it works well. Well in exam field riders and uh, in IRD because oh, progressive condition and the past yeah. develop over a period of time. So it may not work that well. So is there, we have one or two more speakers. Yeah, there is one one speaker more. A according to program, there are two. Oh, so I think uh, uh, I would good. invite now Dr. Gaurav Prakash. He'll be speaking on effect on keratoconus location on the topographic pachymetry and zonular corneal wavefront parameters. So Dr. Gaurav is there. Don't see him either. Dr. Gaurav is not here, but we have Dr. Shams. Okay, Dr. Manadeep, can you invite yeah, him? Yes, Dr. Sham Norban, uh, you're welcome. And uh, he'll be speaking on angle recession glaucoma. Uh, probably the last talk of the day. And uh, I think we have very limited time also. Yeah. So, uh, so please, over to you, sir, Dr. Shams Norman. Thank you. We, we can see your uh, slides and we can hear you very well. Fine. Am I visible and uh, am I audible? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Delhi Ophthalmological Society for inviting me. Uh, thank you everybody for the nice presentation. I've been hearing the nice presentations here. And uh, me, Dr. Shams Mohammed, I am an associate professor, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Medical University, Bangladesh. <clears throat> I don't have any financial interest uh, uh, doing this presentation. The slide is not moving. Can you please help him? Okay. Yeah. So my topic is tra traumatic angle recession uh, glaucoma. Uh, sir, please uh, my it. experience. Hello. Hello. Please full screen, sir. Please make it full screen. PowerPoint presentation. Okay. Yeah, Is it that's visible right. now? Okay, yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, I want to start with uh, one case, a 25 years old man. Uh, he presented with gradual dimness of vision in the right eye for the last two years. He had a history of trauma to the right eye with plastic ball 11 years back. And uh, when I just examined the patient, uh, no external scar mark around the eye, but cornea a pigmented dust in the endothelium. Anterior chamber is uh, um, the dip, is deeper anterior chamber. Irish is irregular, like a uh, sphincter rupture. 
are people RAPD, a lens abit rosity cataract, and tubitral opacity, uh, advanced cupping in, in that eye. Peripheral retina was normal. And intraocular pressure was uh, 41 millimeter of mercury in the same eye. And in the corioscopy, I saw the angle recession, broad ciliary body band, and uh, I can see the scleral show, no abnormality in the other eye. So the di diagnosis is angle recession, glaucoma, and the left eye was normal. And this is another uh, case of, uh, I saw a patient with a rosary cataract when I did a gonioscopy. This is the gonioscopic finding. You can see there is a scleral show and also uh, angle recession here. And this is another part. And this is the risk finding. So in that case, this is also a case of angle recession glaucoma. Um, this is another case. You can see history of blunt trauma. And uh, when I did the gonioscopy, you can see this scleral show and also angle recession here. You can see an angle recession in the other side of the angle. This is the enlarged cupdix ratio. This is another case of angle recession glaucoma. You can see angle recession here. And this is also angle decision with uh, ciliary um, idodialysis and ciliary dialysis with advanced cupping. Though the uh, angle structure, uh, uh, just uh, to make the photography of the angle is really very much tough. It's still, uh, uh, you can see the angle recession here. So what is the pathophysiology? The blunt trauma exceeds the elasticity of the eye anterior to posterior axial compression. That equatorial expansion acquires rapidly first laterally and deepening of the peripheral anterior chamber. And this is called the hydrodynamic effect. That increase in the diameter of the cornea scleral limbal ring, sharing force applied to the angle structure, common side is ciliary muscle. That longitudinal muscle attached to the scleral spur, circular muscle and iris to displace posteriorly. And there is some angle recession. And uh, following angle recession, there are some, you know, the trabecular meshwork, trabeculitis, followed by trabecular fibrosis. And there is some cells and flare, uh, some cells and proteins okay, stuck in the um, angle structures. And the combined effect, the there is resistance to outflow uh, of the aqueous humor. For this, the glaucoma occurs, though late. This is a histopathology. You can see there's the angle recession, uh, the recession within the uh, uh, ciliary muscle. And my expression, when I uh, see such type of finding, I used to check the angle, like a lady's skull corneal opacity, anterior chamber is deep, rosy cataract, posterior subcapsular cataract, sphincter tear, sublaxated lens, phacodonesis, Hydrodialysis, pigment over the lens, macular scar, healed choroidal tear, like a uh, peripapillary choroidal scar, old retinal detachment, uh, intraocular pressure is increased without any uh, cause. In that case, I used to do the, um, see the angle uh, to exclude any angle recession. And what are the common findings? Uh, Gonioscopy findings in case of angle recession, glaucoma, broad angle recess, absence of torn Irish process, this is a very identifying point. Depression of the overlying trabecular measure, localizing peripheral anterior sinicia at the border of the recession and hyperpigmentation of the angle. So this is another case of angle recession. You can see the, the concave Irish insertion and also you can see the scleral show here. Here, uh, you can see the scleral show. So actually, uh, uh, the most important thing is we have to do the gonioscopy. You have to do the repeat gonioscopy to see the angle, and this is a matter of practice. So important information, uh, uh, it's a clinical information. Uh, how can you diagnose and how can you suspect a case of angle recession glaucoma? Unilateral cataract in a young or middle-aged adult should raise the suspicion of remote trauma. So this is very much important. If patient have a unilateral cataract is young or middle-aged group, you have to think that it might be a case of remote trauma with angle recession. In the elderly patient, rule out the history of the fall. A lack of positive history does not rule out the angle recession even. 
A greater extent of angle distortion is associated with the greater risk of glaucoma. It is important to compare angle appearance in the both eyes. So frequency of the trauma, it depends of according to trauma and according to angle recession, the angle recession, uh, according to trauma, the angle recession can be occurred in 20 to 94%. And uh, trauma with high femur, the angle recession is more. And in angle recession cases, 20% develop glaucoma. And if it is less than 180 degree, usually not glaucoma occurs. If it is more than 180 degree, almost 10% glaucoma occurs. But if it is more than 240 degrees, um, 50 to 100% cases glaucoma occurs. It's a large variation of the range. But onset of glaucoma extremely variable months or even uh, many years later. So this is one of my study. I, I, I did a study of 25 cases. Uh, most of the uh, uh, angle decision glaucoma cases were male as they are the outdoor workers and they have to uh, um, face the injury for their outdoor work and uh, younger age group. And uh, 40 patients, they have a history of high FEMA and eight patients associated with traumatic cataract. Other associated clinical findings are subluxation, sphincter rupture, macular hole, caudal rupture. 56% had a history of trauma one years to five years period and 28% had a history of trauma occurring less than one year ago. And uh, I saw angle recession in 360 degrees, 68%, 270 degree around 16% and 180 degree around 16%. And what was my management approach? In 15 cases of 25 cases, it was totally managed with uh, ocular pressure, one medication or two medications, and even three medications. And uh, in the five percent cases, they didn't need any uh, anti-glaucoma medication because they had an angle recession, but no glaucoma. And uh, in two cases, I need only cataract surgery to control the intraocular pressure. And in three cases, I had to do the trabeculectomy with mitomycin C. So it is really not a tough job to diagnose the disease. It's an attitude. So it is, bit, it is very important to do gonioscopy in any suspicious cases. Patient may not give the history of trauma because sometimes patient may forget uh, in his, due to aging process, but we have to do the gonioscopy in any suspicious cases. Uh, we can do mistake, but we should not be frustrated and we have to diagnose by any means, but we have to correct ourselves by our uh, practice. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the patient sharing. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, we can have one quick question if somebody had asked, can want to ask. And, uh, I think, otherwise... uh, there was, I think doctor uh, has sent a recorded presentation. Do, uh, doctor... Oh, Dr. So Gaurav. I, Dr. Gaurav, yeah. Dr. Gaurav. So... Yeah, so I request my team to play the recorded message, recorded talk. Good morning. I'd like to thank Dr. Namrata Sharma and DOS for this opportunity. I'll be talking about the effect of keratoconus cone location on the topographic, pachymetric, and zonular corneal wavefront parameters and their predictive cutoffs. I have no financial interest in the methods and materials and the lack thereof in this presentation. So let's look at the problem statement. Many patients with keratoconus tend to present later in the clinical course. Many of these patients have actually had an optometric or even ophthalmic evaluation. Sometimes they say that something was off, especially when I was driving at night, I was just told that I had astigmatism and my vision just decreased yesterday. This is a common finding in the clinic and I'm sure you will also watch for the same. Let's see what's happening over here. Are these patients having these problems because we did not examine them well the first time or it's because of a unique pathological situation? I would tend to believe the latter. I call this as the iceberg effect, like an iceberg which is hidden under the sea most of the time. Keratoconus also plays and stays in the community quite a lot, especially the early keratoconus. We can pick up patients who come in for LASIK screening. Sometimes we are lucky and we can pick up these early cases when we have a weird reflex or unexplained features, but mostly these patients are not diagnosed like an iceberg, they stay hidden. Therefore, there's a need for analysis and that's why the study came in. Or was, are we missing the tip of the iceberg actually? 
And are we missing more of these cases, especially in high risk populations like the Middle Eastern population? So we did the study in my previous center uh, in the UAE. Um, the dem demographic was basically largely Indian expats and few Middle Eastern patients. So the data can be represented very well on the Indian setting. Uh, our aim was to evaluate the differences in numerical parameters of central and non-central keratoconuses and to see if such differences do exist. In that case, can they be used to create simple guidelines to screen keratoconus earlier at a primary contact level, at a community ophthalmology level, or probably at an optometry level? We did a comparative case series and we had four groups in this. The keratoconus apex within central two millimeters, that is a central keratoconus. And the, if the keratoconus apex was outside the central two millimeters, it was called as the non-central keratoconus. The logic for this is that we wanted to mimic natural vision as much as possible and central two millimeters is probably approximately the photopic vision most people expect with SMK. Um, Comparative controls were normal patients who had apex outside the central two millimeters and patients who had the apex inside the central two millimeters, basically four zones of 50 each. We did shine flux plus procedure based coil topography slash tomography. We looked at multiple parameters, including the apex keratometry, the central corneal thickness. Then we looked at the anterior corneal wavefront at three millimeters, four millimeters, six and eight millimeters. And then we excluded scans of poor quality, scat corneas and PMDs and patients who had previous surgeries on the eye. So let's look at our results. We found that the apex keratometry was comparable between both groups. That means the anatomical severity was similar, which is an important finding. That means that in terms of progression of the stage of keratoconus, these patients were the same stage. However, the non-central cones had better corrected distance visual acuity, had lower central keratometries, which is expected because the cone was outside, and they had thicker central corneas because the pathology had not involved the center so far. And even the minimum cone thickness was lesser in these patients because the base thickness in a peripheral cornea is more compared to a central cornea. So if you have ectatic pathology, which is primarily localized in the peripheral cornea, you'll have a, a higher value for a minimum coil thickness in these patients, which is an interesting finding, but it was biologically explainable. Um, central HOAs were lesser in these patients because central HOA mimics vision more. So three or four millimeters were the statistically important ones. Three was strongly positive, four went out when we did a Bonferroni adjustment. Uh, HOAs at six and eight millimeters when the zone was a bit larger, did not give us expected results did not give us results which we predicted because of the fact that as you enlarge the pupil size or as you enlarge the corneal size, capture size, more of irregularity is captured. So it's logical that at that point, the differentiating factor, the cutoff boundary between a smaller corneal capture versus a larger corneal capture did not hold true. So we'll say around four millimeters was the cutoff, which was useful over here. Similar work has been done in the past by us and by Andrew et al., where we looked at the Tachymetric cutoffs uh, based on corneal thicknesses in keratoconic patients, and we found that any cornage less than 491.6 microns should be screened. Similarly, we have been known for long that if you have a sim steep K of more than 47 by 2, you should suspect keratoconus. Now we played these numbers into our patients, and our 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 doubt or our aim was to see, see if we can suspect keratoconus numerically in the absence of uh, topography or classical corneal science. In this unique subset where we have teased out the central and non-central keratoconuses and can a keratometer or a pachymeter be used to suspect early keratoconus in a setting when you don't have a topography device uh, in the community with the optometrist with the community ophthalmologist well is it possible to actually look at these patients and suspect whether they have early keratoconus so our outcomes were like this. When we use these previous cutoffs of SIMK 47.2 and coin thickness less than 491, we actually found that it still works pretty well for central keratoconuses. For 94% patients with SIMK more than 472 was screened in. Around 82% patients with central coin thickness less than 491 were screened in for the central keratoconus cohort. However, when you looked at non central keratoconus, the results were very abysmal we found that only 50% to 60% patients were screened. And that means approximately 45% patients of non-central cones were actually missed out when we were trying to um, uh, screen these patients in. 
we did ROC analysis in these patients, which are stepwise like this. We plotted variables for each parameter, and then we looked at the specificity and sensitivity cutoffs, and then we calculate the Yodens index. Now, Yodens index is a is a robustness of diag uh, is a test which looks at the robustness of a diagnostic test. So basically, higher the Yodens index, you will use those two sensitivity and specificity values, and based on that, we cut off use cutoffs to find out the highest Yodens values as I explained right now, and we use those criteria in the next slide as is shown over here. So once you use single variable situations like just using the central steep K or the CCT or the astigmatism, in isolation, they didn't work that well. But combination situations, when looking at this or this or this, obviously you're trying to balance between the specificity and sensitivity. And we found that there's a sweet balance when you look at central steep K more than 45.8 or the central corneal thickness because it's easier to pick up central coil thickness in the community. You might not be finding out the minimum coil thickness points if you use an ultrasound pachymeter right in the center of the cornea, uh, five or three microns or less. This gave us a sensitivity of 95% and specificity of 87%, which is pretty good. You, you are picking up 95% of patients in the community in, which have these parameters and sending them for a screening and approximately 12% of them get ruled out, but 87% look like they have early coil thickness, which is a, which is a win-win scenario. The number needed to treat is approximately fairly high in this situation. Now, if you add astigmatism of more than 1.89, sensitivity gets much higher because it kind of helps to diagnose. However, the specificity becomes fairly low. So if you're in a situation where you are suspecting uh, keratoconus in the community quite a lot in certain populations, you might use all the three criteria and send the patient if you have one of them. But if you're in a population where the incidence of keratoconus is low, you might just want to use these two parameters and see if central steep K and CCT is um, um, predictive. So our conclusions from this was that non-central non keratoconus has lesser effect on the SIMK, the pachymetry, and the small aperture HRMS. Again, we are talking about three and four millimeter where most of the pathology is outside that. Using the criteria we have been told before, more sim simply more than 47.2 or CCT less than 491.6 may miss timely topography in certain patients with non-central keratoconuses. So approximately half of these patients will be missed out, actually, not a small amount. And we need to change these criteria. So based on the numerical calculations we did, we found, as we discussed previously, that if you have a steep K of more than 45.8 in the community, in a patient when you're doing a keratometry or coil thickness of less than 503, you should definitely get a coil topography done to rule out keratoconus. Um, you can add astigmatism or more than 1.8, approximately two adapters, especially in cohorts with higher risks and higher incidence of keratoconus in the community. Thank you for your time. I would like uh, you to direct any queries to me at my email. And thanks again, DOS. Thanks again, Dr. Sharma for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gaurav. Thank you so much for sending this recorded video. Uh, and uh, we can't have any discussion because no time is left. But uh, Dr. Shokat Ara had left a little bit of uh, her talk in between because of poor connectivity. May I request her to briefly, uh, you know, uh, present the leftover portion uh, for two, in two, three minutes. Thank you, sir, for giving me the floor again. And I'm sorry for the interruption. This is the uh, picture of, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and yeah, we can yeah. see your slides well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is the uh, pre and post surgical picture of the patient. So more extensive and orbital invasion requires orbital exaggeration. And this we know, this is, okay. Adjuvant therapy, when and where we give adjuvant therapy is when the histopathology, there is edge positive and the diagnosis is dysplasia or CIN, we do, we, what we do is we observe or we add topical chemotherapy. H positive invasive squamous cell carcinoma diagnosis, we do re-excision. Base positive, it is, if it is localized, cryotherapy is the treatment. And if base positive and it is diffuse base positivity, then flag brachytherapy is the treatment. And when there is chance of recurrence, immunomodulation is the adjuvant therapy. So what are the agents topical we use? It's, this is mitomycin C, interferon alpha-2B, 5-fluorouracil, and 0 
All drops need compounding. They are available in injection, and interferon drops are given daily, at least for four months. Interferon injection weekly, so faster resolution. Five fluorouracil and five MMC are cycles. Usually used four cycles. Usually four months. We are we give this two thing. Mitomycin C is used for uh, CIM and mild uh, squamous cell carcinoma uh, with 0.02% uh, to 0 to 0.04%. 0 and there is rule of four. That is 0.04% four times a day, four days a week, four weeks, then two weeks interval, and then three to four cycle. This is the typical protocol for uh, MMC, what I follow. And this is a picture of pre and post MMC. And complication, we all know that is conjunctival hyperemia, punctate corneal erosion, and limbal stem cell deficiency, etc. Interferon alpha 2b is the most accepted and favorable form of treatment nowadays, and we use it uh, one uh, one million international units per ml. This is the uh, dose drop uh, concentration, and it, it has got immunomodulation, antiproliferative, and antiviral role. And when the uh, it is a large uh, large lesion, at that time we give interlesional injection, with, which is eight, uh, 3 million international unit to 10 million international unit with topical drops. And three to four injection usually given weekly. And most uh, uh, important um, complication is SPK and follicular conjunctivitis and flu-like syndrome. It is less toxic and it can be used in immunosuppressed patients. And this is the picture of the treated case of in, with interferon alpha 2b and 5 fluorouracil uses as used as one drop four times seven days then 21 days off and like this the four cycle of four months and this also needs to be compounded here is the pre and post treatment with 5 fluorouracil cetoprobid is, is the newest drug and it is used for refractory cases 2.5 milligram per ml concentration three times daily, and it is used until uh, the lesion is clinically invisible and after one week. And it causes conjunctivitis and punctal stenosis. But cetophobia is not available in like in our country in Bangladesh. I think I don't I don't have any idea about India. Hmm. Black bracket therapy is used to control gross or microscopic. After excision, if there is microscopic residual tumor, then we have to go for flag bracket therapy with a very good outcome. This is the picture of flag bracket therapy. So recurrence with uh, protocol-based technique, the recurrence rate can be limited to less than 5% from 15 to 52%. So this is one thing we have to follow protocol-based treatment. These are some of my cases. Which you can see there's a big lesion uh, with, and I followed the surgical protocol. Uh, and this is the post-operative uh, picture, and the uh, histopathologically, it was squamous cell carcinoma of the conjunctiva. And this was also a gelatinous uh, lesion, and which was um, uh, RB positive, and there was feeder vessel, a feeder vessel and in intralesional um, vascularity. And I did the excision and treated with post-operative adjuvant therapy with mitomycin C. Uh, this is one case. It was a, it is a case of a recurrent um, squamous cell carcinoma, and the patient came with this big, with a very um, fast-growing lesion. And what I did, I did the OCT, um, OCT, and then I did the excision of the of the uh, lesion. But there was base positivity. When we, the base positivity, and it was during the Corona lockdown period. And the patient is very poor and he can't go to India also for plaque bracket therapy. So I gave a chance and I took a chance and I gave interferon alpha 2B. And this is the patient now. And he has given, he has received three months of the interferon alpha B, uh, alpha 2B, one drops four times for three months. And the result is, the outcome is very good. And he has to take it for six, uh, three more months at least. And then, uh, if needed, for more six months, maybe. So this is the patient. And um, I treated it with indifferent alpha to be topically 1 million international units per ml, one drop for 10 sales. So in conclusion, I want to say, evaluation of the case of OSS in these patients, we have to evaluate it properly. And then 
have to follow protocol based treatment that is better prognosis and counseling and follow up is crucial we have to counsel the patient about the uh, long period long um, period of treatment treatment follow up you have to have for follow up thank you for Thank you, Dr. Shaukat. Uh, thank you so much for giving us such a crisp, uh, you know, uh, protocol and uh, showing us some very good and very well managed patients. So, may I request Dr. Bhalla now to uh, conclude the session because uh, we don't have any more time left for the discussion. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shaukat, and thank you, everybody. And uh, Dr. Bhalla, please. Thank you, sir. Dr. Bhalla, are you there? Dr. Bhalla. Okay, then I'll, I'll give the uh, concluding remarks and all this session has been uh, wonderful and uh, the presenters were, each of them uh, was a made very good presentation. It was truly an international uh, conference and uh, we really enjoyed the session and uh, I, I'm sure all the delegates must have enjoyed and uh, we'll keep uh, getting back to you, the experts, uh, for uh, our queries once again on the, the emails and we'll remain in touch with you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah, you, all thank the speakers. You. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you everybody. Thank you very much, thank everyone. You. Oh, thank, thank you, ma'am. It was real. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. China, thank you. Dr. Zainab, thank you. It was wonderful to be here with you all. Thank yeah, you so much, really everyone. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. That's thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. With this, we do a wrap up of this hall B. And that's the end of day one. See you tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Can you people hear me? Hello. Thank you, sir. Thank you.